inspiring. Busy. Brilliant. Enjoyable. Organised. Amazing. Fellowship. Variety. Enthusiasm. Enjoyable. Busy. Very professional. Fantastic. All encompassing. Excellent. Enjoyable. Yeah, development. That's it. <laughs> Pilgrimage. Inspiring. Wonderful. Diversity. Enjoyable. Great fun. Sociable. It's got to be fun. Conventions. Excellent. Wow. Awesome. <laughs> I really enjoyed it, so yeah, uh, that's probably the best word. Good morning and welcome to this, the Society's first online convention. Whichever way you look at it, 2020 has been a challenging year and many of us have experienced great sadness and loss. Whilst for most of the population, lockdown and isolating has meant just that, as radio amateurs we've been able to stay in touch with others around the UK and the world, supporting and helping each other, thanks to the wonders of wireless radio and an RSGB NHS initiative called Get On The Air To Care. Through that campaign and the introduction of remotely invigilated exams, we've seen thousands of people gain their foundation licence and take their first steps in amateur radio. We've also seen hundreds more progress to the intermediate licence or return to be active on the air. If you're in either of those groups, or if this is your first RSGB convention, I'd like to give you a very special welcome and hope you enjoy the day. Extraordinary circumstances lead to extraordinary solutions and today is another one of those. Whilst we'll all miss the social interaction of a normal convention, we hope that today's range of expert lectures will provide something interesting for everyone. After our keynote presentation by the co-founder of Ellicraft, Eric Swartz, Whiskey Alpha 6, Hotel Hotel Quebec, Today's programme will split into two streams. The first is called an introduction to, and if you're new to amateur radio, this is probably the stream for you. If you're an experienced radio amateur, looking for something different to try, you'll also find some great presentations in this stream. Our second stream is called learn more about, and includes more technical content for radio amateurs who've been enjoying the hobby for a while. Both streams will run live throughout the day and you can change between them as you wish. The web links to find each stream will appear on screen after Eric has finished his presentation and they're also on the convention web page. You can ask questions via the live chat window that will appear alongside each presentation. I'd like to thank in advance our expert speakers, our stream hosts and everyone who's put an enormous amount of effort to create this event. In particular, I'd like to highlight the volunteers who are doing the technical wizardry behind the scenes to make the streams work smoothly. Whilst we hope we'll all be back together in person at the convention in 2021, we'd still like your feedback about this year's online event. You can find the form online at www.rsgb.org forward slash feedback. It'll appear on screen at various times throughout the day as a reminder, so don't worry if you don't catch the web address now. So, let's all settle down with a nice cup of tea or coffee and enjoy what I'm sure will be a great set of presentations. Thank you very much, Dave. Enjoy your coffee. I actually have uh, my tea in the RSGB Centenary mug from 2013. Anyway, good morning. As Dave said, the RSGB convention online is about to get underway. An hour from now, 10 a.m. UK time, we'll split into those two streams. One hosted by David, G7URP, is the introduction to stream, starting with Joe, M1MWD, explaining how there's lots of fun to be had operating with modest radio equipment. I'll be hosting the Learn More About stream where Rail M0RTP will be offering an insight into magnetic loop antennas. If you have any questions for our speakers today, as Dave said, please write them on the YouTube chat facility and we'll do our best to pick them out and depending on time available, put them to the guests on your behalf. And I'm looking at YouTube now, which is running about three minutes behind with me, I can tell you. So now it's time to meet our keynote speaker joining us from the United States. For a behind the scenes look at a 22 year adventure of hard work, luck, technology and excitement at Ellicraft, let's welcome to the 2020 RSGB convention online, Eric Swartz, WA6HHQ. 
Eric, you'll have to imagine the huge round of applause that's taking place now. Uh, it must be the middle of the night for you. Where are you? Yeah, it's about uh, one oh three in the morning here, so I have a little bit of caffeine keeping me going here too. So hopefully, uh, <laughs> that won't make me talk too fast, but as I usually do. But uh, it, I'm looking forward to it. it. Should be fun. Well, you're very welcome, Eric. The floor is yours. Well, thanks, Jim, and I'm glad to be with everybody uh, this morning. Uh, welcome, and. Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, talking to you this morning. Hopefully, uh, it'll be interesting. Uh, rather than giving a um, heavy technical talk or, uh, of course, a sales talk or anything like that, I'm um, going to give you a little bit of a background in Elecraft since we've actually been around, uh, as the title you can see uh, up on the screen there, uh, 22 years now. It's a little scary that uh, we've made it this far. Uh, but it's uh, it's been quite a, a journey and a, and a fun ride. So I wanted to uh, give you a little history, walk you through uh, from uh, Wayne and I when we started the company and uh, you know, sort of with some pictures of products and, uh, and other things along the way. And of course, we'll talk about the K4 a little bit at the end, of course, because that's uh, certainly been at the top of a lot of questions we've been getting lately. So uh, thanks very much for coming. And I wish I was there in person. I uh, was out last year at the, uh, the National Ham Fest and enjoyed myself uh, quite a bit meeting people and talking to everybody. And uh, certainly we'll be trying to get back out to, uh, to one of the shows uh, as soon as we can when they start letting us do that again. Uh, things out here in California have uh, calmed down a bit. It's been a bit smoky, as you probably heard in uh, California from some of the fires. Fortunately, uh, nothing impacted us directly at the uh, factory. We were far enough from them, but we did have some employees and uh, other folks uh, affected. And uh, that uh, certainly disrupted things for a while, but we're back to normal now, which is great. And uh, it's been running full speed. So I'd like to talk about 22 years of Elecraft and uh, uh, have some fun along the way here, uh, giving you a feel for uh, how we started the company. Uh, some of our philosophy and how we actually uh, run the business um, and uh, and let you see uh, give you a little peek at what's coming up here with the k4 course at the end um, let me get set up here so first of all who are we i think uh, many folks may uh, be familiar with wayne and myself but just a little bit of background um, both of us actually got our ham radio license uh, in california uh, we didn't know each other uh, back in 1971 when we were all 14 years old uh, Wayne's original call was WN6HQH. Interestingly enough, mine was the novice version of my current call, WN6HHQ. Um, I used to joke with people, it was California karma that we would eventually bump into each other and start a company. Of course, uh, Wayne changed his call to something uh, much shorter, N6KR. And I used to joke with him because he's uh, mostly a QRP guy who does get on at 100 watts too. Uh, so we used, when you operated field day, I would use the phonetics N6 kilowatt radio, which would uh, drive him crazy, but it worked great for, uh, for the contests. Uh, Wayne's a very good uh, uh, hardware and firmware designer, uh, worked uh, in Silicon Valley in a number of places uh, uh, prior to us meeting. Um, his degree actually is in cognitive science um, and also uh, has some computer science as part of that too. Uh, an excellent designer, been designing radios actually since uh, really when he first got his ham radio license. So he's got uh, this incredible skills that, uh, and creative this in terms of radio design. Um, myself, um, I'm from the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area originally, so which is very close to where we're located, which is just outside of Silicon Valley on the uh, coastal uh, area of Monterey Bay for uh, Elecraft. Um, I grew up in the Bay Area, went back east to school on the East Coast, and then uh, came back out uh, as an engineer and uh, worked my way up through uh, engineering design and the management and startups and all the usual Silicon Valley story. Uh, and uh, started uh, another company prior to uh, Elecraft and then uh, went crazy back uh, when I got together with Wayne and, and started this company. So I've uh, been having a lot of fun uh, in, uh, in, that, uh, in that area in that time. Uh, my background I would say is design engineering and business management. Uh, Wayne and I of course designed the uh, K2 together um, and also helped him on some of his original QRP rigs for the NorCal QRP club I'll show you in a second. And uh, it really, uh, our philosophies of design and also uh, starting a business meshed quite well. So it was one of those things we, we figured out pretty quickly that uh, we worked well together and uh, we've been enjoying uh, working together now for 22 years and, uh, and certainly growing the company as we did that. Um, it all started around this little radio. Uh, some of you folks may have this. This is a NorCal 40, which uh, Wayne designed actually uh, for the NorCal QRP club back in the mid nineties, I think. Um, and this is a single board design with no uh, interconnect cables or anything, a uh, clean mechanical design, uh, simple front panel, back panel, and U-shaped top and bottom covers with, uh, of course, all through-hole design. But a pretty good performance uh, four-watt uh, QRP radio on 40 meters. Um, 
I happened to uh, pick it up at a ham fest, which and I had not met Wayne at that time or even heard of him uh, on a lark uh, because I've been chasing DX with much bigger radios. And a friend and I thought this would be fun to do something on QRP. So we went uh, went that route. But uh, we uh, were both down front. My friend uh, Stan uh, N6ULU at the time and myself were down in Monterey, California, down near Carmel, just in the southern part of Monterey Bay, 30 minutes from here back in 1994. And we both picked up a couple of these kits, um, actually ordered them from the uh, club stand there at the uh, Hamfest and uh, built them and actually were chasing each other, trying to work countries the next year. And uh, both of us uh, actually got over 100 countries uh, at four watts. And uh, unfortunately, Stan had the bigger antenna and he worked 120. <laughs> I helped put that antenna up, so that's my fault. Um, but in 1994, um, around that time, I started uh, just for fun um, on every first Saturday, I think it was, uh, of each month. The NorCal QRP Club met out uh, after uh, a, a local ham radio flea market out in Livermore on the eastern side of Silicon Valley. And uh, ended up bumping into Wayne there at the club meetings, uh, which were held at a place called the California Burger uh, restaurant, uh, fast food restaurant, uh, hamburger place that... Uh, the club would take over in the mornings and they uh, we get breakfast there and have people bring their projects and things. It was mostly a builder's club and operating, but uh, we'd meet people there and uh, have you know, a big social event too. So we uh, met there and through the next couple of years operating field day together, we'd brainstorm uh, middle of the night uh, radio ideas for the ultimate field day radio. And uh, actually that's how the design for the K2 came about is we uh, wanted low current drain, reasonably actually very good performance because you have more than one transmitter usually nearby. And, uh, one thing led to another, and uh, we convinced ourselves we actually could uh, sell a product around this. So we uh, first uh, sort of floated it before we actually started the company in 1997 at the um, West Coast uh, AWRL uh, Ham Fest uh, called Pacificon outside of Silicon Valley, and uh, managed to have a, get a good crowd. We had about 50 or 70 people in the room, and we had a little projector showing the slides of this uh, proposed radio we hadn't built yet. And uh, people thought we were crazy, but we, uh, we gave them a feel for where we were going and uh, showed them how the radio was put together, including internal pictures like this. Though we did not put the 12-volt uh, internal battery at that mounting, uh, we discovered that if you drop the radio, a, a, a sealed lead acid battery can do a lot of damage inside a radio. So we ended up with, for the people who bought internal batteries on the K2, mounting it to the top cover, which worked out fine. But uh, we had a little foam mock-up, actually real size, with printed out uh, color circuit board uh, drawings on the uh, cards. And a lot of things changed my original design. We did not do vertical plug-in cards like you saw here. We um, actually went to um, more horizontal and, and uh, you know, plug-in modules inside. But uh, overall, the basic concept was the same from the start and uh, led to the K2. Uh, early on, uh, typical Silicon Valley guys, I lived over in the Monterey Bay. Wayne lives about an hour north of me. Uh, over in the San Francisco Bay Area on the peninsula near Stanford and Palo Alto and uh, I think he, in uh, San Carlos, he lives in Belmont. And uh, we would meet halfway at a restaurant called The uh, the Good Earth. And uh, this was the first circuit boards that we had made for the K2. And I was giving him a set so he could build a set and I would build a set and we'd get this thing working. When we started the company, we uh, talked a lot about what that meant, you know, what we wanted to do um, to get the company going. and really a couple things. And having been through some startups in Silicon Valley, I had some pretty strong uh, beliefs of what worked, what didn't work, we made a lot of them, you know, we all make a lot of mistakes and you learn from those. But certainly you've got to work hard. Um, not a lot of sleep sometimes, uh, but uh, the energy and the adrenaline keeps you going sometimes. One really important thing is uh, whenever you start a business and something that's been your hobby, you've got to realize it's not a hobby anymore for you. I mean, you have, certainly have a hobby aspect when you're, you're doing off on your own playing with it, but inside the business, uh, you've got to think of it as a business, um, and that's a different mindset. Uh, you still have fun with it, you still enjoy it, but uh, you've got to pay attention to the uh, cash flow, um, you know, getting good people on board, uh, really looking at what your costs are and bringing a product to market and pricing it accordingly, or you won't survive once you try to grow and you start bringing overhead for people to build it for you and manage accounting and, and uh, keep track of purchasing and you name it. And that adds a lot more than when you're in a basement just buying it by yourself. So. Uh, you have to design the profitability in from the start. We did that. Uh, cash flow, uh, you always, you know, you can go bankrupt uh, and, uh, you know, show a profit, but not have the cash flow to support the business. We uh, managed to support the company uh, pretty much with internal financing from day one. We haven't had to go outside for buying bank financing or, or venture capital. So it, uh, it's been a nice steady growth for us. And actually, you can go through the ups and downs of the economy when that happens if you've got 
your own uh, company cash balance that you saved up over the years, which we have, and that, that's helped a lot. Obviously good employees. Um, we also hire them outside. Uh, with the internet, we can have people virtual. And we did this even starting back in, in 2000. Our first uh, customer support engineer was in Arizona, uh, Gary Surrency, um, who was actually helping out customers on our email discussion list. And we needed somebody when it was too much work for myself to uh, keep doing customer support and grow the business. I was the first customer support guy, I guess. And uh, Gary came on board and operated from down there for, gosh, about 18 years for us before he retired. So we have engineers up and down the West Coast um, and virtual organization. And lastly, we took our customers and uh, the first 100 customers that were uh, willing to buy K2's uh, site unseen as we designed them uh, became evangelists for the product. Uh, and that really is from a marketing standpoint was wonderful because obviously uh, word of mouth is important for ham radio. A couple of other startup ingredients uh, we use the internet for viral marketing. Uh, we didn't even have any print ads for the first year, uh, just a web page and uh, also uh, the discussion groups. Uh, we did tech support, advertising, everything that way. And it uh, helped us get out and uh, get bootstrapped off the ground quickly. Obviously stay focused, uh, methodically built our product line, you know, one to add on module at a time. We had fun. You have to keep doing that or it wouldn't be worthwhile doing either. And you, certainly if you're having fun, you project that to your customers and that makes it fun for you guys too. Um, we listen and we always are adding things to the products. People that know us uh, realize that you can't do everything that we hear, but uh, we pay attention and try to improve the products continually over the whole lifetime of the product. Um, if you have a customer that's not happy, make sure you leave them happy afterwards. So we always will bend over backwards and even lose money on a transaction if it's, uh, you know, it's our fault, certainly, or even if it's in a gray area, we want to make sure we err on the side of you, not, uh, not leave you unhappy. So we work really hard at that. Also, you got to move fast. You design stuff. Uh, we build it. We break it in testing and get it out there um, to market as fast as we can. So uh, you cycle it as much as you can early on. Don't be trying to make it perfect uh, the first day. You get it going, test it, and have some field testers find the problems, get those fixed, cycle it, get it out. Obviously, try to design great products. And that's if you enjoy it and we have a lot of fun and I'll hopefully have some good designs out there and it's worked out well for us, uh, you get some successful products. And of course, you got to work even harder uh, after you get those first products out and you have to outdo it for the next one. Here's the K2 prototype from 1998. Um, this uh, was the first version of it. Again, the philosophy here was try to eliminate uh, cable harnesses like the old Heath kits used to have. So you didn't have to do a lot of wire soldering. All the boards plugged into each other. That's the front panel with the push buttons mounted on it, liquid crystal display. Also, another board behind it had the microprocessor and audio control logic on it. We ended up actually expanding that board to the full width of the radio as we added features uh, as we finished up the design. But the basic concept uh, was pretty much what you see here. And we brought this to a NorCal QRP meeting to show it off along with a couple of working prototypes as we got them going. And here's the first ones, Wayne, when uh, back when we had more hair, um, was showing off um, the first unpainted K2. This is back in 1998 um, in April. So before I think, I think we took these to Dayton that year, actually, if I remember correctly, um, either 98, yeah, 98. Um, and we uh, showed them some people there too, but uh, the uh, unpainted versions we had there, these are operating and we actually were working stations on the hood of my uh, little SUV there. And, uh, and it was quite interesting. So this is at the California Burger. You can see it in the background on the picture there. Um, for those of you that know some of the local QRP crowd and those guys, um, Dave Fifield over on the uh, right side, actually uh, with the glasses for, for from the UK. Uh, Chuck Adams in, in that uh, over in the red uh, uh, sweatshirt over in the far distance there, very fast CW operator. Uh, sharp guy, actually a rocket scientist and uh, K7QO I think is his current call. Uh, Vern Adams of Super Antennas is sort of in the middle with uh, suspenders over his yellow t-shirt. Um, so there are interesting folks there in those days, but uh, had a good crowd and we were showing off our toys and. Uh, we uh, got a lot of new uh, new customers uh, when we did that uh, from the crowd. We also operated field day together uh, that year. Uh, I had two K2s, and actually this is a picture from another group that was next to us operating about a mile away. And they couldn't figure out how, uh, with our radios, we were able to operate a few kilohertz away from them on CW and not get wiped out by their big 100 watt or even 500 watt signal. Um, the K2s had a pretty good rejection of adjacent signals, and they came by and checked us out, and we were shown off the insides when they took this picture of us. So that uh, memorialized uh, some dual K2 operation for field day with us. And so in 1998 uh, is when we uh, first uh, finished designing the K2 and we shipped our first K2s in January, I think the 22nd of 99. And I had gone full-time, I think in July of 98. 
and Wayne went full time right as we started shipping uh, full time. We actually got in the cover of Japanese CQ magazine, so we sort of uh, reversed uh, the radio invasion back that direction. That's showing some of Wayne's earlier QRP designs and the K2 there that we did together on the cover of theirs in, in September of 98. And this actually is Wayne and I were designed, uh, designed the radio to be shipped in uh, UPS, um, uh, USPS, excuse me, uh, priority mailboxes, the standard, uh, they're free, which is important to us back then. And we, uh, we basically uh, packaged up the first 100 and shuttled them down to the local post office in several trips. And they got used to us after that. First, they wanted to know what all these boxes were for. And we said, oh, we're starting a company. And they sort of smiled. And we came back with another load and another load and another load. And, and they got the idea that we actually were doing something serious. And they, uh, they got eventually ended up picking them up from us. But uh, it was fun to watch that grow. This, uh, after we moved out of my basement where we built those first 100 K2s um, in uh, 1999, this is our first office, not uh, very auspicious, but in Aptos, my town where I live, about uh, eight miles north of where the factory currently is uh, in Watsonville, just south of us. Um, and we had uh, two small suites, my palatial office here. You can see my office there, the U-shaped uh, folding tables put together with the computer on it our conference table, another table across uh, for our office manager and salesperson. We also had another room that was our manufacturing room where we kitted up the K2s and we had a little uh, basic, a large closet for the inventory at the time. At that time, we kept a lot of the parts inventory in little parts drawers versus uh, the way we do it now with a uh, large uh, inventory area with you know parts bins and everything else. But uh, we packed and shipped and did everything from this room for a number of years on all of the K2 and uh, K1 and further products out there. That was in 2000. Also in 2000, and we started going to some TAM fests um, outside of uh, the local ones. Um, and uh, this is at Fort Tuthill, Arizona. Again, a QRP crowd, though a number of them were buying the 100 watt version ultimately from us too, of the K2. And these guys surprised us. They didn't tell us they were all bringing their built up K2s that they built. And they uh, lined them all up and got us in a group picture for that. So we have fun with these things too. But uh, it was nice to see the enthusiasm of the customers. We were starting to realize we actually had something that, that was, it was starting to take off a little bit. We also had some crazy customers. Um, this is the first K2 in Antarctica. Excuse me. Um, this uh, person uh, called us up uh, and said he wanted to buy a K2. And we said, no problem. We can get it out to you. We have some in stock. He says, yeah, I need to get it quickly because I'm leaving for a week in Antarctica. I'm going to build it and take it with me. I said, are you sure you want to do that? Uh, you got to make sure you get everything together quickly and get it working. But he did and took it down with him and worked a lot of stations. And he sent us this QSL card. Uh, from down there. So he uh, it was certainly our, our first, I guess, unofficial de-expedition uh, with any of our radios back then. And uh, then in the lower corner is a little thing that says Elecraft Kool-Aid drinker, official Kool-Aid drinker using that uh, trademark Kool-Aid uh, picture of the little guy of, of, a, of the uh, drink on top of the radio one of our customers put together. Uh, we never made an official one out because we didn't want to violate the trademark, but uh, uh, people uh, were proud of that. We saw those show up on some t-shirts at Dayton one year, which was sort of fun. This is another group of crazy customers actually over in Europe. Um, they, you can't really tell from this picture probably um, over YouTube, but the, um, each of the frequency displays, the last four digits, they dialed up as the serial number of their K2s that they built or the KX1 on the right side and the K1 on the left side there. Um, and they actually um, had brought these and sent the picture to us so we could uh, see that they had them all together and, and got them going. Interesting thing, we didn't obscure our serial numbering uh, scheme so you could see where you were in the sequence. And people were very proud that they walk up, introduce myself, hi, I'm W6XYZ uh, K2 serial number uh, 2321 or something like that. And they would do that and have them on their t-shirts and everything. So we've maintained that uh, same um, pattern for all of our radios and it, uh, it certainly people can sort of track where they are. So in 2000, we did a 100 watt version of the K2. We weren't just a QRP company. That was just how to get started and, and go after a, a target audience that we knew was looking for some new products initially. But we knew the 100 mar market was very important to us to survive as we grew and you know broaden out to the, the broader ham radio market. What we didn't realize is that would kick the K2 into um, the de-expedition world much more heavily. And uh, because of its receipt performance, um, ARRL had given it a very high rating and certainly for a kit, which is, you know, like the old Heath kits, they didn't expect this to uh, be a super high performance radio, but it actually got up near the top, at the top of the charts for a while. And for a number of years was the radio of choice for a lot of people. And uh, we even had people building them for other people who couldn't build a radio just so they could get the radio, which was sort of neat. So this shows the 100 watt cover on top of a K2. You could un upgrade over time with the radio, which a lot of our people did. 
here's the K1 that we came out with after that. And I'm going to speed up a little bit so we can get to the Q&A session afterwards here. I'll walk through these real quick. This was a four band QRP only radio. You could actually receive off a nine volt battery for a while, but not transmit, but it did have an internal AA battery or external. Still quite popular. We don't make it anymore, but it had a really nice uh, smooth sounding receiver. So that was nice portable radio. This was one of our first, uh, our second date, and I think uh, that's Wayne on the left, myself, and my wife, Lerma, Katie 6 a and she's a retired semiconductor engineer. And that is Gary Surrency, the first uh, support engineer we had uh, with us at the show. So that was our total crew uh, at the show. I think we left two people back at the factory <laughs> while we were there. So we weren't super large, but it was a very successful show in our single booth, Dayton booth there. As we grew, though, in 2002, we moved out of that into uh, initially one suite, and then two, then three, then four, then five in a complex that was actually above a grocery shopping store area down below, but this is an outdoor sort of office complex. And uh, we were rolling carts back and forth as we assembled things and had engineering in one, one suite and, and uh, sales and marketing and admin in another one and production test and inventory in another one. It was, a, it was quite an interesting operation. We were there uh, for quite a while, at least up until I think uh, 2008 or nine, that time frame. But we introduced the K K3 in this complex. Our next radio though was the KX1, which is our first trail friendly radio with the controls on top. Uh, still uh, very sought after, and uh, it's been superseded by the KX2 now, which is similar design, but with all modes, sideband. This was CW only, though it could receive sideband, and that was in 2004. So we're starting to broaden our line out at that point. But then we came out with the, 2000, the uh, K3 in 2007, and we had to outdo the K2, and uh, uh, surprisingly, we, we did, and it, it was extremely successful. We made this one both factory assembled and kit, and that really exploded for us the size of the company and our success. And of course, uh, it's become a standard for de-expeditions and contesting and, um, and it sort of set our reputation over the years. And so each time we do a new radio, of course, we have to do a little better. But this, uh, this one has uh, been very popular over the years. I'm sure a lot of you have these too. Here's our first test production area. So um, Renee on the left, who's still with us, uh, Dale, who's uh, passed away now, unfortunately, in the middle, and uh, Vic were the first three senior techs that we had that uh, basically brought up every single radio we shipped for quite a while. And we added a few extra guys to help them in terms of the final test. But uh, you can see their test stations there with SIG gens, scopes, and, and computers. We actually eventually uh, computer uh, controlled most of the test stuff with these guys supervising it. So this speed up the testing and uh, it's come quite a way since these early days, but that's what it looked like. Followed that with the KPA 500, uh, 500 watt solid state amp still to this day. It's a great successful product for us and it just as a brick, it just keeps running. It has linear supply for simplicity and the same size as the K3. And that was the K, we call it the K line uh, with echoes back to the old Collins S line. And that's the P3 pan adapter in the middle. That's a FFT DSP based pan adapter, uh, very high performance for the K3. And works with other radios too. It'll work with a lot of different IF frequencies. At the K3 kicked us in the larger quarters. This is where we are now, down in Watsonville. We moved in in 2012 actually. And uh, we've taken over more and more of this building. I think we're about half of it now um, for our engineering, production, test, marketing, uh, warehouse uh, facilities. Engineers are still spread both there and up and down the West Coast. So we've got uh, quite a crew uh, spread outside the factory too. Next, the KX3 in 2011-12. This is a really big first soda successful radio for us. So the KX1 was doing it too. But this was all mode up through six meters, 160 through six. Still sell them. Um, it runs data modes, CW, sideband, built-in paddle if you want, or mic, uh, plug into it. And uh, of course, we added things like a little pan adapter to it, the PX3, 100 watt amp. So people even use these for home stations. Getting a little more sophisticated as we did this stuff over time. Remote controlling the K3, we did a remote control panel called the K30. It's become a standard for a lot of remote stations. Uh, the remotehamradio.com guys used them, and uh, remote hams. Uh, from Brandon, KG6YPI also has these uh, tied into K3s on his free network that people use. And a lot of folks have their home stations controlled with these still to this day. Then we did the K3S. Next thing, we had to get even a little more performance out of the K3, which we did, and pumped the phase noise down even further and got more performance close in and, and uh, gave some more, uh, more life to the radio. Uh, matter of fact, uh, we kept selling the uh, K3S all the way up until uh, this last year, um, just before... Uh, Actually, uh, in 2019, was it 19? Thinking back now, I think it was yeah, 2019, um, just before Dayton, we um, we discontinued it and uh, introduced the K4. And that shows the pan adapter on the right there in operation. 
nicely. You've got a great review from QST. So we've worked really hard to do that. And of course, also from the RSGB for you guys. So it, uh, is, we keep trying to uh, push these little higher performance sheets time. It's always a challenge to do that, but it's getting up there now where it's, uh, you're, you're hitting some ceilings, but uh, the performance set is really important to us. So we shrunk the KX3. The KX2 is really sort of the standard for soda stuff now. Now here we squeezed down to the same size as a KX1. I don't know if I have a picture of them together, but uh, they're almost exactly the same case size, but this one has a full uh, SDR based receiver like the, the KX3 uh, K has in the K3S. This one was direct IQ conversion to baseband and, and directly into DSP. And we sell a ton of these and they're by far, they were the first radio to get uh, quickly to 5,000 radios, much quicker than anything else we had in our past radios. And we, I don't, I've lost track of how many of these we sold over the years. And of course, you see the soda guys uh, on them quite a bit uh, operating. Um, this is the day we introduced it at, uh, we literally introduced it at Dayton in 2016 and we were mobbed and we have a 40 foot long booth and we could barely move the whole time there. Uh, you see Lisa, who was our head of uh, sales and inside admin there with her hands up over the air. I think her computer had just crashed and uh, she was bringing it back up. And of course, everybody wanted to keep ordering the lines kept getting longer. This actually was a calm period where you could actually see the table. They, people were standing up and surrounding it for the first three or four hours we were there. We even had some guys uh, put a walkie talkie antenna on it and there's a built in microphone in the KX2 and this fellow put this picture on Twitter and we saw this uh, on, on there and finally found out who it was and he gave us permission to post it. But uh, he was walking around talking to people, I think on 20 meters inside the uh, Dayton Hamvention with it. I also operate mobile with a KX2. You can see that above the uh, Camwood Tribander there. 100 watt uh, amplifier, KXP100, my amplifier and uh, little RAV4 that I drive around. Also for soda, if you guys know uh, Emil um, DL8JJ, big mountaineer and also soda guy. And he has both these radios, KX2 and KX3. And he's been carrying those up mountains for now years and uh, has uh, just done amazing stuff with them. Of course, uh, you'll hear a lot of soda guys with them. And also uh, WG0AT, they call him the goat man because he brings some pack goats with him in Colorado where he lives. And uh, that's him with a KX2 actually on the cover of QST back in 2016. KPA 1500, we uh, stretched the KPA 500, full of solid state. We've got thousands of these out there now and uh, they've done extremely well for us too. So we've covered the whole QRP and high-end QRO range now at this point. So quickly on the K4, I'm gonna go through this quick. I'm not gonna uh, dwell on it too long, but this is our latest and greatest. Um, we are shipping them now. Um, we finally uh, got production turned on after all the disruption this year with COVID and uh, fires in California smoke and uh, you name it. Uh, and of course the production uh, disruptions from that, both in terms of suppliers to us and our own stuff with the engineers uh, having to, you know, one couple of cases lost homes and also people defending their homes to make sure they didn't lose them and dealing with the smoke and everything else. But that's all cleared out now. We're sort of back to normal, beautiful clear day here on Monterey Bay today. Um, so this is the K4. Uh, I'm gonna jump through this really quick so I don't take too long, but uh, it's on our webpage also, so we can talk about it there. Basically, it's a high-performance 160 through 6-meter radio. We have also room for an internal VHF, UHF module, so you'll see that coming out. Um, dual receive in all of our versions, uh, dual pan adapters if you want, or single pan adapter, you can switch it back and forth. Uh, you don't need crystal filters in the K4 and the K4D. It's all high-performance uh, DSP filtering, direct sampling, and uh, user-adjustable transmit receive equalizers. Of course, a high-res color touchscreen, though you don't have to use it for everything. Um, you've got good physical buttons also. I like that on a radio. We actually improved them over the K3S and K3. They have physical buttons behind them that click and uh, harder rubber uh, buttons on there that are very rugged, don't wear out and give you a nice tactile feedback too, which I like. Um, also, by the way, we changed the audio and actually have had wonderful feedback from contesters and uh, guys operating DX chasing and stuff. The fatigue factor with this radio is even, is this, you know, K3 was not a bad radio at all, but this is this noticeably better than a lot of radios, including the K3 out there. If you're in a contest for a long period of time, the fatigue factor they reported to us is much less. And uh, for instance, in cases we have the other end of a pileup, we had the California QSO party this last weekend, for instance, and a number of people in our field test group had their friends that had not used the K4 operating it. And their first comment was unprompted after a number of hours operation is, hey, I can pull more people out of the pileups calling them since they were the W6 calls in the, uh, in the uh, QSO party. Um, than they've been able to do with other radios or even the K3. So that was, that was an incredible uh, piece of feedback. So that worked out well for us. We're glad to see that work well too. Here's an actual picture of the K4 close up. 
And you can see it in dual pan adapter mode here um, on two bands. At the K4D, you can add a second A to D converter, which gives you optimal two band reception off two different antennas or diversity reception if you want to. And, or you can just uh, specialize have one full pan adapter here. We also drive external HDMI monitor. So it, uh, it lets you uh, have a copy of this screen or just the pan adapter. So it can be a specialized pan adapter screen and we'll have other apps for it uh, externally too. Here's a close up of the screen. We do have some touchscreen stuff for adjustment. You can actually hit the band button and bring up band stacking register buttons. And, uh, but for the most part, everything's at the top level and uh, menus are mostly for setup of the radio, not for everyday operating. So it's, it's pretty quick for setting things up to where you like it. And then you can just operate like you would with a K3 or any other radio. Last of the feature list, and then I'll get on to some other fun stuff here, but uh, low signal delay processing with a very fast DSP processor, full speed uh, QSK break in CW, and of course, data modes and sideband are, are seamless. Uh, diode switch like our radios for all our other radios for TR, so it uh, is very quiet. And uh, also we've got some new uh, special noise reduction we're bringing out for it. And uh, of course, external 10 megahertz reference if you wanna lock it to an external GPS reference standard in the radio too. I won't go through every connector on the back, but they're all back there. You've got multiple antenna inputs. If you've got uh, the antenna tuner and the radio, you have five separate antenna sources. You can switch to each of the two receivers independently, which is nice. And also we have ethernet, USB, um, of course the legacy uh, IO from the K3S also, and even RS-232. They can all be operated. For instance, you can have RS-232 commands coming into the radio. Um, you can be talking to it over a computer, over USB-B, um, or even doing stuff over the uh, USB-A connectors. And they all can take, you know, the Ethernet, they all can take commands simultaneously and be talking to different programs and stuff. So pretty powerful. And of course, the remote control over the Ethernet too, um, over USB also uh, can be done. I'm going to jump over this just because we're running out of time. Um, I want to get the questions, but uh, there's the uh, KPA 1500 next to the K4. You've got uh, basically exactly the same size. When we came out with the KPA 1500. We had not announced the K4. People wanted to know why we picked that size for the RF deck on the 1500. And now you know. Wanted to make sure they matched so we had a new K-line uh, with these two radios. And the radio is upgradable. I won't go through all the details here, but basically you can buy a basic K4 and then add the additional A to D converters in the K4D or go for a little more blocking dynamic range with the K4HD, which is an additional superhead front end for it. One last thing here on the K4. Um, this was right before Dayton, before we announced the radio. It was sort of a teaser shot we put on Twitter. And this was me sitting with the K4 up in the corner. We didn't say it was there, but there it was. And just said, Eric, looking at the new products we're bringing at uh, Dayton. And I had a tablet with me showing remote control using the same UI from the K4. It's not a full-fledged remote control app. But we took that same screen you see on the K4 and compiled it on a Windows Surface tablet. And I was able to touch and control the screen. It was real time. And actually, we could take another K4. And we had that and this tablet control the, the radio at the uh, show. And we've shown that a number of times to people. And as we uh, develop that, we'll eventually have a K4 zero, if you want to call it that, uh, remote panel for the K4 to look and operate just like the radio with pan adapter and everything coming over Ethernet. So a couple of fun things here, um, then we'll wrap into questions. Um, lots of the expedition people. The lower right-hand corner actually was the first one, VP6DX, that took our first K3s out when we were still in that over the grocery store set of suites. And uh, we we're a little scared, but they uh, worked a new record number of contacts with those and set the, the uh, you know, the popularity of the radio for all the other de-expeditioners, which you'll see here. Certainly things like this is the Heard Island de-expedition back in uh, 2016. Um, this is the uh, South Sandwich Islands, South Georgia Islands. Those are those orange tents that almost got blown off, off the islands uh, near the end. We almost lost all the radios, but they set some new records and uh, were very successful. Uh, also the South Orkney Islands twice and a whole bunch of other de-expeditions, of course. So you'll see K3s and our other radios out there. I like a little simpler de expeditions. This is one of my operating positions on a uh, trip out in the middle of the South Pacific. And so uh, for me, it's usually a KX3 or KX2 with uh, simple antennas over the water and uh, still working a lot of stations, which is great. A little more relaxing too. You can sit outside if you want and have something cool to drink. This is the same location. I think this was north of Tahiti uh, back a number of years ago. And uh, we have a little fun too once in a while also, which is great. So. Open it up for questions. Um, anything people want to ask, uh, I guess uh, one of the moderators here is going to pull them off of uh, YouTube or whatever you guys have, but uh, I'll uh, put some more time in here, at least until we uh, run out of time and they kick me off. We probably got about uh, 10, 15 minutes and I'd be glad to answer questions for you on anything. And uh, I'll put some links up here too, in terms of ways to contact us uh, via, of course, uh, the web, email, 
Twitter, RSGB, of course, uh, for your RSGB information too. But thanks a lot, and let's go with some questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Eric. It's Martha. The K4 looks gorgeous, I have to say. Um, lots of questions coming in, actually. Uh, Richard uh, G4 HGI wants to know your secret for being so chipper at this time of the morning, or the time of the morning it is with you. What about one o'clock? Yeah, it's one about, it? uh, gosh, what is it now? It's 1.38 in the morning a.m. In, in California. So yeah, we uh, also uh, we also have Bob W06W in California watching uh, uh, this morning as well. Wow. Uh, right, questions. Gregory, M0ODZ, thanks you for being the keynote uh, speaker. And um, he wants to know uh, uh, how much do you have to keep an eye on? Uh, oh, no, that's not that's not his question. That's another, that's another question. Uh, I'll come back to Gregory's question in, in a moment. But um, you were saying that uh, you do listen to customers and they give you feedback and then and then you act on it. Uh, and I was going to ask you how much, what sort of things you've you've changed uh, because of because of that. But wow. uh, Robert Walker, Robert Walker has uh, a message to say the new Russian five nine nine TX five hundred is a challenger to the KX two, uh, as it's claimed to be more rugged and environmentally uh, and environmental and environment proof. How will you respond to that product in your own offering? Any thoughts on okay. that? Um, that's a good question. Um, it's, uh, I've looked at that radio, though I haven't actually uh, used it myself. And uh, is that the one that's actually hogged out, has the case hogged out of a piece of aluminum? I forget which one it is. Um, but uh, I think that from a performance standpoint, we still outperform it in terms of receiver performance on the KX2. Um, generally, also, um, you know, one of our probably strengths here, you mentioned that we listen to the customers, well, we're continually adding features to the radio based on feedback from the customers. Um, We've added different filtering capabilities, for instance, data modes, things like that over the years. Um, and basically, uh, you know, lots of things that make it easier to use, certainly from a soda standpoint. Um, KX2 actually has, is a fairly rugged radio. It's not um, you know, totally waterproof or anything like that, though actually um, uh, an add-on product from Side KX, which is uh, Scott uh, has a company in the States that makes those little add-on uh, side panels and a clip-on uh, waterproof cover for the radio has, uh, really made it uh, for the guys around outdoors and soda and things like that even better. And so from a ruggedness standpoint, we do very well though. We've actually even had uh, the special forces like the Green Berets and people like that uh, in the States uh, independently, they buy them as off the shelf. It's not a government contract, but they'll buy five or 10 at a time for their, uh, their battalion groups and stuff. And they, um, they're using them in, in some pretty nasty areas. Um, they hook up their encrypted stuff to it and do what they're going to um, I'm not too worried from a ruggedness standpoint. Obviously, power drain, um, the ability to, um, you know, the small radio that's reliable uh, with internal lithium batteries like we do, but also um, have reasonably good receiver performance. And the KX2 absolutely does. Um, I think we'll hold it pretty well. We're not seeing a dent in sales. KX2 sales have actually gone up. Um, and actually, KX3, the same thing. And over, actually, we had strong sales throughout the COVID. Uh, crisis here, even when we were shut down for a number of weeks uh, in California, uh, back during the uh, the spring here, um, we actually KX2 and KX3 sales kept coming in, and um, when we came back and there, we had a big backlog. We still do actually; we had even stronger orders. So, at this point, I don't think it's a big problem. Uh, we certainly will watch that, see if there's something they're doing we we have to react to. But I haven't seen anything we have to do really heavily yet at this okay. point. Dave GM0HVS wants to know if there's any possibility of a replacement for the K2. Uh, that can be built rather than assembled. He says, I like my KX3, but I love my K2. Well, the K2, we're still selling. Uh, I think it will be as soon as I can keep getting parts for it. It's a through hole, you know, 160 through a 10 meter uh, side end CW transceiver. Um, we're not re engineering that right now. It may happen someday, uh, especially if we run out of parts uh, that, that are through hole for it that we can get. Uh, problem is that if we go surface mount, uh, it's really not practical to make a surface mount kit at that scale for that complex of radio. Uh, the economics work out, it's almost more expensive to make that than assemble it. Uh, because the parts are so small, we have to individually bag and handle them. A lot of them aren't even marked because they're mainly made for a computer, you know, for mechanical uh, or robotic assembly. So we, um, and we would have to actually do something like we do with the K4 or the K3 and K4 where the boards are pre-assembled and tested. It's more of an assembly operation. But in light of that, we're going to try, the through hole parts are still available for a lot of these things. We may have some small boards that have a microprocessor and other things that are surface mount only pre-mounted. 
um, in the future. That's one thing we've talked about. And then you get to do all the rest of the soldering and bring up with the radio. So, but the K2, you still have that experience and we still have people buying them and, you know, get every option possible for it to uh, have that building experience. So we're going to try to keep doing that. It's amazing. We've had that radio going for over 20 years now, but um, I'm not announcing anything new. They're not going to replace it short term. Uh, obviously, we've got our hands full just getting the K4 ramped up now. It's going to be dominating us for the next uh, six to 12 months. So you're not going to see a, a KX4 or, or a KX2 on steroids at this point. You'll see software changes and, and enhancements on those, but uh, uh, you never know in the future. We'll see. You've just answered Gregory Fenton's uh, question. Uh, you said, what's next for Elecraft, uh, apart from some well-deserved <laughs> sleep? Is there a watch this space moment coming up? So, no, I guess is the, uh, is uh, the answer. Never, we, might, we, we never tell you until we get there. We might surprise you. But <laughs> uh, at this point, I'd say really realistically right now, um, you're going to see K4, K4 enhancements, add-ons, uh, remote control panels, those types of things over the next year. Um, and I think we'll have our hands full, to be honest. That's a, it's, you know, we've got a huge backlog on that, and uh, we want to obviously keep that satisfied first. And we're not seeing a problem with the KX2s and KX3s. Now, that said, um, every time a new radio gets announced, you always see an impact for a month or two where people sort of pause and say, what's this other radio about? And then uh, what's interesting is then the sales come right back to where they were, or even better sometimes. So uh, those radios have had a lot of staying power, and we tend to keep our radios going for a long time because they're designed using some pretty good technology. But um, that said, if there's an opportunity to do something cool, we'll, we'll do it, but I can't say when. Okay, um, nice to see call signs, by the way, on your questions, if you possibly can. Uh, one from, it just says Tristan's workbench. Uh, why was the first Elecraft radio called a K2 rather than a K1? Uh, Were there okay. plans for a K1 at the time? Oh, sorry, it's a G0KAY. Okay, uh, that, thank you. It's a, that's a story I've told a few times, it'll be real quick, but when we first announced it at that uh, Pacificon uh, meeting back in 1997, we were all talking about what's going to happen and in the year 2000 with, uh, you know, uh, computer clocks rolling over and not having enough bits uh, or, you know, bytes to properly do that and thinking programs are going to crash and we're going to have some kind of disaster. And, uh, but also we were thinking about mountaintops and uh, like K2 and um, um, are we going to, and so we are 2K either way. But uh, we probably st we stayed away from uh, 2K because that sounded too much like the 2000 deal. We were thinking mostly mountaintops, so um, we uh, we called it the K2, and uh, and went with that. We I just, it was just really wasn't thinking a sequence at that time. But of course, uh, we had the K1 come out afterwards, which was smaller scale, so it was a smaller number going down, and then we had um, of course the KX line of products, the KX1, KX3, and then KX2. Um, KX2 being a smaller version of the KX3, so you can sort of see the numbers going that way. So that's sort of how our numbering scheme worked on those. And then, of course, the K, uh, but the KX meant X for extreme. Um, so for the uh, portable radios and then the soda type radios, that's how those came about. So that's how the K2 came. It was uh, it was not uh, thought of the sequence at the time. Okay, questions coming thick and fast now, so we'll have to uh, belt through these. Um, Mike G4 G4 CDF says, do you have any plans for a VHF UHF? Rig similar to the IC9700? Not in the short term. Um, the market's been pretty well served, obviously, by, by ICOM and some of the other guys in that area. But uh, like I said, you'll see the K4 with a pretty good performance uh, VHF, UHF module, and we can build it different ways. It could be uh, 70, uh, you know, 70 megahertz, four meters and two meters, or it might be two meters in UHF. Uh, we've got the capability of doing a number of things with that module. So. Uh, you'll probably see that first from us in terms of VHF, UHF work. Um, it's a little hard in the VHF, UHF market um, and to really be competitive with um, the main suppliers and that just because the um, overall cost of the products are, are pushed down quite a bit. Um, and it's, uh, it's a lot harder unless you can really carve out a performance niche that people are willing to pay for there. And it's, it's our observation is, is it's, not going to be super easy if we were doing it as a standalone radio versus part of a radio like the K4. Through all these questions, but uh, John Earnshaw, M0JFE, says, uh, as now we're seeing SDR radio equipment becoming accessible to more people with a smaller budget, what do you see as being the next step for radio after SDR? <laughs> Boy, um, I think you'll see the SDR part staying around for quite a while. You'll see the performance go up. Um, as analog to digital converters get better, uh, logic gets faster, 
uh, we can do some more creative things with it uh, and get more performance out of it in terms of even more dynamic range and do some other things with it in terms of wider bandwidth modes. Um, so you'll see that. One of the things we designed in the K4, so it's uh, not going to be obsolete quickly if new parts do come out, is the what we call digital down converters, which are where we literally digitally sample at RF, at the operating frequency, say 14 megahertz if you're on 20 meters or 28 megahertz uh, if you're on, uh, on 10 meters or so on. Uh, and we directly sample that at 122 megahertz right now with a uh, very high speed analog to digital converter and then digitally down converted on that single little card. Uh, but say a whole whiz bang new uh, set of parts come out uh, four years, five years from now, we can keep the radio and upgrade it like we did uh, with things on the K4, K3 to a K3S. We could have a K4S for instance, and also you know, sell upgrades to people that have the K4s, which makes you know, our radios attractive to people because they can get a lot of lifetime out of it. So I think you'll see that. I don't think the DSP part's gonna go away. We've been using DSP for a lot of things, demodulation ever, ever since uh, the K3 days. And uh, certainly inside the KX2s and, um, and KX3, we use them also. So I don't think the DSP is gonna go away. I think you'll see faster and more creative uh, software implementations in terms of features we add to it. And of course, you know, newer parts. We've got uh, a talk on DSP coming up later on the more about, learn more about uh, stream from uh, William Eustace. Um, but we're reaching the end of our time now, uh, Eric. Um, just before you did say uh, in, in your talk that this is a business for you, not not a hobby. But do oh, you actually get do you actually business. get time to play? Yeah, I've got a whole radio shack down uh, here in the, in the bottom floor of the house. I'm on the side of a hill here, about a mile from the ocean, and the uh, basement I, I built out um, on that. It's like half the width of the house down there because we're on sort of at, at edge of a pretty good sized slope hill and uh, put a good sized ham shack in there years ago. And uh, that's my lab and ham shack and occasionally my office uh, high down there. But I, um, I get on and operate. I've been operating actually uh, just this afternoon. I was on a little bit too. Um, I uh, you know, do everything from just making sure I'm using our radios and so I can see what works and what doesn't work to my satisfaction. Um, and actually, <laughs> I inadvertently worked with somebody at FT8 that I wasn't even trying to. I was just watching them and I, I was uh, moving my mouse around and inadvertently clicked on the signal and little did I know I already had worked in my this time it was over. That was pretty funny. But uh, no, I get on, I'm, I'm, I operate CWM side beam too. I'm sorry, yeah, I know we're getting tired of time. Go ahead, I'm sorry. That's great, yeah. Just one final question from everybody. When will we see the, K, uh, the K4 and how much? Okay. Um, Pricing over in Europe uh, usually is, of course, you can you can buy directly from us and ship. You've got to pay your import duty uh, coming into the country that way. Um, but uh, the CE testing that we do, we've actually done the preliminary testing already. We usually have to wait until the final production units are rolling off the line and make sure we go through a full test on that. It's not something you submit to a government agency, which is nice. There's not that bureaucratic delay. So. Um, we basically go through the test lab and just catch any uh, minor things that are specific to CE that maybe we have to tweak um, on the radio just to make sure they're happy with that. Um, obviously, we, we design the radios to be clean in terms of emissions and stuff. And that's the key thing with CE. Uh, because there's not 110 volt supply in it, we don't have to go through the whole high voltage part of it that you do for like the linear amplifiers that we sell. But uh, it, uh, it should go pretty quickly. I'd say we'll probably have that complete over the next uh, 60 to 90 days, and you'll probably see them starting to pop up in Europe in that time frame, maybe even faster. I'm trying to push it as fast as we can, but we've got our hands full with the uh, current backlog, which is primarily uh, uh, not in Europe based, unless they were you know, buying them in the States and carrying them over. Um, but um, the, uh, I'd say in that time frame over the next, next 90 days, you'll see them probably start um, some popping up over in Europe. Uh, if people may be the place to sort of a uh, put me in line, but not in official order, um, and uh, and then uh, they'll come back and take it as soon as we start shipping. That's great. That's uh, I'm sure everybody will be really interested to see those arrive here. Well, Eric, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us in the middle of your night uh, and giving us a fascinating insight into the all the goings on at uh, Eddycraft. Uh, we really appreciate it. Again, you'll have to imagine the round of applause that's uh, ringing out now around the uh, around the globe. Uh, really, uh, you're welcome to stay and uh, watch the proceedings, but I guess uh, there's sleep to catch up on there. So, all the streams will be will, they will be available later in the day. By the way, but. Thanks very much, Eric. All the best to you. Okay. 73 from us here. Right. Um, well, we've uh, got uh, the streams starting very shortly at uh, 10 o'clock. 
Um, while Rob and Dom from CamHams are setting those uh, links up, uh, let's pay another visit to the national. Let's pay a visit to the uh, national radio centre at Bletchley Live. By the way, if you're watching on the Introduction Two stream, by the way, Joe M1WD MWD will shortly have advice on getting fun from operation operating a, a small modest station on the learn more about stream m0 rtp rail would be extolling the virtues of qro magnetic loop antennas and there are links to each stream on the rsgb website and the web addresses should appear on the screen anytime now okay so uh, let's go to um uh, let's go to Bletchley Good morning. and see what's uh, happening to the there. RSGB's GB3 RS National Radio is on Centre, the air. We'll try and find out a, a frequency Park. for you. I'm Martin Baker, G0GMB, NRC coordinator. And I work with a team of volunteers here who help to run the centre. During the day today, we'll be running some QSOs, live QSOs from our GB3 RS station. And it'll be really great to have you call in to make QSOs and uh, have a contact with us. We're going to be operating on a number of different frequencies, 80 meters, 40 meters, 20 meters, uh, two meters, and uh, we hope to be also on our Oscar 100 station as well. To help you find us during the day, uh, we'll be sharing our operating frequencies with you on social media and on the DX cluster. For those of you who haven't been to the NRC before, I'm going to give you an overview of our radio setup, our station here. However, before we do that, just to remind everybody that due to the uh, virus situation, the NRC is temporarily closed to visitors, although Bletchley Park has reopened, the NRC is still closed. And today, um, the video streaming is being done uh, in accordance with COVID precautions and uh, we'll be wearing face masks whilst we're operating and maintaining social distancing. Now, in terms of the actual radio setup that we've got here, we have a number of radios. On the HF bands, we have a Flex 6500. Uh, it will run anything between 40 meters up to six meters with the aerial that we have connected to it. And we have a Maestro screen uh, for uh, making easy operation. The flex itself, we keep the power output from the flex quite low. That drives into a Gemini HF linear amplifier, and that will produce 400 watts for us, uh, which feeds up to the step IR three element beam, which is located on the uh, roof of B block on a small tower at about 50 feet. In conjunction with the flex radio, we run Log of 32 software, and that 32 software has a uh, DX cluster built into it so we can immediately spot incoming stations and click on that will automatically align the radio to the correct frequency and we'll tune the flex, sorry, the step IR to be resonant on that frequency too. Moving on to the uh, LF bands, we have two radios that we can use, um, an FTDX 5000 and also just along the bench we have an IC7300. The uh, Yesu radio is connected to a multiband dipole, which is at about 40 feet, um, again over the top of uh, one of the blocks in Bletchley Park. And on both the HF and LF bands we're running CW, SSB, and we also have the ability to run FT8 QSOs on those bands. Moving further along on the radio bench, we have two radios which will cover the VHF bands. We have a TS2000, which we use with SAT PC32 software, and we use that for tracking polar orbiting satellites. And uh, we also uh, can track the International Space Station with that. Uh, it's also used with uh, FM repeaters and um, FM simplex on the TS2000. Next to that, the IC9700, um, and that's radio we use predominantly for 2 meters and 70 SEMs uh, SSB QSOs, uh, but we also have, and CW, but we also have the ability to run FT8 on that, uh, on that radio as well, which makes an interesting demonstration. And the 9700 we use in conjunction with a Gemini uh, 2. Uh, 70 centimeter, sorry, a two meter 
a linear amplifier as well, which will generate up to 400 watts for us. So that's the, uh, the main radio bench. And then on the far side, which is not uh, in camera shot at, at the moment, we have our Oscar 100 station. And the Oscar 100 station, we are using a separate transmit and receive path. For the transmit side, we use an FT818, which is then feeding into a Kuna uh, ampli uh, up converter. So we have a really nice setup here. We hope you'll have um, some QSOs with us today. Thank you very much. As to what uh, what frequency they're on, uh, they're, or frequencies, in fact, uh, that they're that they're on, and uh, we'll let you know. My uh, my rig's gone to sleep at the minute, so I, I I can't check. But we'll be dropping in live at the NRC throughout the day. In fact, we'll be going there in in just a second. But we are about to uh, split, obviously. Uh, introduction to Stream with Joe M1 MWD and the Learn More About Stream with M0 RTP Rail starting very very soon here at the RSGE convention online. But uh, for the moment then, let's go and see what's happening live at Bletchley. Oh well, not much time up, let's see. <laughs> Hello, I'm Jim Lee, G4AEH. Welcome to the Learn More About stream, part of the RSGB convention online 2020. Apologies, by the way, for some gremlin <coughs> right at the very start of the uh, transmission today. It all worked perfectly in rehearsal, but my internet's dropped out twice. My YouTube chat has frozen. That's it's technology. Uh, the idea now is that every hour we'll have speakers on topics that range from propagation and the weather, VHF, ion scatter, HF and VHF contesting, understanding DSP and taking your CW to the next level. That's something I meant to do during lockdown. Uh, so an hour from now, my old mate Jim Bacon, G3YLA, will be looking at VHF propagation and weather. Now, though, it's time to meet Rail Pasta, M0RTP. If you have any questions to ask Rail, do write them on the YouTube chat facility, as long as they don't get uh, buried in the chat. And as long as we have time towards the end, we'll do our best to include them. And please make sure you have your call sign on there. That'd be very nice. Now, I seem to remember a time when there were letters to and arguments in Radcom and Practical Wireless decrying magnetic loop antennas as amateur radio snake oil that's that's how i remember it anyway but there's no doubt well they're now an effective solution to getting us on air where space is limited for for one thing so there's one thing radio amateurs can agree upon is if you can't hear a remote station you can't work the remote station so you know to quote scott adams engineers like to solve problems and if there are no problems handily available they will create their own problems to solve so I'm Rail Pastor, M0RTP, and I'm going to give you an overview of what I've done to overcome some of the challenges at my QTH in order to work the world and go into, you know, a little bit about who I am, the why, the what, the how you too can get some of these results from your backyard or attic. So this presentation will be available to you to download. So if I'm going to be moving through the slides at some pace and I'm using them just really as an aid to what I'm presenting. So by all means, also reach out to me after the event to find out anything more about loops and how you can get on the air with them. So without much further ado, I've been in amateur radio for probably close, fast approaching 40 years. Um, I'm not an expert. I'm an ex I'm a tinker try experimenter and uh, I have my share of RF burns to prove it. Don't recommend them. I'm a member of RADOC. I have interests in Arduino, ESP32, home automation, amateur radio, of course, building antenna systems, building linear amplifiers. I built a number of station controllers using microcontrollers, etc., and uh, small computing devices. I work in the IT industry. So 
what is the talk going to cover? The talk's going to cover some of the controversy, the snake oil that has been mentioned. And I'm actually going to include some thermal imaging scans that I've done of magnetic loops, just to demonstrate that they aren't glorified garden warmers. I will also share my experiences of the, the how, the what you need to do in order to get an efficiently designed loop. I won't go unnecessarily into the theory. Uh, you know, if you want the theory there, I can point you at plenty of sites towards the end of the presentation where you can get into the theory. There are some additional considerations, especially if you're building QRO loops and some operating practices you need to have in mind. I will cover the performance of the loops using Whisper and FD8 in particular and demonstrating some proof through the QSLs that I've had. I will also cover what I've done to achieve 10 through 160 meter coverage uh, through a station controller controlling three loops. Automagically having a broadband antenna system, if you will, using magnetic loops that are renowned for being high Q. I do want to add one disclaimer, and that is any commercial products are a subset available on the market. They do not carry any endorsement from myself. And I don't get any commercial gain and your mileage will certainly vary. One last point. If I have got any references missing from source material on here, please let me know. I can hardly claim an original thought for very much of this. So why loops? Well, when I moved to the UK, I had a new QTH. I ideally wanted to operate on all HF bands. I had insufficient space as many of you do an insufficient height to build an antenna system that would support an 80 and 160 meter uncompromised antenna system. Below 10 megahertz, RF hostile environment. My next door neighbors had inverters, solar panels, plasma TVs, power line devices. Within, within the near field of one wavelength, I had phew, countless ADSL devices and wall warts and you name it. S9 plus 20 at times. Loops tend to be less sensitive to electrical noise in the, in the near field. They have very sharp nulls, which allows you to turn and counteract the most offensive sources. And they're small enough to rotate with a TV rotator. The biggest issue that I was facing was um, my XYL didn't fancy a very large antenna system in the garden. Just getting away with some loots was, uh, was quite a win. And my next door neighbors and the neighborhood attention after having had some wire antennas up did draw the attention of uh, the local council. So I did need something that was inconspicuous and would draw less neighborhood attention. I also was looking for something that could be close to the ground without having to go into planning permissions and having to speak to the bank manager. The other thing I was looking to do is operate in a multi-TX environment and having high Q would be good. So the million dollar question is, and the snake oil element that was alluded to is, are they garden warmers? Well, the first image that you see up here, excuse the spurs, those are actually cable ties, is a magnetic loop that's been operating for several hours, FD8, and the thermal scan shows a temperature range of between zero and 12 degrees on a day that is uh, seven or eight degrees outside. A dummy load operating for about 15 minutes, similar load reaching 26 degrees. Now this is by no means conclusive evidence, but if you've been operating for several hours, putting in 400 watts into a loop and it was all resistive loss, you'd have a garden warmer. So therefore, in my opinion, transmitting magnetic loop antennas are not garden warmers. And furthermore, if we look into some of the results achieved, we can then see that with uh, having achieved DXCC on six bands, 209 uh, countries worked according to Logbook of the World, uh, 213 on QRZ, um, you know, 1138 band slots, 800 plus counties in the US work, 39 of 40 Q or CQ zones worked, 
I'm fairly confident to say that loops do work. In terms of the map of the world where I've operated and uh, sorry, of where I've reached and QSL, uh, my only blind spot has really been Africa, mainly because of, I guess, stations operating then and perhaps the orientation and my pursuit of them and the, the time window that I've been operating. So when it comes to antennas, you really get to pick two of the following. You can have small size, efficiency, or bandwidth. Since transmitting magnetic loop antennas are small, they tend to be efficient. Therefore, the bandwidth, the, the Q, will be high. And when designed appropriately, this is the key point, when designed appropriately, they are very efficient and effective for their size. So if we look at some of the basic loop characteristics, what you've got is an oversized inductor and a variable capacitor giving us a resonant circuit. We've got to overcome the resistive loss in the circuit. And then we've got our radiation resistance. Now, we then have a couple of coupling methods that we can look at, which we'll go into a bit later. We've got coupling loops, gamma matches, twisted gamma matches, ferrite cores, transformative couplings, and so on. And they each have their relative benefits. What we're going to do is we're also going to look at what are the components you require and how you size and scale them. Now, a variable capacitor is used to tune the loop for resonance, as you would have any capacitor in a resonance circuit. The thing I do want to point out to you is that the circulating voltage, sorry, the voltage across the cap capacitor and the circulating current, they're extremely high. You know, even at QRP levels, you can get a thousand volts across the capacitor. And if you're operating at hundred watts, you can get 10 kV across your vacuum capacitor or variable capacitor. So we need to keep that in mind. And this is where the design of the loop comes in to play and the components that we're using. The other thing I just want to point out is that you really do want to have some sort of remote tune capability for a loop, because if you're trying to tune for SWR and you're adjusting the capacitor manually and you key down, it's going to hurt. I don't recommend that. So op safe operating procedures do not touch the loop when you are tuning it, especially if you're operating 10, 20, 100, 400, for those of you in America, kilowatt plus. So as you've mentioned, it would be remiss of me not to put a disclaimer in here and a warning. <clears throat> RF burns are serious. They can be deadly. You know, it's the volts that jolts, but it's the mills that kills. So be careful, be vigilant. So why vacuum variable capacitors? Well, as I've alluded to, massive voltages across the capacitor. And if you're looking at a high voltage air butterfly capacitor, they typically are 3.7 to 5 kV uh, rated. Well, if you look at the Jennings vacuum variable capacitors, the ones that I've been working with are typically max 15 kV, where the Soviet era new old stock vacuum variable capacitors, such as the KP14, they have a 10 kV nominal rating, but you can push it to 20 kV in bursts and 50 amp uh, nominal rating. We'll get into um, some recommendations. So in terms of recommendations for vacuum variable capacitors, because they really are the heart of your magnetic loop, your transmitting magnetic loop antenna, I do recommend the KP14 vacuum variable capacitors made in the late 80s. They're typically sold as new old stock on the ubiquitous online flea bay auction sites and the like. 7.5 to 350 puff is the magic capacitance for those of you starting out on this adventure. For those of you who are building specific antenna systems and you're going to have multiple loops, then I would perhaps look to the 5 to 100 puff KP14 capacitors, which are a little bit more manageable. Whoops, a little bit more manageable in size and a, and a little bit cheaper on uh, the online uh, auction sites. In terms of relative sizings, I've put a one liter Pepsi bottle 
alongside the KP-13 on the left-hand side, which is roughly the size of a rugby ball. The KP-14, which I had up first, the one that I do recommend for most of you getting started, which is a little bit smaller than a one liter bottle. It's easy enough to manage. It's easy enough to mechanically couple to a loop. And then those of you who want to build portable loops or portable QRO loops or uh, just ease of mounting the uh, KP1425 KV. So moving on to sizing a loop, I'm going to get into some of the formulas and construction later. My recommendations broadly as a sort of a rule of thumb, ideally size between one eighth and one quarter of a wavelength. Bearing in mind, the closer you get to a quarter of a wavelength, you're going to start exhibiting electrical properties in the loop of an electrical antenna. Now for optimal bandwidth, this is, this is the magic band. A lot of people operate or build loops around a tenth of the size of a wavelength. The problem we'll see a little bit later is the voltages and the currents will be quite high when operating QRO. So the magic numbers are a quarter to a, an eighth of a wavelength. This is, allows you to have a lower capacitance required for the variable capacitor and a lower operating current. The other important considerations, and this is really important, is how are you going to have structural integrity for the loop given weather if it's sitting outside and is it going to be self-supporting and so on. So I found 28 millimeter copper to be pretty robust, self-supporting. It's of the appropriate size and dimension to give us the performance that you've seen before. The, and the other factor is you want a price performance ratio that you want to balance. The other option is Heliax or equivalent, which is seven eighths of an inch near, near enough to 28 millimeter, uh, where you can snugly fit toroids, toroids if you're doing a toroidal coupling, which we'll get into shortly, easily over 28 mil copper or over the Heliax. And the reason I will recommend shortly the toroidal couplings is that if you're experimenting, changing the number of windings that you have on your coupling is much easier than having to cut solder when you're doing a, uh, a coupling loop. So moving on. When building the actual loop itself, you ideally want to go for a circular loop. If you can't get a circular loop, if you're using uh, copper piping and you don't have access to a ring roller, I would then suggest making an octagonal loop or a square loop. They will work just as well. But for maximum efficiency, a circular loop. You want to maximize the area inside the loop. The loops generally are vertically oriented when you're operating within a wavelength of the ground. If you're going to be operating above a wavelength of the ground, then you can have them horizontally uh, oriented. But all the loops for the consideration today will be vertically or with vertically mounted in mind. The most important thing that I can absolutely recommend is you need to solder braze weld your joints. Mechanically connected joints, you know, they are going to introduce resistive losses. The other important consideration is definitely buy the highest nominal voltage and current rating for the variable capacitor that your budget can afford. Because when the bug bites you, you're going to want to uh, push it. Now, in terms of loop coupling options, I've already alluded to and touched on the transformative coupling. This is extremely effective. I've got them in a number of my loops and loops that are built for folks because they're easy to get going. They're easy to just match. And if you are thinking of starting on this journey, definitely start here. The next option is a coupling loop. Sizing the coupling loop is a consideration and the distance of the coupling loop from the main loop is the next consideration. And we'll get into some of those considerations in a later slide. The other two cup, uh, coupling methods that are quite popular are the asymmetric gamma match and the twisted gamma match. These are very effective as well. A little bit more fiddly for those of you who are getting started. So I would definitely start my way on the left hand side and move all the way to the right. Now in terms of the uh, toroids, the FT240 is easily available. Um, 
highly recommend it. The Type 43 mix is very good for 163, 160 meters through 20 meters. And for those of you operating on 30 through 10 meters or a loop for 30 through 10, use Type 61 mixes. The difference being here is the number of windings you're going to require on that transformative coupling. In terms of a coupling loop, there's two, there is a little bit of a debate, if you will, on how the size you should use on the internet, as well as amongst amateurs. From my personal operating experiences and building experiences, when building a loop for 12 through 20 meters, I typically use one fifth of the main loop circumference as the size of the coupling loop. When operating 30, 40 meters, it's a quarter. On 60, 80, a third of the main loop circumference. Now, there are a number of factors that come into play. Are you doing a multi-turn loop? Or is it a single turn loop? But broadly speaking, um, when starting out here, the, this is a good starting point. Always size your coupling loop a little bit larger and cut it back. The next thing in terms of uh, matching the coupling loop to the main loop is you vary the distance of the coupling loop from the main loop by up to about 10 centimeters. Let's call it four inches. Please do make sure your coupling loop is insulated from the main loop. <clears throat> so in terms of mounting the capacitor to your loop, in the background, this is an octagonal loop built out of 28 millimeter copper. What I've done is taken the copper and I've hammered it flat. And by hammering that, that, that copper flat, I've then drilled it, put the uh, bracelet onto the flattened copper and mounted the capacitor. To the side, you will see, if I can get the cursor over here, you should see a cursor moving around. Uh, this is a kitchen cutting board that I've cut just to insulate the stepper motor from the vacuum variable capacitor. Now, it is extremely important to insulate your stepper motor from the capacitor. And the reason for that is that the uh, vacuum variable capacitor, the tip of the vacuum variable capacitor, the shaft, that is RF hot. If you touch that when transmitting, expect a burn, especially if you are, depending on the voltage levels, more than a burn. <clears throat> do not touch that. In fact, do not touch the loop when it's been keying down. So therefore, make sure when you've got a stepper motor, your coupling to the stepper motor has a, some sort of perspex or some non-insulating shaft to the uh, coupling, right? Get that in there. Make sure it is isolated. Very, very important. Otherwise, you're going to find the magic smoke coming out of your equipment inside your shack. So moving on. <clears throat> the other options for coupling I found, if you can't get hold of the uh, the bracelets that were purposefully designed for these KP13s and KP14s, because they definitely are in short supply, using heavy duty hose clamps, such as these, which you can get for a couple of pounds, again, ubiquitous websites or Google, uh, heavy duty vacuum, uh, sorry, heavy duty hose clamp. They are made from zinc or stainless steel. Not the best for uh, conductivity compared to copper. So that is why I use copper braid that I insert underneath the uh, clamp. The other option is to go with the uh, Jubilee hose clips just to go around the, let me just get this. Vacuum capacitor, clamp goes over it, insert the um, copper braid. All right. Moving on to a couple of designs. What I've done here is taken a loop, a 160 meter loop uh, for the 160 meter band, 20 meters of Heliax around a, effectively it's a 2.12 meter former 
made out of 50 millimeter uh, PVC plumbing pipe. Inside the 50 millimeter PVC plumbing pipe, you will see over here, I've inserted 32 by 32 millimeter timber in order to give it some structural integrity. That former, uh, pretty robust, you know, given that's two meters is about this, call it a little bit larger or taller than uh, most people, but easy enough to lift, manage, turn around, rotate again. <clears throat> I then have, you know, if you look at a seven meter loop over here, as an example, inside, you can see the, the 32 millimeter timber inside the PVC. Above it, the vacuum capacitor with the kitchen cutting board that is being used as a former to separate the uh, stepper motors. The thing that's not in the picture is a DVD storage box. You can go buy DVD storage boxes. They work as a very nice shroud to put over and then to create a weatherproofing for your vacuum capacitor and stepper motor. Now, here is a great tip for you. When using something like LDF 550 and you drill out the core, you can take 22 millimeter copper and insert it. When you insert the 22 millimeter copper inside the Heliax and you hammer the uh, pipe flat, you get something that looks like this. Using a pipe bender, bending a, a turn, drilling it, you've now got a nice mounting point for your vacuum capacitor onto the main inductor, the loop. Moving on in the interest, interest of time, it's really important that you use common mode choking. I don't like inline common, load, common mode chokes because everything you insert in the line is going to introduce some form of loss. So getting uh, the snap-on or clip-on uh, ch uh, chokes makes makes perfect sense. You want as much uh, impedance as you can get. I have them at the antenna end as well as I have them at the shack end. Minimum of 5,000 ohms of impedance. I would recommend the same thing for the stepper motor control cable because you are going to be picking up RF onto your stepper motor control. Now for some theory. In the interest of time, I'm going to spare you the theory other than to say the theory is there. There are some very good online uh, loop calculators. The one is an Excel based calculator by AA5TB. The other is the 66 Pacific online calculator, which I'm going to walk you through a couple of examples just to give you the uh, sizing and the number of you know, the kind of voltage and current you're going to see in the loop. So by way of an example, if you were to nav navigate to the Pacific Loop calculator, which uh, is on the, oops, where is it? I don't see it. Oh, there we go. The link is there. Um, you plug in parameters like what is the size of the conductor that you're using, the circumference of your loop, the diameter of the material you're using, the frequency you wish to operate on, and the transmitting power. It's optional, but it'll give you an idea. If you put the power in there, it'll tell you what the voltages and current will be. So as an example, if we look at a loop for 20 meters with a five meter circumference, the efficiency of that loop, apologies, it's quite small, will be 92% efficient. It'll be four dB below an isotropic antenna. It'll have a bandwidth of 48.9 kilohertz and require a tuning capacitance of 28 puff. The voltage across the capacitor will be 3,300 volts with a circulating current of 8.57 amps. This, by all means, is a well-designed loop for 20 meters. If we put 400 watts through there, the circulating voltage Sorry, the voltage across the capacitor will be 6,700 volts RMS with a circulating current of 17 amps. If we were to change this to a 4 meter circumference loop operating on 40 meters, the efficiency drops to 31%, so 5 dB 
below an isotropic antenna. You'd require 154 puff. You'd have 4.5 kilohertz of bandwidth. The voltage across the cap will be 4,700 volts. The circulating current, 33 amps. We move this up to 400 watts into the loop. Suddenly you need 9,500 volts and the circulating current will be 66 amps. This is outside of the operating parameters of these capacitors and you're likely to do damage to your amplifier. So moving to a five meter circumference loop, all we're doing is moving from four meter circumference loop to a five meter circumference. The voltage across the capacitor is 9,900, well within op nominal operating parameters. The resonating circulating current is 50 amps. Again, well within operating parameters. So the size of the loop does matter. It does matter if you want to operate a QRO. And again, you'll notice the magic number, 40 meters, 5 meters, 40 meter band, 5 meter circumference is 1 eighth. So 1 eighth is the absolute minimum you want to go to. If you go in your in your own time, go have size up a 10 meter loop, you'll you'll find that the, the values come down dramatically. So how does one test the performance of the loop immediately after you've constructed it. Well, the easiest ways that I've found to do that is just to use FD8 and digital modes, and then using PSK Reporter to give me a feedback on who's received my signal and plotted it on PSK Reporter, using Whisper, using CW Reverse Beacon Network, using Web SDRs, all ways for you to determine whether your loop is functioning to your satisfaction. Spending a moment on Whisper, <clears throat> I found Whisper to be very, very effective, especially when you know, you're going to do some semi unattended operation when you're at home and you're doing other things uh, or when you're sleeping. Um, again, let it operate low power. And here's an example of some Whisper performance um, snapshot of something I did on the 10th of January with a five meter octagonal loop on 40 meters, working everywhere from Africa, South America, America, New Zealand, Australia, China. And then on the 15th of January, using a 10 meter octagonal loop made from 28 millimeter copper, copper uh, getting uh, the Antarctic. So how do you get started on Whisper? Quite easily, you can use WSJTX or whichever your favorite software tool is for digital modes, or you can uh, get a QRP Labs kit. Soto beams have a Whisper Lite Flexi device that you can plug in. You can build your own Arduino Whisper Beacon. There's a link to one. Your tablets, there's some software you can plug into uh, Beacon for Android. There's iWhisper. There's a number of different options. Uh, it's relatively easy if you if you Google YouTube. You know, you'll get onto Whisper quite easily. Highly recommended for testing. This is obviously one way. This is you sending out a signal, your location, your power level, and getting a report back for what was the strength of your signal received. So we built the loop. Obviously, we need to tune the loop. So how does one tune a loop? Tuning a loop really comes down to, you know, using your ear, tuning for noise, using a pan adapter, and you can literally watch uh, signal strength increase or using an antenna analyzer. I use a, a UKIT's antenna an analyzer and I can actually just see the sweep exactly where resonance is coming in. Now, the thing to bear in mind is that magnetic loops with their high Q, you do need to retune them every 10 or 20 kilohertz that you're moving. So it's really not user friendly in winter or if it's sitting in the attic. So you do want to remotely tune it, one, for safe operating, two, for convenience, and three, uh, to have some sort of auto magic antenna system. So we'll get into some options for that shortly. Now, in order to control the loop, I strongly recommend the, uh, the NEMA 17 uh, stepper motors. The one on the left-hand side 
you know, it's relatively small, 65 newton, uh, 0.65 newton meters of t holding torque. Very, very, very effective at turning the most stubborn of uh, vacuum variable capacitors. And if you're looking for um, finer movements, especially when you've got a capacitor that is, you know, 300 to 350 puff, or you're building um, something that is one tenth or one twelfth of the wavelength, and you, you're not building a QRO loop, and you need some precision movements, then I suggest you use something with a planetary gearbox. You know, if I want high speed tuning, uh, I use the without a planetary gearbox, and those when I want absolute precision tuning with micro stepping, then uh, I use a planetary gearbox. Both are um, perfectly uh, suitable. Now, how do you control the stepper motor? There's two ways. The inexpensive way, which will cost you under a tenner, get yourself an Arduino, get you an, yourself an A4988 uh, stepper motor driver, and a rotary encoder, again, from your favorite sources or the online websites, auction websites. Simple little diagram that's available there in the links, and a sketch that you can download really easy rotate the encoder and the stepper motor will turn with it no more than that and you're going to need to use a uh you can then record step the positions that you were holding at on the rotary encoder you can then get more sophisticated and you can get a counter to see how many turns you've done there's a number of options out there that some people have built some uh i think of manual tune solutions this is very effective for getting going because it's inexpensive to get going however if you want to really exploit magnetic loop antennas, truly leverage the benefit of them, I would look to something like an automatic loop tuner by Lofter Jonasson. This allows you to tune a loop in real time by tracking the CIV or CAT output of your radio against tuned solutions that are stored in the controller. If you think that you've got a fixed amount of inductance, and the capacitance that can variable that can vary you now store a tuning solution for 7 megs 7.1 7 7.2 10 megs 14 megs it will then interpolate and exp extrapolate tuning solutions in between or you can store point solutions these controllers tune in a linear fashion and interpolates the capacitor position between preset positions very, very, very smart solution, supports all radio types. It even has a virtual VFO for those of you using the old FT-101s E's from the 70s. Now, the other thing you can do, which is really nice with the uh, automated tuning, is to have a tandem match, which then allows you to uh, get an SWR tune solution. And what it does is it does an SWR sweep itself. And the tuner will then tune for the dips in a match for you. Now this is interesting when, for example, in winter, your temperature can swing from, let's say, 10 degrees to zero or below, and the copper contracts or expands. So the inductance will vary, therefore the capacitance offset will vary as well. And this just allows you to calibrate your loop very, very, very effectively, as well as giving you a, a power meter in your loop controller. For those of you who find you know loops are interesting and you want to use it for receive purposes, that's one thing. But if you want to then build your own power meter, Lofter has also got a very nice power meter uh, solution on uh, the website link below. Now. As I mentioned to you, I have a, a tuning solution for 10 through 160 meters. I have three loops in the garden, which allows me to use the loop controller to switch between the three loops, depending on the band that I'm on. The software in the loop tuner, knowing which frequency I'm on, will know which band I'm on and about which band I'm on, which loop is assigned to that band. So the loop controller has two modes of operating. It has three discrete ranges or two discrete ranges or one discrete range, depending on how many loops you've configured it for. 
or the, an overlapping range option. So if you've got two loops and one is for 10 through 30 and the other one's for 20 through 40, you can use the overlapping option range and you just flip a switch and it just knows which loop you're using. I tend to prefer the, the non-overlapping uh, discrete ranges because that then allows me, me to get coverage from 10 through 160. Technically, I do 12 through 160 because 10, I have a, a vertical form. Now, this is done by switching in relays. And if I move to the next slide, forgive the metalwork because this started off as an, an old project that was then repurposed and then repurposed and then repurposed. This is the back end of my loop controller. You know, my normal loop controller looks something like that. Let me see if I can get that up there. And then the back of the loop controller. Nothing, uh, not quite as busy as the uh, the loop controller that's on the, the PowerPoint. But the, the, the loop controller that's on the PowerPoint, what it does is I have four stations connect, four radios, four transceivers connected to the loop controller. Two that use CIV, two that use um, CAT. Because this goes into a expert linear, which has two separate inputs, I designate one for CAT, one for CIV. I want to make sure that I'm intercepting the linear keying so that if I'm key down and I don't have a good match, the linear is not initialized, activated. So hence you'll see one, two, three, four up here. These are the linear key intercepts. I then use eight pin DIN connectors for um, where you see one, two, three over here. That is to control the stepper motors for three different loops. And then an eight pin DIN for controlling relays for uh, band switching between the, the different loops. All right. The other thing I just want to touch on, let's see how we do for time. In order to eliminate noise, because as I mentioned to you before, if you can't hear the remote station, you can't work the remote station. So loops allow you to eliminate a lot of the noise in the near field, but it doesn't eliminate the noise from your fellow ham operators who are putting out hash because of the or noise in Europe, or whatever the noise might be. So using a X phase a noise eliminator plugged into a loop and a wire antenna allows you to subtract the noise or whatever signals it's receiving from what you have on your loop. This has allowed me often to work stations that other folks in the UK are not hearing. So I do highly recommend, in addition to building a loop, or if not building a loop, look at a noise, an X-phase noise eliminator. There's a circuit diagram there, and there is an industrious individual who's got it on eBay. This has made a huge difference to my operating experience, especially with all the noise in my environment. This has allowed me to eliminate a significant portion of the noise. Great. So that brings us to some references that I've got available for you. And uh, will allow us to get into uh, some Q and A. Well, thank you very much, and we do have uh, several questions uh, for you, actually. Uh, John Mi Zero WGX. Oh yeah, had to be this one. Uh, how how do home brewed loops compare to things like the Chiro Matsoni Baby Loop? Yeah, in the experience of that type of equipment. How do they compare? Well, look, it's, that's a magnificently engineered piece of equipment. I'd say the first thing that how it compares, it compares favorably in terms of your pocket and your budget. Any loop that you're going to buy is, um, it's going to be more expensive than going off to your local hardware store and buying pipe and uh, putting it together. In terms of performance, no performance difference. You said, I heard you say that you'd built a few loops for uh, for people. Uh, have you any thoughts of going commercial? 
you know, I believe in open source thinking. Um, you know, if anybody, you know, would like me to make a loop for them, I'll gladly do it. You know, I'm not, it's just down to the amount of time. I think the problem is when you ask someone who's doing it as, as a favor, then the timeline is going to be potentially protracted. But commercially, um, I'm really impressed. You know, if, if the Manzoni loops are literally the Ferrari of loops. Uh, they, they are extremely well engineered. Um, maybe, maybe we'll, 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 we'll think about it. We'll think about it. If anybody has got the manufacturing facilities, happy to have a chat. Yeah, yeah. keep watching this uh, space. Uh, M1DDD, I think that's Nick, asks for comments from URI Magloop Safety. And this is vis a vis Ofcom's intention to add <clears throat> new license conditions requiring compliance with this, what is it, ICN, IRP, general public limits on exposure to RF. So, <clears throat> well, I can tell you one thing. When I key down on my loops, I don't see the birds change direction when they're flying. So, um, I need more. I need to do some more research into this. But one thing is for sure, I like to make sure that um, I have a neon or fluorescent light nearby. So, anybody in my household who knows if I'm transmitting, there is RF in the air. Also make sure that uh, whatever the um, the guidelines are from the FCC and Ofcom and the European regulators, I increase the limits. I think I think we don't know enough about the effects of uh, electromagnetic radiation on the human body. Um, I think that um, don't underestimate it. Um, I think stay tuned. My, one of my next talks will certainly be on that. Okay. And I think from what you were saying, you probably, um, well, the, the main risk at the moment is the smell of roast pork if you uh, if you touch the thing. Well, it's, uh, yeah, so it's just, just on that, that's actually a very good point. If you've got a pacemaker or some sort of medical implant and touching the loop, you're going to get a, you're going to get a jolt. You know, I, I have, I've had a whoopsie or two with my antenna analyzer thinking, ah, it's a, you know, a couple of, a couple of milliwatts going in there. And you touch it and then you don't actually feel anything but you know the next day you're feeling you know something is not quite right in my arm so uh that could just be the arthritis i don't know but definitely you you, you, you feel something so do not touch a loop that's when you're keying down it's it's not health and it's not good for you um yeah. the other thing just just really you do want to make sure you're choking anything going back into your, sh your shack because you will be injecting in the near field because it's so close to the loop current into those control cables uh, i have had rf bites from insufficient choking on the control lines especially when they aren't running at 90 degrees from the the loops yeah i can remember that smell quite well from years and years ago uh brian at g1fns says if mounted horizontally more than a quarter wave above ground is the angle of transmission broadly the same if it's vertical? Vertically oriented, it has an extremely low takeoff angle when it's circular. Uh, you do get changes in its takeoff angle depending on the shape. Horizontally, um, I've not operated horizontally in any, um, what's the word, to any great degree. I would imagine you will have a similar properties, uh, but I can't speak authoritatively to that. Okay. Mike G4CDF says, uh, any suggestions for building a receive loop only to see if a full transmitting loop is, is worth the effort? I mean, you touched on noise and he's thinking obviously of the receive noise environment, which is a big issue for, for many of us. So by all means, I think what you do, go, off, go get a variable capacitor. It doesn't matter what its voltage current rating is. Um, I can afterwards send a link to some receive loop designs but you may want to look to an active receive loop um the if you want to test it out get a piece of coax just a regular piece of rg213 uh, it's and any any butterfly capacitor try it with five watts 
you know, you, you'll be you'll be well impressed with what you you'll be lighting up Europe quite easily. But as for a receiver, oh sorry, guess go. No, no, you're going to you were moving on to say about receiving antennas because he was asking about receiving uh, antennas. about receiving, receiving antennas uh, again. Uh, you know, you the beauty of ent of these receiving antennas is because of the sharp nulls, anything that's particularly noisy in your near field, you can tune out by just twisting it. So again, get a you know a inexpensive vacuum uh, inexpensive variable capacitor get some wire multi-turn there's some very good links i can share on that um there's no specific recommendations that i can make other than it's a tuned circuit okay okay and um still more questions coming in actually uh, gareth g4xat any thoughts on figure of eight loops or multi-turn loops so I definitely prefer a single turn loop over multi turn loops, and without question. Obviously, space prohibits that on some occasions. As you've seen, I've got a three turn loop for 160 meters. I do not recommend anything above four turns. After two is about the maximum you want to go to, three is a push, four limit. The figure of eight. If you can do a figure of eight, you've got the height. So why not just make a regular loop? There's no additional benefit to a figure of eight over a regular circular loop from my operating experiences. I've I've done some A-B comparisons and I've not, again, it's down to my QTH. I need to do a few more locations, but I've not seen any benefits over a single turn loop. Over a, over a two turn loop, a figure of eight is better than a two-turn loop. Okay. I've got to stop watching you on YouTube because you're still running on YouTube. Um, another question, probably the last one uh, for today, is uh, basically John Snag, G4HUN, indoors or outdoors? If you're operating QRO, outdoors. Without question. Otherwise, you're going to be injecting RF into your household wiring and various other things and messing with your signal. That's the first thing. Second thing is, um, you know, you can operate uh, QRP indoors. Uh, you know, I've, when I've traveled, stayed in hotels and the likes, I've done that without issue. I just actually, I put it by the window. Um, but if you're going to op operate any kind of power levels, no. Okay, I think we've got the message there, Al. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for enlightening us on uh, on mag loops. Hopefully, uh, some of us watching today will have been inspired to uh, to give them a go. Thank you very much for your time and your expertise. And uh, you said um, there's a contact um, that people can get you at if they want more information. Yes, so if anybody is interested, uh, do not hesitate to reach out to me, m0rtp at pasta.com. Have a look at my QRZ page. Uh, reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm very happy to share, help, advise, you know, regularly speaking at clubs, regularly speaking one-on-one -on -one to folks. You know, I'm, I'm extremely passionate and enthusiastic on this topic. You know, magnetic loop antennas are not garden warmers. With 209 odd countries worked uh, in less than a year, uh, 800 plus counties in the US, I can assure you, extremely effective. I'm going to leave you the following thought. If you can't hear him, you can't work him. A loop is not as nearly as efficient as a, uh, a beam antenna, but you don't need the space or the height for a beam. And what you can do with a loop is you can just add more power. Hence the QR loop, QRO loop. If they can't hear you, dial it up. Can't hear you, dial it up. But don't start with your dials at 11. All right. Thank you very much. You're darling up high outside. Thanks, Rail. All the best. And Cheers. that's uh, very much the uh, the ham spirit there. Very helpful. A uh, lot of advice from uh, Rail. Now, just before we have a look at what's happening at the NLC at Bletchley, while we're setting up Jim Bacon to give us an insight into VHF propagation and the weather, we'd like to know what you think about the idea of online events like this. I know what I think. With uh, I've had three internet breakdowns during this already. Uh, while we're hoping that we will be back to normal, uh, in normal convention mode for 2021, the RSGB would like your feedback on the whole idea of online events. There may be more. Uh, and of course, we already have the Tonight at Eight event. 
And I know it's early in the proceedings, but how do you feel about the level of content that's coming on today's streams? Well, your comments will be very welcome at www.rsgb.org forward slash feedback. Uh, you'll see that address appear on the screen from time to time throughout the day. So, and basically it's reachable on the RSGB website. So we'll be back shortly with Jim Bacon. Thanks, Oscar Hotel 5, Sulu. GB3 RS. Radio Mike. Oscar Hotel 5, Sulu. Thanks, Oscar Hotel 5, Sulu. Golf Bravo 3, Romeo Sierra. Two Italy 4, Italy 5, Sulu. Two Italy 4, Italy 5, Sulu. Thanks, Oscar Hotel 5, Sulu. Golf Bravo 3, Romeo Sierra. Golf Bravo 3, Romeo Sierra. Golf Bravo 3, Romeo Sierra, 5 9. Thanks, Oscar Hotel 5, Solo. Golf Bravo 3, Romeo Sierra, 5 9. Also 5 9, name is Tony, over. Thanks, Oscar Hotel 5, Solo. Hotel Bravo Hotel. Mexico India Sierra Victor Bravo Hotel, also fast night, thank you. Thank you. 
A Golf Bravo 3, Romeo Sierra. Golf Bravo 3, Romeo Sierra, 59. Yes, also 5 and 9, name is Tony, over. Okay, 59, thank you, hold up. Okay, 10-3. Echo Charlie 7, America Tango, top portal. Echo Charlie 7, America Tango, top portal. This is the RSGB convention online for 2020. Wherever you are in the world, welcome to the live Learn More About stream, where we're about to get the lowdown on the role that weather plays in VHF propagation from one of the leading experts in the field, Jim Bacon, G3YLA. Now you can post questions to all the speakers using the YouTube chat facility. We'll do our best to fit them in and don't forget to include your name and call sign. And do keep your feedback coming in. Comments very welcome at rsgb.org forward slash feedback. So next, learn more about VHF propagation and the weather. Those of us of a certain age will remember Jim Bacon, G3YLA, as a BBC weather forecaster, often to be seen on television wielding his magnetic cloud and raindrop symbols. And some of them even used to stay in place, didn't they, Jim? Anyway, technology has moved on, so without a magnet in sight, it's over to you, Jim. Thank you very much, Jim. Well, it's really nice to be here, and um, I have to say some fantastic presentations so far this morning, and really enjoyed both of them. The only thing I'm missing so far is the breakfast from the convention, but I'm sure we can fix that at some stage. Right, well, um, this is going to be originally a talk about the preparation of the uh, GB2RS uh, propagation uh, section in the news that comes out every week and uh, I was going to describe some of the things I go through in preparing that and there's quite a lot of work goes into it I usually carry out the task on a Wednesday evening after I've been to my local Norfolk Amateur Radio Club I do it when I get home and that then is a forecast for the whole of the following week. So it's the equivalent of a 10 day forecast. So quite a lengthy spell ahead in time in terms of weather models and what they're telling us. So it takes a bit of thought. And, and actually, I think overall, it's quite a challenge, but it's been a really interesting one. And it's then led on to quite a few developments in other areas that I'm interested in, particularly propagation and how it's linked to weather. Now, there's not going to be time to de detail all of the individual components of this. So I'm going to major on uh, a few of them. Now, th th there are, of course, the standard ones, for example, tropo, which is basically driven by areas of high pressure and temperature inversions and changes in the refractive index of the air. And then we have sporadic E, which is my current um, area of interest and really a lot of work going on there, both in the professional research field 
and in the amateur world and tremendous advances being made each year in terms of our background knowledge and how we interact with it. Then we have rain scatter, which I'm not personally involved in, and it's something for the gigahertz boys and girls, but um, it is a very interesting mode and very strongly, obviously, affected by weather. And lastly, I just want to finish up with um, a, a few words about PropQuest, a website which um, I and a colleague at work developed to help put some of this material out there so amateurs can keep in touch with it more easily. Now, there's not going to be time to do all of this in detail, as I said, so I'm going to focus on two of these, uh, Sporadic E and PropQuest later on. But just along the way, we'll mention these other two items as well. So let's uh, get started with uh, Tropo. Now, we're all used to Tropo. We've had some periodically quite recently. Autumn is a typical time for it. And uh, Tropo is, is, as we know, it's, uh, it's a phrase that gets uh, a contortion um, from tropospheric propagation or anomalous propagation, anaprop. Uh, amateurs, you'll hear describe, well, a bit of a lift on today. And, and all of it can be followed by following weather charts. And that's one of these revelations in amateur radio that you, <laughs> you have a shack and you either end up talking about the weather on the air to fellow amateurs, or you end up having your, your operations, your propagation affected by weather. So it's a, it's a good fit for this subject. Um, that little scatter plot on the left there is um, a picture of what a radar, a rainfall radar would look like if you didn't filter out uh, anomalous propagation effects where the radar beam is ducted into the ground and you get echoes coming back that don't move. Well, they're not formed by rain, which is moving with the clouds. They're actually formed by the ground. So a lot of the modern systems, well, they all um, manage to eradicate that quite successfully. So when you see a television weather map or a forecast with rain radar, uh, you hopefully won't see any of those uh, spiky feathers going out of, um, of anaprop and uh, surface uh, ground effects. The thing to have in the back of your mind with this business about Tropo though, and, and it's a key thing really, is that it's all how the refractive index of the air changes. And the changes are due to the weather, but this is where weather comes into it. The refractive index of the air is a function basically of moisture, temperature, well, and pressure, but over the depth in the atmosphere that we're looking at, the pressure doesn't change much. It serves as a as a as a just a marker of where we are, how high above the ground we are. Um, the things that do change a lot are moisture and temperature. And in particular, moisture is the one that we probably should focus on more than temperature, although you wouldn't get tropo without a big temperature contrast as well. Anyway, to explain what that means, let's just have a quick look at uh, this graphic. On the right hand side, you'll see a typical schematic of a weather map with a big high. Now, this is a, a tropo operator's sort of holy grail. This is what you want. You want a nice big high. And the idea is that in an area of high pressure, air is sinking on a grand scale. It's not just in one place. When we have shower clouds, for example, and thunderstorms, rain's going up very locally, you know, the width of about a kilometre across or whatever, just an upcurrent within the cloud. Areas of high pressure, the air is sinking over thousands of square kilometres, and it's a very gradual, slow descent. And that slow descent causes a temperature inversion to form. And on the left hand image, you can see probably if I can move the, uh, here we go, I can move your uh, the cursor here, you can see instead of the temperature decreasing as you go upwards, I won't explain the background to these charts other than these are things that we use in the meteorological world and they're special graphs for plotting how temperature and moisture vary as you go up in the atmosphere. Just take it from me that the normal procedure for dry air is for the temperature to fall at this sort of rate and if it starts to level off or even increase then that's what we call a temperature inversion. You've inverted the fall of temperature into either a steadying off or an increase. And this top one here can be caused by this subsiding air in the middle of a high pressure system. Uh, weather fronts will do it as well, actually. Uh, so that's worth bearing in mind if you want that extra point during PHF NFD. Um, 
the other m common way of finding a temperature inversion is to wait till you have a clear night like we did over here in Norfolk and Eastern England last night. Uh, clear skies, all the heat radiates away into space from the ground. And the temperature trace at the bottom of this map, uh, the temperature falls at the surface but it doesn't fall quite so much just above the ground because, as you know, air is a good insulator. You have air gaps in brick walls and you have, you have um, 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 you know, boundaries where heat doesn't transmit very, very effectively through it by conduction, by touching it. So, so air is, a, relatively speaking, a good insulator. And what that means is the temperature at the surface here can drop to a lower, much, much reduced from the air temperature just a little bit above the ground. So instead of starting at the surface and having the temperature decreasing as you go up, you find it increases. So it moves to the right on the graph. And that's a temperature inversion at the surface. And it's caused entirely by the cooling of the ground overnight. And in fact, what it kind of implies, doesn't it, that as the nighttime finishes and the day comes along and the sun comes up and warms the ground again, then this blue line here at the end will gradually edge across to the right and uh, the temperature inversion will be dropped. So if that surface inversion is causing you some tropo and giving you some enhanced um, points in a VHF NFD, then don't expect it to last uh, uh, after you've had your breakfast. Work the tropo until it fades and then, and then get the frying pan on. I don't know why I'm fixating about breakfast at the moment, but anyway, there we go. Um, so this is kind of a visualization of it, isn't it? This picture on the left, fantastic picture from uh, a GW friend, Ian Collins, who, who um, took this many years ago from a hillside in, in Wales. And you can see how the mist and low cloud and fog in the valley uh, has got a very uh, solid sort of looking top to it. And uh, that's uh, a classic signature of an inversion. And the schematic on the right shows how as air near the ground, even on the top of a hill, cools, uh, cooler air is more dense and it flows down the side of the mountain and you get this puddling in the bottom of a valley where also because of moisture down there, cooler air, you'll find you tend to get fog forming and so on. But above that, you could also find there's a subsidence inversion caused by an area of high pressure. We might get a hint of that here in the cloud in the distance on the left hand picture. Um, so, so you can get multiple inversions. In fact, there are huge number of inversions, almost unlimited number on some days. When you look at the clouds and you see multiple layers of clouds, that means there are lots of inversions. The idea is that you want to trap your signal underneath an inversion to get the maximum distance. The only problem is, of course, you find a hill there and you're not going to go through that hill. But nonetheless, um, that's, the, that's the aim. So the normal VHF rules is go to the top of a high hill and work your DX from up here. Uh, actually, uh, when there's a surface cooling inversion in the valley and your tropo is down here, there's no point getting out of your shack and clambering to the top of the mountain, at least not to begin with. OK, this is a wonderful graphic, which I, I, I use periodically from Marcus Walden, G0IJZ, who looked at a, an elevated duct from which was due to a subsidence inversion because of high pressure from a GM station to an F station on the uh, northern uh, slopes of the Pyrenees. And uh, the red area on the left is where the signal is strongest. And then it gets trapped underneath this inversion. And you can see the line of the inversion. And although there are losses as you move away from the signal source, it manages to survive very well going across Wales, uh, going across the hills, the moors of southwest England, the high ground in Brittany, and all the way down across Western France till it meets the uh, foothills of the Pyrenees. So, so inversions and the ducts that they form, really, really important parts of working VHF DX, and they're all produced by high pressure. Now, computer models are very good at forecasting these. Um, there are two good sources available on the uh, on the web. Um, F5LEN, Pascal, uh, produces a very good site, as does William Hepburn. And these were two graphics I took um, back in the spring of the same time, same date. So, so just to think about this for a moment is to say, well, they've got strong similarities. You've got areas of strong ducting in the eastern Mediterranean in both versions. You've got some patchy ducting down the east coast, in some cases slightly more than in others. Um, 
and therefore um, you have you have differences uh, between the models. And, and you've got one striking difference here over the uh, Baltic in this model that isn't picked up in this one. Now, to see which is right and wrong, you need to be there on the day looking at what happened. And I can't honestly remember. But the point I want to make here with this is that these forecasts are produced from the results of the mathematical weather forecast models, which represent the atmosphere. And in three dimensions, you can have a look at how the temperature and the moisture varies. And you can do these calculations for the refractive index. And if you do those, you can see if it becomes strong enough to produce a, a, a duct to start refracting your signals and uh, cause uh, and cause a, a tropo lift to take place. Now, because they're not the same models, they will not produce quite the same results. So Pascal uses the Arpege model, which is a Meteor France model, and uh, William uses the a CMC GDPS model, all, all, all words, but uh, mumbo jumbo. But to, to a meteorologist, these models are both extremely good models, but they have slight differences in their uh, resolution, in how they're formulated in terms of dealing with moisture in the atmosphere, the spacing of the model calculation grid points and things like that. And all of this stuff means that you shouldn't expect these models to be the same answer. Uh, they're going to be similar, but the point to take from this, going back to our slide a moment ago, is that they're giving a heads up position of where things are. It is only a forecast, so when the day unfolds, you'll see that this will be slightly different on the day, but still useful as a guide. So stations in East Anglia here, near where I am in Norwich, you could work up the East Coast to Aberdeen maybe on both these models. On here you'd expect to, to have a look across the North Sea and the Channel, and it gives you an idea as to where to focus your attention. So, so treat those as really useful guides, and it's a bit like uh, knowing knowing where to go fishing in a river. Loads of rivers, loads of places where you could go fishing, but using this to choose where you actually cast in is going to give you a really good heads up. So just to end on our tropo part for the moment, um, th this is kind of a, a distillation of everything that comes out of looking at this over a lot of years. And, and the one thing is, uh, on a typical schematic of a, of, a, of a weather chart, high pressure is the thing to look for initially. So find your high pressure and you've got a reasonable chance of tropo, but very near the centre of the high, be aware that the paths that cross that centre, the inversion, as I said, when the high develops, the inversion gradually sinks lower and lower and lower. Eventually, it may either reach a hill or the ground on a flat area, and your signal, instead of being ducted for long distances, will get to the centre of the high and then it will uh, run out of uh, traction there. So, so the best the best way to drill deal with a high pressure produced lift is to go around the edge of it. So to follow the isobars just on the edge of it, as close to the high as you can, but just on the edge of it without going across. Now, um, the fact that this high has been around for some time is quite a useful thing, because usually that means the inversion is fairly strong. So. So that's given it time to build up that real good contrast and, and not just a contrast in temperature. It's that lack of vertical motion that a stable layer gives you like that, that allows moisture to increase underneath the inversion. So the old um, <laughs> red sky at night philosophy of, of Tropo was uh, tap your barometer and oh, a nice high coming. We'll have, we'll have a lift soon and then wait for the high the pressure to start to fall, the barometer to start to fall a bit, and then you get your best conditions. And that's usually in this country, in Europe, when the high drifts to the east, you start to draw in moist air underneath the inversion and you get um, a better contrast. Because it turns out that moisture to contrast, that difference between moist foggy air and the clear air above the inversion is the key. If you've got a foggy morning, it's a real good sign. So. What else can we say about um, uh, where to be or not to be? Well, actually, to be close to the low is a good not to be situation because the isobars here suggest strong winds. So that, that would break up the turbulence, would break up any inversion. And air in the region of high pressure and fronts is generally rising, not falling. Um, you, can, you can get 
um, as I say, air from the southwest increasing moisture. I'm just trying to go back to doing these in order going down. And then sometimes you'll get a high appearing after a front has gone through. So you get a high and then another low. So quite often in the weather world, you either get highs that are very much blocking features. They stay around for a long while and they're the ones that produce good conditions. Or you get them that act as, if you like, placeholders between two lows. So they will move with this pattern and move almost as quickly as the lows and, and tend to give you um, the hint of high pressure and inversion, but not very well developed and won't be as productive as this one would be. Um, lastly, that sort of bonus point, <laughs> the, the sort of little extra ingredient for the NFD weekend, is if a front goes through overnight or at any point, and the cold front is just clearing away to the southeast, you can sometimes, because of the way the upper atmosphere is organized behind a weather front, you can sometimes get a temporary uh, lift going on immediately parallel to the front just behind it. So anyway, plenty there to get your teeth into for Tropo. Right, I think we've exhausted Tropo. Now we're going to get on to something which um, does take quite a bit of um, time to sort out. And uh, horror of horrors, no, we're not going to deal with all of this. Um, th this is what I've distilled sporadic E down to in my mind. Now there's a lot of work going on in professional research areas. It's, it's a very hot topic at the moment, sporadic E. It's been a hot topic in amateur radio for decades and and there's a lot of work just moving us forward all the time the fact that this schematic has so many areas of interest on it just shows how complicated the whole deal is and what i want to do today is to show you some of the things that have developed in the last couple of years or so that i've noticed um, through looking more closely at some of the elements of it um, we're going to have a little look at the meteors uh, for a moment but mainly we're going to concentrate on um, the stuff down here the bits down here that, that have a big say in where ease occurs so sporadic E is formed by the physics of what goes on in the ionosphere in the E region and the location of sporadic E that is the interest in why it happens where it does, uh, what makes it crop up in that part of Europe more often than that part, and, and is there a reason for it? That bit is the bit that fascinates me, and it's because it probably has some fold back on, on these features here, the weather part, because all of these things are capable of generating turbulence in the atmosphere, sort of wave motions, and sometimes wave motions like on the surface of, a, of an interface between sea and air, like the ocean waves, uh, just propagate along. And they're called gravity waves because gravity is the restoring force, but you can get them in the air as well. Uh, and if there's no cloud, you can't see them, but there's wave motion in there and you'd experience it as turbulence in an aircraft. So atmospheric gravity waves are the link between the weather and the E region. And it appears that these things do have a lot of say in where sporadic E happens. So jet streams are one of the key things. Um, and on upper air charts, the same way as on a surface weather map on the television forecast, you'll see isobars. Here on upper air charts, we call them contours, and they're fixed pressure values. And what you plot is not the pressure value, but the height of that pressure level in the atmosphere. It's just the way it is. But the point is, you can treat them as weather charts in the same way you can on the surface television map. And where the flow is strongest, you'll have jet streams. And they can be quite contorted. It's a bit like a, a sine wave on an oscilloscope. And sometimes it, it ripples along nicely. And sometimes it, it sort of locks and becomes very static. Sometimes it's very low amplitude. And sometimes it's very high amplitude. And all of these things alter how it behaves and how it propagates. One of the other ingredients, and a particularly important one for us in Europe, is the interaction of jet stream flow across mountains. And we're very well blessed with lots of high ground ranges in Europe that uh, are very often affected by jet streams blowing over the top of them. When that happens, you get these most amazing um, cloud shapes sometimes. If there's moisture in the air, the air flows up over the top of the mountain. The moisture condenses, the flow goes through here, and as it descends down the other side, it uh, evaporates. The cloud is no longer visible. 
but it remains locked to so it's being eroded here and constantly replaced with new cloud here. So, so it's a fascinating thing, but it's a wave, it's a form of a wave motion above a, above a hillside. So now, uh, keep your nerve, don't worry, this is, this is, I'll take my time going through this bit because it's quite an interesting thing, because one new thing I've been looking at, jet streams, to be honest, I've felt have accounted for at least 80%, probably better than 90%, of the locational part of where ease occurs. But sometimes you get jet streams which are very weak, like on this shading here, which this is a type of chart which we use on PropQuest, which you'll be able to see later on if you've not already used it. So here we have um, very weak jet stream, very pale green color. And the stronger the jet stream, it goes into the yellows and the oranges. And then these other faded sort of colored lines are lines to show where the pattern's changing a lot. So blue represents an increasing value of the contour heights and red where it's falling a lot and decreasing. So it can either represent development of a feature, which is another reason for making lots of turbulence or movement, which is also capable of producing turbulence. Anyway, point of this is on this particular day, the wonderful map from dxmaps.com, um, showed quite a cluster of paths going across the northern North Sea. And in here, there wasn't really a lot going on apart from a couple of weak jet streams. But another way of looking at properties in the atmosphere which can make turbulence is to look at vorticity or relative vorticity, the local vorticity. It's a, it's a type of way of describing the spin in the atmosphere. And it, it's just another way of trying to find out what's really going on in a, in a moving atmosphere and what might be important for generating turbulence. So I've been looking at those during this season and this picked out a very thin but quite intense line of vorticity across the North Sea in association with this feature here. And it's just ahead of the axis of this upper ridge that's toppling down and um, been trying to get a link between relative vorticity and upper ridges and, and other regions which might produce uh, paths. So sometimes you have to look at more than one source. It's, it's work ongoing, but it's an interesting development and it's something we can factor into our one of the many reasons why we might be getting sporadic where we're getting it. Thunderstorms go without saying are very dramatic things, uh, huge intense amounts of energy, strong up currents in a big sort of thunderstorm, these thunderstorms over Turkey. I mean, some of these, the tops of them, punching through this stable layer at the top of the atmosphere, vertical motion in here, 100 miles an hour, you know, tremendously strong vertical updrafts. And that's going to cause a lot of turbulence where it interacts with the stable air. And you often see evidence of ripples radiating out where it hits the tropopause. But a true test of how things are going is to um, have a look at a day when there were multiple openings. So, so on the chart here, um, I've marked four regions where there's sporadic E being reported. So if you look at the midway point, we'll assume that we're dealing with a midway point or else somewhere where multiple paths crossed in different orientations. So we've got one in, um, nor in Germany, one over the Northern Atlantic, Norwegian Sea, one just north of the Pyrenees and another one over Crimea. Well, if you look at the satellite picture on the right hand image, there's cloud in the northern one in the Norwegian Sea, North Atlantic, north of the Faroes. Not very obvious what's going on there. Um, a little bit of cloud, barely obvious, showing up over the Pyrenees. No cloud at all showing up over this crossing point over the Crimea. And um, just the hint of some linear features in the cloud over Germany on this one. Um, which, which linear features are good things, by the way, because it, it represents like a crest in a wave. So it suggests there's something more organized. Anyway, that, that's something that might make you think, oh, well, that probably is something to do with what's going on here. But when we look at where the jet streams are in this situation, you'll see that the northern one is on the edge of a jet stream. The one in Germany, northern Germany, has got a very marked jet stream core there present. The Pyrenees has got a jet stream blowing down onto that. And we saw earlier on how, how good the link is between jet streams and mountain ranges for generating these wave motions. And even over the, over the Crimea, 
the other arm of this jet stream is uh, present too. So it's a fantastic correlation. And, and in fact, it, jet streams do account for the largest number of events when you're looking for sporadic heat. So if you were to go for anything that's currently available in the public domain to try and predict where you think sporadic heat might happen, um, this isn't about whether it's going to happen or not. It's about where it happens if it happens. Then looking at upper air jet stream maps is as good as you can do, pretty much. So um, I, I then followed on with some interesting questions from people who who um, have been following Sporadic E during the, during the season this year. And I got a question from a GM station who was very keen on 10 meter activity. And he was working on this left hand chart uh, down to the Caribbean. And uh, the question was, well, how can you get you know, how, how unlikely is it to get these things where we've seen in Europe in the past, that previous chart we looked at, we were looking at single hop. These are all single hop paths. So you've got one reflection point. But what do you have to do when you get multi hop paths? How, how likely is it that you'll get that many strong um, reflecting points all arranged in a, in a line like that? Well, well, and, and it was also present on six meters too. These dots on DX maps represent the point where it where it meets the ground. So you have uh, up to the E region, down again, interaction with the surface, up to the E region, down again, um, interaction with the surface, up to it, and, and so on. So three hops. So the question is, how can that fit in with our ideas of, of jet streams? Well, this came a bit too late uh, for me to get the actual data on the day, but looking at a reanalysis data set, um, this is a very good site. It's a NOAA site which um, reanalyzes data um, uh, clim against compares it against climatology. So for that particular date, 19th of May this year, it found these anomalies between the background wind field and what actually happened on the date, and you've got hot spots of excess over the average wind speed in this point where we would have had the first hop um, you know from the E region we've got a, a spot here for the second one and another little spot here for the third one so it is possible to get them aligned now th these multi-hop paths on sporadic E tend to be much much weaker than the single hop ones because each point uh, you've got potential for some loss um, if the ease reflection is doing its job properly, there shouldn't be much at these points, but there could be quite a bit at the uh, interaction with the surface. But let's let's say for a point here, this this great circle map does kind of look as if it's a neat fit, isn't it, for um, for for jet stream affected wind speed produced in the hotspots. Um, so how? reasonable is it to expect this so let's take this looking at averages a bit more um, uh, a bit more closely uh, and and if we then look at the average for the whole of the month of May this is the month of May on the left hand image and the colors represent the average wind speed in that month and here's the UK on the right hand side where the cursor is waving around and you can see that you've got on average quite a quite a distribution of stronger winds over the Atlantic and down as far south as the Caribbean region in the month of May. This is a very strong feature, a permanent feature in, in the transition season, the subtropical jet stream. And um, that's quite strong here. There's also the polar front jet stream showing up here off the coast of northeastern America. Anyway, point is, compare the May graphic with what happens if you look at the mean for the month of July. Two things jump off the page here. One is you've lost all of that wind strength in the southern half of a route from GM to the Caribbean or anywhere else in Europe. So the typical picture in this high summer is that you don't usually have the stronger winds to produce the second or third hop particularly. You do still have a strong jet stream, if anything, slightly stronger, the focus of attention on the northern polar front jet off the coast of the states is now much greater. So, so you would on the face of it. Now, now I've, I've not looked into the logs for this, but some of you out there who do this regularly would doubtless be able to do this and think, ah, now I'll, I'll do a check on this because my, my 
assessment from this would be paths to the Caribbean on sporadic E would tend to favour the early season and would be much less common in the high summer second half of the season just because of the changes in the mean upper air wind pattern that happens during uh, this time of the year. But yet you would still get, and it's not the same as saying you can't get transatlantic paths, but you would still get paths across to the States by, by multiple hops along this jet stream. Anyway, interesting, interesting um, thing to uh, go away and do research on. And that's the other nice thing about sporadic E work, isn't it? That, that you have the ability to do your own research. This is this ongoing improving the knowledge thing. And amateurs can play a big role in doing this. So for all of you who submit your logs to the various clusters, there are so many good clusters out there. There's no any one that's, that's different or better than the other to the point where you'd say you only go to this one. They're all good. They all add to the knowledge base. But, but it's how we can look at these things and see how realistic this becomes um, as an operating guide. Anyway, so um, remember this, we looked at uh, all these complications and had a little little diversion into the bits at the bottom here about the weather. But I just want to spend a brief moment um, talking to you about the contribution of meteors because meteors turn out to be, uh, well, they're now widely regarded as the, the source of the fuel that makes sporadic E. So when a meteor burns up in the upper atmosphere, um, the ionization produced lasts, lasts a long while compared to the normal ionization in the E region, which is a daytime driven thing. It's called a Chapman layer. So it moves, it increases with the um, elevation of the sun and uh, decreases and so on. And it, it's all being ionized and recombining and it, it, it follows the sun's path. So meteors don't, their, their ionization lasts a lot longer and um, it does become uh, quite a good marker for when to expect ease. And I was talking to um, John Wasner, G uh, or BAO, and he put me in touch with this um, wonderful paper, which has got a brilliant graph in it. And it's all about the background meteor count. And obviously that includes meteor showers as well. We tend to assume sporadically you just book time off work when there's big meteor showers and, and lock yourself in the shack for a week. But, but there's meteor showers all through the year, but there's also meteors coming in. And there's a continuous delivery of, of a meteor debris from space as Earth makes its orbit around the sun. Now, this is, this is okay, before you all jump up and down and say, look, this is ridiculous. There's only two years here, 2011 and 2012. Well, that's what was in the graph in the paper. But the point is, it's amazing what you can do with something like this, just as it stands. So the first thing I want to say is, before we cover it up with a few things and start looking at things, just look at between the difference between the blue and the red crosses. How much difference there is from one year to the next, the difference between blue and red and how much difference there is between one day and the next. So here we have a point here and the next uh, <coughs> two points are, uh, well, it's chalk and cheese. And there's even some that go below this line to well above it. Anyway, the thing is, there's huge variability in the daily meteor count. But anyway, I've said here on the right, no idea what would be a good threshold for this, but just as a thought experiment, let's see what would happen if, say, we we set a threshold of 8,000 meteors per, per day. Now, that would give you a period early in January when meteor count is pretty high, and, and that takes you up to about the 15th of January. And it would also give you a period for the main season when it peaks here in the centre from about the third week in May, 24th of May, to the 6th of September. Pretty close, but there are others where these individual dots can go above it. The, the markers can go above that line. So in a freak freak year, or maybe not, we don't know. There's only two years we're looking at here. Um, but it's quite interesting, isn't it? How, how these this line does come close to, I've tinkered around with 7,000 as well. You get slightly broader season. But you get the point. It's possible to see why it is that in our operational experience of sporadic E, it tends to favour these certain periods. And um, it works for me. <clears throat> and 
And I just want to drop in one final thing here because I'm conscious of time and there's a couple of really important things to put in. This green area here, look at these points here that go above the line. Okay, it's a long while ago, but let's just say, although the main curve has gone below, it's not unknown for random events to take it well above. Right, so the next challenge is to combine all of these different things from that big schematic, loads of those ellipses, into one factor. And my colleague um, Dan Holly and I have done, have done this now in map form. And we plot it on a map and um, these radial ring lines, 700 and 1200 kilometers, show roughly a typical distance for the middle hop reflection point. So we're looking for intensity of color here. So good, good intensity there. So you think beaming, well, there's nobody in the mid-Atlantic, but beaming east, there's a bit more color there. So that's what we've been developing on. And this ease probability index, it's trying to help us gauge some probability of location. So the weather factors come into, uh, come out as a number between one and a hundred, say, and then we adjust it up or down according to what these other factors might look like. Remember all those ellipses up at the top, what the meteor background level is, what the KP index is, things like that, which can all affect uh, the uh, likelihood of ease. But, but this is all about the whereabouts is ease that I'm looking at here. And I've also added in um, the vorticity parameter into this multi-factored <laughs> API. There's a lot of work still to be done, but this is just a way of bringing you up to date to show you where we've got to. So the developments over this coming winter will be to be able to plot your, your location with a call sign and plot a distance station that you've just worked with a call sign and locator plot the great circle path and show radial rings for the half distance, plus or minus say 50 kilometers and um, see what it looks like. So that's all coming up. Um, the other thing that I was asked about a few times were the paths across the uh, polar regions to JA. And those were happening earlier on in the peak of the season. And um, you can see on the great circle maps, you can see the paths. And it struck me that these actually in the summer, in the high summer, a lot of these paths will, um, will in fact go through areas where in the summer season, lows and their fronts and their jet stream meanderings will go across that part of northern Russia. So it's quite feasible to think maybe this is just a normal form of sporadic E. And uh, let's, let's see how this one works when you look at the different hot points. And, and this is what we'll be programming up hopefully over the winter to be able to do this click of a button. And you can see they can locate with increases in the value of this propagation index. So it's not beyond the bounds of possibility that these paths can't be put together as a traditional multi-hop ease path. So, so it's, it's an area of, 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 of activity from the G3 YLA shack at the moment, trying to get some way of visualizing this uh, smoothly and quickly on the day. Um, so here's an example of, of a test thing. You won't be able to see this on your version of this site, but here's an example of putting in two, um, two um, locator squares, plotting the path and seeing what it looks like in the midpoint. And there you can see a very nice signal on the midpoint there for that one. This was an FT8 QSO. So another thing that we've got to do is to try and imagine what sort of value of threshold we need when we've settled on a value that we think works in general, what value correlates with um, FT8 and what value you need to be enough to do CW or SSB. Maybe they're similar, maybe they're not. And uh, here's, here's, here's another one, um, goes across a zone, but it's a broad zone. And one of the interesting things is when you get l large jet stream areas, what it is that makes one more one part of the jet stream more effective at ease than another. So that's something else that will come up during the development work. And then you have a bust. It's like all these things. Once you think you're getting somewhere, you're going well, and then then a bust. And this one produced um, two paths. Well, multiple paths. I've just highlighted these two to make the graphic. One going this way, it goes in a null. And, and this one going east-west goes through a null. 
So, so this is a bit of a blow. But when it turns out, you look at things, these are all based on forecast charts. So this probability index, by the way, is all based on a model's forecast of where the fronts and the troughs and the jet stream areas are going to be. And over a period of time, there'll be small errors creep in. So it may not be exactly right. And sporadic E is quite a finite, sort of precise locational thing. So it's maybe not too surprising if it perhaps hasn't got this bit of the jet stream far enough north and these rapidly falling contour heights. Patchy, misty, low cloud, no sign of thunderstorms, or at least nothing that, that sort of waves flags there. But on the vorticity, there's a very strong maximum in this region, and it's probably that which is causing the path. But um, uh, the model the model EPI calculation, we haven't got enough of priority given to it at that point. So one of the things we'll be looking at is what to do when, when you've got a strong um, relative vorticity, vorticity reading. So it's a way of adjusting the figures. Um, and just when you thought you'd got all your rules all nicely gathered together, um, end of the season, hands up all those who don't bother looking much for sporadic E after the end of August. Well, this, <laughs> this was the 6th of October, Tuesday of this week. You know, we, we, we're not talking about just after the end, we're talking about a long while after the end. And this is the six metre plot here on the left. Paths all over the place and, and even managed to produce paths on CW. So I ended up working down into Sardinia and into uh, Naples. Very strong jet stream. You can see these um, orangey colours in the jet stream strength. So that alone would be would be a good sign. And particularly at this exit region where it intersects with the Alps. Very, very good sign. Vorticity showing up. Uh, th this I've shown, I don't think the vorticity part it, it, it per se was as perhaps interesting as the jet stream bit was. But you can see how the vorticity maximum here runs along the edge the northern boundary of the jet stream. So that's something that comes out of some of these things that maybe that's interesting, but it's definitely paths to the south here across this jet stream overall, which seems to be producing the turbulence. So let's see if we can do anything else with that. Um, oh, did that go the right way? I don't know whether that did. Um, oh yes, here we go. Um, so my paths, yes, my paths down to Sardinia and Italy have indeed crossed an area of slightly enhanced EPI index. But the thing that struck me was that it's where it crosses the Alps that's probably more important. And when you look at the cloud cover for this jet stream, can you see these striations over the, over the um, um, area of northern Italy and uh, just starting over the Alps? So there's a lot of gravity wave, mountain wave activity going on there. And we are in a meteor shower. There's, as uh, John BAO mentioned, three of them for this week in last Sunday's GB2RS. So, so really um, good when something comes together. Rain scatter, I'm, I'm going to have to skip along a bit quickly here. So uh, rain scatter, use that for many of the radars online you can use for finding where the strong reflecting areas are. And then I just want to do a quick thing about the PropQuest website. Loads of good information there doing the sporadic E season, but also for working at other times of the year. This, this panel, you click on each one and you can get six hourly intervals of where the jet streams are. You can plot the FOF2 uh, from three different stations, Fairford, Chilton and Dubs in Belgium. And you can see how that changed. The FOEs is this purple set along the bottom here. Uh, ease incidentally shows up as a sharp spike, so it's often a very transient thing. And recently we've just added the Envis plot of the more significant um, elements for local nets within a, a HF scenario or LF bands on 80 meters, where you want Skywave Envis communication. So FOEs, um, FOF2 and the FXL uh, all of these, if any of them are above the band you're on, say 80 metres, then the chances are you'll have a reasonable chance of getting an NVIS net. If they're all below, then the band will have dropped out. And then the last point here to make is that um, something else comes out of doing these things. Sometimes you, you see something that you didn't expect to see. And one is that if you look at the averaging, you can work out averages for months going back. And at the beginning and the end of the season, there tends to be well, what I can describe as a more uniform 
peak around midday for the maximum value of FOEs in the month. Compare that to the high seas in June when you have a peak in the mid morning and then another one late afternoon and early evening. So that's the traditional view we have of sporadic E. And uh, it's, it's, it's different from the start of the season to the end. So just want to say a big thank you to Dan. Uh, it's always difficult grabbing a screen grab, but Dan is the programmer who put a lot of work into doing this website for us. It's, it's a great resource for amateur radio. He's not an amateur, I'm trying to convert him, but um, he's done a huge amount of work for us. So thank you, Dan, for that. And also thank you to WeatherQuest for letting us put the site on your server and providing us with the weather data that we use to plot the charts. So then I go off and do the propagation report for the bulletin and there it is and it goes off to the RSGB and you hear all about it on the Sunday and that I think is plenty enough um, for this morning. Thank you. Absolutely brilliant Jim. You, I don't know if you've been reading the chat you probably never had the time. Some amazing reaction on the uh, uh, YouTube chat. Many comments. Uh, one or two questions. I'll, I'll get to those in a, in a second uh, but a lot of people saying Thanks for not tidying up in the background, Jim. <laughs> it's a proper shack. These things here are hiding a multitude of sins, I can tell you. Absolutely, absolutely brilliant. Well, look, um, Tim uh, Kirby, GW4VXE from Practical Wireless and Radio User, so it's very interested in the transient openings that seem to happen along, and he puts a question mark after along, weather fronts and squall lines. Any comments on that? Yeah, yeah, good, uh, a, a good pick up there, Tim, because um, uh, those weather fronts and squall lines are the very things that are good contributors to gravity wave turbulence. So they're good sources of energy for making these waves that propagate all the way up to the E region. So when you're in the E season, then just about any cold front or any squall line will produce a, a reasonable chance of getting um, sporadic E somewhere along the line. Um, you have to work so, so much harder at that when you're outside the main E season because various other things are not on your side at that point. And, and we haven't really explored all of those in today's talk. But yeah, excellent point. Looking at weather maps and, and seeing when these squall, squalls go. Well, radar would do that as well. Picking up the uh, squall line on a radar display is good too. He also wonders if climate change is going to have a, an effect on propagation. Uh, well, it will. Um, I'm sure it will. Um, for example, just just off the top of the hat, um, uh, top of the head thing, you would you would say the different number of blocking events when you get static areas of high pressure being locked off in one part of a chart or another that will affect the frequency of occurrence of tropo. Um, mobility of weather systems across the Atlantic due to different temperature contrasts between the much warmer poles and the tropical regions that may be changing or it may be changing because of increased um, meltwater, cold water uh, flowing into the northern half of the Atlantic. And that's not, that's, that's not even getting up to the ionosphere where um, as you change the climate of the lower part of the troposphere where the weather is, what happens is the top bit cools down. So the layers are sort of sinking a bit down there. So all of the, and the recombination rates of the ionization will change. A hugely complex thing, very interactive, but you're bang on the money. Um, these are things which will form, you know, a lot of discussion in the, in the years ahead. And um, Olaf, who's joining us after 12 o'clock to talk about HF contesting, he wonders how high up these winds are. Do they make it into the F, do they make it into the F layer? Um, well, there is evidence of gravity waves extending up into the uh, F region, as far as I understand it. I've tended to have a sort of a <laughs> glass ceiling at the E region. And certainly there's, there's measurements there. There's, there's been some very good um, uh, images of, of launches of rockets that have gone up through a clear sky and you can see them and, and see the trail. And when you see that, you'll see the vapor trail sort of distorted. And it's a remarkable insight as to how much wind shear there is up there. So, so there's a lot of work being done on identifying um, the propagation of these gravity waves 
going upwards, but also there are gravity waves that propagate um, from other areas of interest and the ionosphere would, would need a different set of experts to play with. I can launch them from the weather bit, but, but, but you're right, Olaf, there, there, are, there, there are lots of similar things that, that get up as far as the, um, as far as the F region. Okay, um, we've got to move on very quickly now. Uh, I, I, I suggest that you do look at the um, web chat, Jim, when you when you finish, because some glowing reports for you on there, glowing comments. It's been brilliant. Um, Ian GM4VXM says uh, he's going he's going to have to run this talk through several times to take it all in, as I think are a few of us. And I know you've um, you've written for Radcom before now, but he wonders, have you thought of writing a book? Simon Keeble says more or less the same. Um, yeah, well, <laughs> this this business about retiring and finding you way busier than you ever thought you had time to go to work in. I, I just I have got a book on the stocks, and the RSGB <laughs> will be very pleased to hear that I did actually start writing oh, out uh... chapter headings and a few bits and pieces. So it's plan A is to do the book. I've done a few little sketches of what's going to be in the different bits, so it will happen. And and sympathies with you who who feel that this is a lot to take in. I mean, there's far more been left out than has been put into this. And over a long period of years from back in the late eighties, when I started tinkering with sporadic E, it's amazing how much things have evolved in that time. And it does need some way of writing it down or going back and looking at videos again to just pause and take a bit in at a time. Uh, it's it's very complex, which is why I've had to produce the ease probability index because it just blows blows my head off to uh, try and get my head around it all at once. It's it's a very complex thing, but so satisfying. If you can if you can look at something like that, say on PropQuest and say, I know why the band sounds like this at the moment, whether it's the FOF2 trace changing or whether it's a sporadic key coming up in that particular place. You can say, yeah, that's why I decided to go fishing there. Excellent, uh, Jim. I've, I've seen so many of your presentations um, and it still hasn't gone in here. The only thing I can remember about the weather is what my uh, friends at the BBC Weather Centre often tell me is that if we say it's going to rain and it doesn't rain, it doesn't mean it didn't rain. It just never made it to the ground. That's uh, that's uh, all I, I know. Works for me every time. Yeah. <laughs> all right, Jim. Thank you very much. Thanks for sharing and passing on your expertise in this fascinating subject. And hope to see you again at uh, one of the at rallies or uh, yeah, Newark or uh, the convention next year. Keep our fingers really? crossed. Yeah, really looking Thanks forward. So yeah. At least this time there's no danger of confusing Jim with his uh, twin brother, which I've done before now. So uh, this is not the last. Oh, Jim, if you're still there, it's not the last we see of you today, because unfortunately, Peter 2M0 SQL is unable to do his talk on getting started on low orbit satellites on the introduction to stream. Get well soon, Peter, if you're if you're watching. Uh, so you'll be over there at four o'clock UK time, won't you? Uh, what, what's on the menu? Uh, well, it's a very simplified version of this. Some of the things you'll see the charts again, so that'll be the chance to do the revision exercise. But I want to try and do it in a more in a more basic level for people who've just got their licenses, just coming into the hobby, and, and we're just going to explore things about how weather in general affects a lot of what we do in the shack. And um, that, that's four o'clock on stream one. Excellent. Thank you very much, Jim. We look forward to that. Um, it also reminds me that there's been a swap around of talks here on, on, on this channel. In case you printed off a program list a few weeks ago or you're reading from Radcom, William Eustace's talk on DSP will now be at three o'clock. Uh, what's that? 1400 UTC. It means that Pade OZ1RH's lecture on Iona, Iona Scatter on 50 and 144 megs will now be at one o'clock. Okay. And uh, do remember, because we haven't got um, we haven't got a raffle this year, we couldn't organise a raffle. That um, the D Expedition Fund does rely on uh, on the raffle for, for topping up. So if if you could, it'd be very nice um, if you could make a, a contribution to that. Um, it'd be much appreciated if you think about making a donation by clicking the button on the convention webpage. Uh, the actual address is www.rsgb.org forward slash donate. There it is uh, on the screen. You'll get through it to, to the, through the convention link as well. So stay with us for having fun with HFS, HF contesting with Olaf G0CKB after this short visit to the NRC at
Bletchley. And last we heard, by the way, they were on 18 megs. Back to you, Radio Yankee 9, Charlie, GB3RS. Okay, uh, my name is Charlie, here at Eco Romeo Gold Station. Good to see you, good luck. This is Radio Yankee 9, Charlie, goodbye. Okay, sir, please. I can't see a zero. Okay, all the best to you, uh, Robert. Oh, and uh, sorry about that, I just had a phone call come in. So, uh, I thought the phone was on uh, Two stations call here, yeah. would you go ahead please, go ahead. A bit embarrassing. Two Whiskey Zero, Romeo, Quebec, Charlie, GB3, Alpha, Sign, and I need to just go and check that phone. Uh, phone. Sorry, great noise level on the band at the moment. Um, do you want to go have another try? It's just turned 90, so I need to check everything. Two Whiskey Zero, Romeo, Charlie, GB3, Alpha, Sign, and Alpha, Sign, and I'm sorry, we're still having difficulty copying your call sign. Um, try one more time. Oscar Hotel 5, something Papa, go ahead. Yeah, uh, good afternoon to you uh, over there in the UK. You are 5 and 7, 5 and 7, 5 and 7 into uh, Southern Finland and you will sign on Radio Alpha Italy and Nancy Novakur. Radio Alpha Italy and Nancy Novakur. Yes, uh, also five and seven from this direction, but I, I still haven't got your full call, Sonny. If you uh, say, uh, say it again slowly, please. Oscar Hotel 5, go ahead. Oscar Hotel 5, Romeo Papa, Radio Papa. Ah, that's a lot better. You're coming up over the noise now. That's, that's very good. Oscar Hotel 5, Radio Papa. Thank you very much for persevering there. We've uh, got you now in the, in the log. So thank you very much for the contact and I uh, wish you best 73s, over. Yeah, thank you also and thank you very much for the QSO and uh, have a nice weekend over there in the UK. Thank you. Okay, many, many thanks for calling us. We are the uh, Radio Society of Great Britain's main radio station uh, based at Bletchley Park, the home of the Codebreakers, over. Yeah, QSL, QSL. So 73s and thank you. 73s. And Mike, uh, there's a mic station there, go ahead again. It's midday here in the UK. If you've recently joined us, welcome wherever you are in the world to the Learn More About Stream, courtesy of the RSGB Convention Online. Hello, I'm Jim Lee, G4AEH, live from my shack in Nuneaton in central England, where it's raining at the moment. On the way next, having fun with HF contesting with Olaf Lundberg, G0CKV. And as I was saying a little earlier on, one thing we can't replicate online is the traditional convention raffle, which every year raises funds for the RSGB HFD Expedition Fund. That obviously is not going to happen this year, but there is still a way to help, a very worthwhile cause. It would be very much appreciated if you would think about making a donation by clicking the button on the convention web page. It's www.rsgb.org forward slash donate. Perhaps a small proportion of what you may have paid for the normal convention. If you can help, thank you very much. Now, an opportunity to add some competitive adrenaline to your radio activity and learn some new operating skills, courtesy of Olaf Lundberg, G0CKV. And don't forget to post your questions for Olaf on the YouTube chat. We'll try to get to them if there's time at the end. And don't forget your call sign. So, Olaf, hello and over to you. Yes, and you should have my recorded video there somewhere. Seek a contest. Hello out there in cyberspace. There are so many ways to enjoy our ham radio hobby. Just look at the various uh, presentations during this year's virtual RSGB conference. Now I'm going to talk about HF contesting, which is my favorite flavor if I have to choose just one. 
I uh, will talk about preparations before the contest, uh, about the contest in full swing and what we should do after the contest. And I will also talk about how I got interested in contesting. And with all that, we also have propagation and tennis and a little bit of a little bit about equipment and uh, odds and ends to talk about. However, before we get carried away, remember that your best antenna, your best rig, your best location is what you have right there and now. So when this convention is over in the afternoon, why not switch on your rig, jump straight in and hand out some points in the uh, Scandinavian SSB activity contest, which should be in full swing, provided, of course, you watch this in real time. Also, an, a quick administrative note, I may go fast now and then, but don't worry, there will be links. There will be a link to links. So links are coming. I have so many times been asked by friends about this radio contesting thing I'm doing, and I have not found it easy to explain. We uh, certainly don't do it for money, do we? To impress our girlfriends and spouses? Well, I suspect that they are generally probably not all that impressed. Is it a spectator sport? No, not really. Do we get any headlines in Financial Times? Well, I haven't seen any, so I had to make up a fake one myself. Not even in Daily Fail, as far as I'm concerned. Radio conditions forecasted in BBC? No, not normally. Any knighthood for contesters? Not that I'm aware of it, at least. Uh, so why do we do it? It must be something deeper, probably personal, different for each one of us. For me, the kick you get out of the competitive adrenaline is one factor. And the aggregation of skills you need to do well, the operating speed, accuracy, technology, propagation. The self-improvement, the learning, the doing better every time thing. Maybe it is the opportunity to test your perseverance. Experiencing cool, surprising band openings, busting pile-ups, running pile-ups at a high rate, perhaps. Well, let me tell you how I got hooked. Or my journey, as they say nowadays. I grew up in Gothenburg on the Swedish west coast. It was a very lively port, and the port was a prime area for play and adventure for schoolboys. Two steamships, Suecia and Britannia, sailed between Gothenburg and Tilbury in London. They loaded cars differently in those days. This naive attempt to do art in school features a ship with several prominent antennas. A dark, stormy Sunday evening in November 1954, I listened to the distress traffic on 2182 kilohertz as a local fishing vessel, Golf Golf 184 Excide, went under. I still remember the drama as if it was yesterday. Today. On that Monday after school, I went to the local library and borrowed books about ships and radio, and I read about Titanic, communications failure in many dimensions. I tried to build radios on my kitchen table. If it's true that you learn by mistake, I learned a lot. My wife thought it was hilarious when she found a French school book that I had enhanced with hypothetical radio designs. I couldn't afford to buy an R1155, so I bought an R208 for the money I had earned during my first summer job. That was fortuitous because while the R1155 could only listen up to 18 MHz, the R208 could tune 10 to 60 MHz. Then in early October 1957, the first Sputnik was launched. With my R208, I could listen to Sputnik on 20 and 40 MHz. That was as exciting as it comes. As boys, we then started to build rockets. One of my mates blew off his thumb, so we quickly learned that it was safe to listen to satellites rather than to try to launch them. Around 1958, Solar Cycle 19 had its peak, and what a peak that was, maybe the best ever recorded. 20 meter was open 24 hours, you could hear and work the world easily on 15 and 10 with uh, simple gear. I listened to the guys at the club station at the local technology university running stations worldwide at a quick pace in some contest. Wow, that sounded like fun. I was hooked. I wanted to do that. And a few years later, I was the chairman of the club. And uh, we did contests whenever studies permitted. And um, to be honest, also when studies did not permit. Then with a the growing family, work and travel, amateur radio was put on the back burner for many, many years. So let's talk about fairness in HF contesting. 
W R T C, the World Radio Team Championship. That's as fair as they come. There are some 60 stations that are more or less in the same location. Same power, same antenna, and overlooked in the tent by a referee. More generally, we have uh, stations that are built on a hilltop, on the beach, or in a valley. North, south, east, west. Could be in a double multiplier location. Or, we could be, or it could be a G or DL, in a three-point or a one-point location. Could be a rural quiet or city suburban. We could use towers with stacked beams or wet strings. A station that is uh, that cost a fortune to build, or it could be a station that is more average than most. So we can't really say that contesting is fair in the Formula One sense. But so what? The main thing is that it's fun when we do it. The uh, most annoying unfairness of all, as far as I'm concerned, is that some of those guys out there, they work harder at it than I do. They build better stations than I do. And on top of that, they are also better operator than I am. Not fair. Let's uh, talk about different contesting styles. You have the super stations, high power, big antennas. You have the DX locations. You have the suburban London low power wet string type location and of course you have qrp it is great fun to operate from a super station you are loud you hold your frequency you expect to be heard immediately you run 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 and many multipliers come to you it's even more fun i would say to operate as a dx station even more people chase you you are the multiplier operating from a suburban location with the wet strings can be more of a challenge it's very satisfying when you do well you take nothing for granted you can search and pounce at a higher rate than run, perhaps. It is certainly a waste of time to fight for your frequency. You begin to learn real contesting skills the hard way. And then, of course, we have QRP. That's where you save big on electricity. But you delegate the hard work to the station you call who has to dig you out from the noise. Let us get back to the sun and to propagation. For billions of years the visible and infrared radiation from the sun has remained extraordinarily constant. And they say that the sun will continue like that, not forever, but for a very, very long time. Above infrared and visible light in frequency there is also ultraviolet, extreme ultraviolet and X-ray radiation that is somewhat less constant. It is that radiation that gives us the ionosphere and our ionosphere changes with the illumination from the sun thus it changes over the 24-hour day the seasons and also with the 11-year sunspot cycles the sun also emits particles protons ions electrons in the solar wind and on top of that we have solar events like flares corona mass ejections and whatnot and down here on earth we also have the geomagnetic field. And whenever we have moving charges, we have an electric current that generates a magnetic field. And wherever we have an electric or a magnetic field, the electrons in those fields are affected. In all, a very complicated and ever-changing geophysical environment that makes shortwave propagation somewhat predictable, but also full of surprises. Since that uh, glorious sunspot maximum in 1958, we have learned so much more about the Sun-Earth interaction. Satellites outside the Earth's atmosphere are nowadays measuring solar radiation and mapping the Sun. They can detect solar eruptions, estimate solar wind, measure the radiation spectrum, the flux. And with the help of satellites, we can also map the total electron density in the ionosphere. Satellites have now mapped the sun, surf su sun surface for two full 11-year cycles. Yes. Scientists are now trying to forecast what the next cycle, 25, will look like. Their forecasts are all over the place. So I have, after much contemplation, come up with my own forecast. I bet my farm, of which I have got none, on being right on this forecast. Ionosons can tell us what the ionosphere looks like just above us, just now. We have one such ionoson located just 10 kilometers south of Oxford at the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory in Harwell. From this daytime diagram we see that there are no reflections at all below 2 MHz because of the D-layer attenuation. The vertical reflections are only supported up to just below 6 MHz. Above that we will get a skip zone. The approximate size of the skip zone can be read off the diagram at the bottom. 
700 kilometers or so on 40, 1500 on 20. The ionosphere above Chiltern can reflect waves up to 18 megahertz, but then the elevation angle has to be very low. There's also ground wave communication, perhaps helpful in uh, local contest. Top band would give us the best coverage and vertical antennas are much better than horizontal for ground wave. But it is of course the sky wave and the ionospheric propagation that we are most interested in. Frequencies above the critical frequency give us a uh, skip zone. The higher fre the frequency, the larger the skip zone. The higher the frequency, the lower the elevation angle has to be. More flux leads to more ionization, higher critical frequency, smaller skip zone and better propagation with higher elevation angles. Note that the uh, hop length increases dramatically for lower elevation angles. Many long distance paths are multi-hop of course. When ionization is low, such as during sunspot minimum and on the HF bands, bands may only be open for low elevation rays. And always when bands are open and close, it is those with good low elevation antenna patterns that can make the first contacts. Let's uh, look at European distances from the UK. Here's an example for UK and Scandinavia. For intra-UK contests, we need antennas with good high angle radiation pattern. To the points furthest away, we may need to get down to 10 to 20 degrees for a single hop connection. But generally, we can use very reasonable antennas. If you hang in there, I'll get to antennas very soon. For our local 8 meter contest, we can have some very interesting propagation in the evenings. The critical frequency can move down to 80 meters or below and suddenly the band goes long. We get a skip zone on 80 and lose the intra-UK paths. You would have situations where some, on some UK paths you can see, you can use perhaps frequencies down around 3.6 megahertz while 3.8 is dead. Let's have a look at the recent Scandinavian activity contest on CW in September using the reverse beacon network spot analysis tool. We are looking at the spots recorded by the G4 Zulu Fox Echo skimmer and we are looking at signals from MART, TOH, 2BH, Ingemar, SE, Sierra Echo, 5 Echo and Sir and Oscar Zero, Zulu Zero Bravo. Uh, we note a few things. We note how 80 meters is not opening up until the delay goes away uh, at dusk. We note that on 80 and 40 meters all three stations, Denmark, Sweden, Finland, are are approximately of the same strength and the band opens more or less at the same time but let's look at 20 meters there we see that Marty is uh, oh, much stronger 20 dB or so stronger than uh, Ingemar in Sweden we see that there are no spots at all from uh, Søren in Denmark what is happening? Well, the skip zone is somewhere there, around 1000 miles perhaps. So we can hear Marty from Helsinki very well. We can hear Ingemar from the Stockholm area, sort of. But the Dane is much too close, he is in the skip zone. There are many tools available for propagation forecasting. My, fa my favorite tool is VOACAP Online. VOACAP Online is a very rich tool. There are many ways to use it. And here we are looking at the forecast for the path between UK and 3B8, 3B9 for um, November, month of November. Each of these two clock charts show link re reliability per band and hour. See, the circle is a 24-hour clock and the concentric circles are uh, the different bands from 80 up to or down to 10. We can associate a uh, one of these VOACAP forecasts with uh, different types of antennas, different antenna patterns. Here on the left we are assuming a horizontal dipole at only 10 meters high. And on the right we are assuming a quarter wave vertical on uh, average ground. Note how the horizontal dipole, even at that low height, is better than uh, the vertical on the HF bands. But note also that on the LF bands on 40 and 80, the vertical is better than the low dipole. And this would be even more true, of course, on 160. Here is another type of OACAP uh, online diagram. This is an area coverage. We are using an 80 meter dipole at 5 meters at 6 p.m. in October. 
If we go to a 10 meter antenna, we get a better pattern. 50 meter, even better. 20 meter better, 40 meter. Really good. We can also look at that 80 meter dipole again at 10 meters. We note how the distance covered, how the signal strength further away improves as we increase the height of the 80 meter dipole up towards uh, half wavelength above ground. Difficult to get an 80 meter dipole for the average citizen up to that height, but that's what it is. If we take the 80 meter dipole down to 10 meters again, we see that it's superb for it local coverage to Northern France, Netherlands and uh, the United Kingdom. If we instead used a vertical, we would still cover those areas and we would actually, but we wouldn't be so strong, but we would cover a wider area. We would be able to start to work DX on the vertical, which we couldn't do on the low dipo. Let's look at an area diagram. Now we are uh, for, for uh, the HF bands here. We are now assuming a sunspot number of 100. And uh, here is a uh, 20 meter dipole at 10 meter above ground in the morning on uh, 20. And you see the skip zone. You see the first hop, the second hop. If we instead look on 15 with the same parameters, we see the skip zone is bigger. Skipson goes out further away from us. If we look at uh, 15 meters here with sunspot number 100, and with uh, otherwise with with the same para and with the same parameters, except that we take the sunspot number down to zero, we get this miserable diagram. So we see that we really want to have those sunspots back for the HF bands. By the way. Let's look a little bit closer on 15 meters. We now have a 15 meter dipole that is five meters up above ground. Sunspot number is zero. And we see that uh, the area coverage here is pretty poor. If we increase the height of that dipole to 10 meters, it begins to look a little bit better. And if we increase it to 15 meters, it looks even better. Elevation angle is very important when the sunspot number is low and that means that we really should try to get the HF antennas up as high as possible. Another tool we can use to look at propagation is club log. It's a superb tool. Now this is very different because we're not talking about forecasts here. We're talking about real QSOs. We're talking about a database where actual QSOs have been logged over the years. So on the path between 3B8 and 3B9 to uh, zone 14, for instance, we can see here that the best time seems to be the two hours before midnight on both 80 and 160. During sunset and sunrise, propagation changes on the ionosphere is in a state of change. It's important to follow the gray line. Your best chance to work stations to the far east might be at their sunrise. And for us in the UK, our mornings are glorious paths to the west. On the Monday evening gray line All the signals five and nine But I don't Okay, so let's now spend a few minutes on antennas. Any antenna is better than no antenna, and more antennas are always better than few antennas. Buy a hilltop property with gentle slopes down to the ocean all around. Then get a few towers and begin to stop stack antennas. You will also need some acreage that can support receive eight circle antennas for the low bands. And buy some extra land to keep your neighbors away while you're at it. Well, I'll focus not on a dream station, but on simple fundamentals and the practical reality of the suburban real garden. Let's begin by talking about the value of a dB. While signals are S9++, even a QRP signal with moderate antenna would be strong. Here's another VOACAP chart for the path uh, UK to Morocco on 80 meters. We note that it looks like a fairly easy path and we have an f a 5S unit margin between the noise level at uh, S4 and the signal level at S9. And we can also see, by the way, how the path opens up fairly fast when uh, the delay disappears at uh, dusk. A DB more or less is not very relevant. But then let's look at the UK to uh, 3B8 path on 80 meters with the same parameters. Here the signal level is just 
at the noise level in the evening. Now every dB begins to count. We want a receive antenna that keeps the noise floor down and we want a transmit antenna where we don't lose unnecessary decibels. Let's uh, look a bit closer at uh, our 80 meter dipole. Here I'm using EasyNIC driven by an add-on called AutoEasy. We have a uh, simple 80 meter dipole and we are moving it between 5 and 40 meters height in 5 meter steps. You can see the height changing in the lower right corner. At 5 meters it's a pretty miserable antenna. But we see at 15 to 25 meters it makes a pretty decent in this uh, UK near Europe uh, antenna. Not bad at all. Okay, here we look at uh, an 80 meter vertical and also on our 80, at our, our 80 meter dipole at 10 meter height. The dipole at 10 meter height is really an envious antenna. It's not very good for DX at all. The blue line here is what a uh, vertical on 80 meter could do in our in our rear garden with uh, above average ground. We see that elevation angles less than 20 degrees. The vertical is better. I would definitely put up a vertical rather than a low dipole for 80. Now, if we hypothetically go to the seawater, go to seawater, go to 3B8 to 3B9, we see that if we take that vertical and put it by the sea by seawater, it becomes phenomenal. Let's look at 20 meters. Here we have a 20 meter dipole again at 10 meters. It's the green line. That's a half wavelength on 20 meter. And we have our vertical, a 20 meter vertical, quarter wave vertical. That's a blue line. We see that that dipole at 10 meters height beats the vertical at all elevation angles except possibly by way of the ends of the dipole, but maybe there too. I don't know. On the HF bands, I would definitely use a horizontal antenna in my rear garden, never a vertical, as long as I can get it up half a wavelength or more. So my suburban antenna farm is pretty straightforward. On HF, I will use horizontal antenna, trap dipole, inverted Vs, fan antennas, but horizontal is, is preferred for, uh, rather than vertical. On 40, probably touch and go between a vertical or dipole. If you can get the dipole quite high, the dipole would be good, otherwise use a vertical. On 160 and 80, I would definitely use a vertical. I would top load it if I could as a T or L. And I will try to use my trees to get the height up discreetly. Finally, now is the time to prepare, which is a great way to build up your anticipation of the fun to come. Good preparations is the mother of good luck, I am told. The first thing to do is to read the rules and then read them again. While you're at it, perhaps even print a copy of it to refer to them during the contest. Check categories, assisted, unassisted, power. Make sure you understand scoring and exchange. Why not set an objective for your entry? Win the world, a personal record, just have fun. Work 100 countries, 200 QSOs, to 1000 QSOs. Try to work more than 100 an hour, whatever you fancy, really. Most radios are frankly good enough nowadays for most of us. In a rare DX location where a big pileup may hit you, and also in a multi and some SO2R situation, the receiver's dynamic range and phase noise performance will make a difference. But for most of us, any radio is, almost, is good enough nowadays. An STR on your IF output or on any receive antenna can be helpful if you want to up your game a bit. It will help you make a quick check for any 10 meter opening to make sure you are not too close to a big, ugly, clicky or splattering brute. To find a hole for your CQ, to check a pile up to position your second VFO, perhaps. I'm a miserable typist, so I need the help of a good keyboard. I like the mechanical keyboards that gamers use. They have this very satisfying clunk clunk tactile feedback and illuminated keys. Then I label the keys used for CAN messages and keyboard macros. I much prefer a wired keyboard, wired mouse, headphones, no batteries, no Bluetooth or Wi-Fi or 433 megahertz, no lost contacts in the middle of the contest. One of those impressively scary, highly organized types. Keep a logbook with notes about your antennas, cables, expected SWR and whatever. It will serve you well over time. Now, I'm, I'm one of those who love complexity, but the simpler and more focused your station is, the better you will do. The contest is about making context a speed 
the number of boxes, the number of knobs, the number of screens are not part of the score equation. To do really well, you need focus and not distractions. And we get a kick out of tweaking all those knobs, you know, to watch all that stuff on the screens. If so, that's fine too, because we do want to have fun and enjoy what we are doing, don't we? Automation, simple QSY, switching band and antennas from your edit line in the logger not only saves time, but makes the station more reliable, fail-safe. It improves your agility. It avoids mistakes when you are tired, which can be very important. I would say that your antennas are much more important than your radio. But for many of us, loca our location will not allow big towers and big antennas. Try to get your horizontal antennas as high as possible. Use your trees. As long as you can get your 20, 15, 10 meter antenna up half a wavelength or so, a dipole would beat a vertical inland. On 168, an inverted L is likely to be your best bet. And a vertical might be better or equal to a dipole on 40, unless you get the dipole high enough. If you do use a 40 meter dipole, you can also use it on 15, and then you would have, could have a, a, 20, a fan dipole for 20 and 10. You will not win the world, but you can do well and you will have good fun. So we have a few minutes to go before the contest starts. Everything works, everything is well prepared, we are relaxed, like Mark, M0DXR and me before the WRTC in Boston a few years back. Your stock of healthy food within reach. Your spare valves if you do QRO. Alexa, please wind up my towers. Hey, you stupid dumbwit. You have no towers. Not even a single tiny one. Oh, nothing in the world can beat a weekend contest and no one in the world can beat us. We're busy getting ready for the final conquest. A lot of little plans to discuss. Just an hour to go before we start the show And then it's 48 hours of hell Although it's hard to explain why we put up with this pain Well, we do it again and again We're gonna do it again So we are on. Let me share some words of wisdom at a fast pace. Put your ego aside. Remember that this is fun. Convey a friendly sense of urgency, stay away from frequency fights, work the dupes, and CW maximize your RBN visibility. On CW, run fast, but moderately so. Be sensitive to skills at the other end. Avoid waste of time on repeats. Don't let your computer pretend that you're good at QRQ. Don't acknowledge jammers or other idiots at large. ID with your call sign every QSO. Unless you are a DX and you're managing a big pile up. You don't own no frequency. You lose it when you take your afternoon nap. You also lose it when you return after a fumbling SO2R attempt. Courtesy in a contest is somewhat different from ordinary courtesy. You should be fast, be brief, no wasted words, no unnecessary repeats, no cute phonetics. And definitely, please, definitely never, please copy. A good communicator gets his message across. Slows down if necessary. Make sure your call and exchange has been copied correctly. Maybe you should lose the points if not. This shouldn't be controversial, but uh, not everyone agrees. Think accuracy. Double check cluster RBN call signs. Watch out for US zone state. Don't trust prefills. Listen. Always listen. Some phonetics can be difficult to get right. On CW, watch out for SH5, UV4 and DB6. Now where should you start when the contest starts? Maybe the highest band that is open. Low bands if they are about to close. High or low in the band? First hour, everyone is running. Maybe you should try SMP. Now if you run at a good rate, just keep running. If rate is slow, maybe you should change something. Keep an eye on your contest math. If you have just been spotted on the DX cluster, stay put where you are. Use the band map if you do SMP. It gives you a very good mental picture of the band. Always enter calls in the band map when you listen the band. Don't miss easy multipliers. Maybe you should keep a list as a reminder. If you want to win the world, you have to run. But if you only run, you will miss many multipliers who only run. If you only do SMP, however, you will miss all those who only do SMP. 
You certainly should work the low bands at your sunrise. Watch the gray line. Workstations in the east at their sunrise. Use an SDR as a pan adapter. Is there any ES openings on 10? Is 20 open yet in the morning? Any activity on under 60 in the evening? Any unexpected late night opening on HF bands? The old way on CW. In the old days, you used your elbows to grab a frequency low in the band and you sat there forever during the contest. The new way on CW. No need to suffer other people's elbows. You can be agile, QSY. RBN will find you. That's definitely more fun and also more democratic. Be aware of regional band, pl pl band plans. US Advanced and General, for instance, are not allowed to operate at the bottom of the band. On CW, tune just slightly off frequency to avoid this syndrome where everyone is just clicking and end up on exactly the same frequency making it impossible for the DX to copy any call. Make sure you can hear the DX and fall into his rhythm. Always double check that you have the DX call correct. Never call blind. Throw in your full call once and practice the timing of it. Now if you just casually enter a contest, maybe you just want to get on the last hour. You will be fresh meat. You will be in great demand and can have a real fun for an hour. Save some DX perhaps until later when their pileups have eased. Late at night, the early morning hours, last evening. Now there are written and unwritten rules. Never do skeds via phones, SMS, and don't do skeds in advance. No self-spotting. You can be disqualified in some contests for that. Work everyone, no cheerleading for friends or clubs. Sitting down in front of a radio for 48 hours is not really a very healthy practice, is it? Eat and drink wisely. Rest wisely. Stand up and move about or stretch every hour or so. Maybe go for a quick walk outside to get some fresh air. Go as long as it's fun and feels good. But at some stage, for me at least, at some stage, it feels like more, it would be more fun to take a nap. Keep some post-it notes held handy during the contest and jot down ideas for improvements for next time. Log corrections, perhaps. Things to do before next. Things to check out. And sooner or later, it's just a few minutes left. An encouraging glance at your target with a smile and then a final spurt. Ding dong, time is up. It's all over. Another satisfied glance at your target file. You're probably still somewhat high on adrenaline, so why not upload your log immediately? But before that, check your notes and do any edits in the log you fumbled on the go. Don't try to finesse your log, likely, that's likely to generate more errors than you correct. But do check that the details are right. Category, power, assisted or unassisted. Typically you can then check that your log is received and perhaps see a list of all claimed scores. You upload the log in Cabrillo format. I'm also used to see that in California, they are so into contesting that they have named streets after the log format. After that, it is time to prepare for the next contest, but I suspect you probably will crash out before you are ready for that. Because your ears were still ringing with the sound of contest. As you were falling asleep, you didn't notice the lonely voice of your spouse singing. In due course, you will see the results of the contest posted. You might receive your UBN report from the adjudicator. This is your opportunity to think about how you can improve your accuracy next time. And now it's really about time to plan for the next one. You review your notes from the contest. You compare your RBN spots with a peer in the same area doing the same category. Can you squeeze some more or better antennas on some band? Can you reduce, reduce the receive noise on the low bands? Perhaps you want to prepare for your next, for your first steps towards SO2R. Get an SO2R controller and I can guarantee you will spend many long dark winter evenings trying to get to grips with the configuration and play with all the neat buttons and knobs.
Okay, it's time to uh, wrap up. Let's finish with a quick glimpse into the future. Real-time logging and scoring, immediate preliminary results. We'll have that soon, I hope. More digital modes, better and more fun, less mechanical. The radio will be an STR black box with excellent performance and very affordable. The user interface would be could be a panel with knobs or a tablet, touch screen or both. Your preference. I hope that the software folks will develop multi-channel STRs for us, where we could get software beam forming both for receive and transmit. The LDMOS amplifiers will be standard, linearized, driven to full power with a 5 or 10 watt SDR. The antennas will remain a challenge, I hope, with more science and less marketing hype and magic. No science fiction in this at all. It's just a matter of applying what we already have, what is already there. The operator skills will still make the difference in the future. We are privileged with a very special and exciting hobby. The technology we play with continues to change, and we must welcome that change and innovation. When we learn about ionospheric propagation, we learn about a small aspect of the broader scientific issue about Sun-Earth interaction in climate and the future of Earth, be it the next hundred years or the next billion years. Now, without change, our hobby dies with us. Aversion to change has killed corporations. And on a grand scale, read history and we will learn how aversion to change and a desire to put the clock back has killed civilizations. So let's hope we can put this extraordinary COVID situation behind us and get together in person at next year's RSGB convention. Or at our annual December post Worldwide Dinner in Southeast England, perhaps also at the Friedrichshafen Ham Radio Gathering and at the contest suite at Crown Plaza during the Dayton Convention. Not much bees hanging out with the other contest nerds. A rowdy crowd if there ever was one. that Ward Silver and Zero AX and his Purious Emission Span are at least as good contesters as they are singers. From perhaps seven years old to 77, I for one have enjoyed the same fascination, the same enthusiasm for the HF radio. And from Titanic and then that fishing vessel that was lost, we have improved maritime safety. But even today, with all navigation and communication technology at their disposal, the mariner's safety in the end depend on the human factor and human skills. And the same goes for our hobby in a similar way. From Sprock transmitters a long time ago to STRs and the digital modes today, the human factor, the human skills still make the difference. And now a final test. What do you see here? The comet Neowise or the rotating tower at EI7M? So, 73, have fun, go contesting, hand out some points in the Scandinavian SSB contest that will be in full swing when this virtual convention finishes. Up, 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 hey, hey, stop, don't run away, I forgot to tell you. We beat them. W3LPL, K3LR, we beat them. Look at that. But it looks like we ended up lost in Africa. Congratulations, Olaf! And uh, wow, well, there's a lot in that in that uh, in that video. And uh, we've got one or two uh, points to, uh, to to put to you. Um, Gary Champion, uh, no call sign with this one, says uh, he wants to thank you actually uh, because he says VoaCap uh, was something new to him. Uh, so thank you for letting him know about it. That's the VoA in that is Voice of America, isn't it? It was something to do with the broadcast station. Yes, it was a uh, forecasting scheme developed. You know, in the old days, it was really the broadcasters that financed, well, the broadcasters and military that financed much of the studies of uh, shortwave propagation. So 
Voar, they I come from Voice of America, yes, they use that to uh, to plan their shortwave broadcast around the world. Okay, and still a few comments coming in. Rod, VA3ON, uh, says, fantastic, uh, wonderful talk. Dave, G4OTV, excellent. Is there anywhere that the music Olaf used can be downloaded? <laughs> I, yes, there is actually. I think they are selling a CD. I think it's available on the web, Amazon, and so forth. I will have, uh, by the way, I have a set, I, I did prepare a set of links. I know I went fast. So I have links to some of that I talked about. And if you go to golfstreetcharliekillavictory.com slash RSGB2000, I think there are links also to the music. Okay. Now, we have a question from Rob, who's doing the technicals for me down in Cambridge, actually. And he said, uh, in the um, vertical versus dipole comparison that you showed us, was the average ground a vertical with radials on the ground or elevated? And does it make a difference if you go to elevated radials in that situation? Well, I don't, I, I wouldn't try to put in elevated radials in uh, my uh, suburban garden, actually. It makes it very messy. I would put uh, radius on the ground. Look, it, 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 verticals is tricky because there are several grounds around the vertical. You have the, you have the ground under the uh, vertical. And uh, if you don't put in a radius, depending on the quality of that ground, you get some losses there. But those losses are in the order of a few decibels. The real big issue for the performance of vertical is actually the ground further out where the uh, long distance radiation where the elevation pattern is built up. So the, the, the quality of the ground, you know, many, many wavelengths out from the vertical matter. And you can't do anything about, the, about that. You cannot put radials that far out. So the radials are just to improve the efficiency. So you don't use, uh, you don't heat the ground under the aerial. Okay, interesting. Uh... Uh, John Harrison said he'd love to see your suburban antenna farm in his 43-foot garden, but uh, we have to do what we uh, what we can do, don't we, uh, Olaf? That's the thing with... Uh, uh, you're, you're, you're worse off than me. I have a few more feet, but not many. Okay, now, um, what... Oh, another question from Rob. Uh, how much benefit do you get from listening in diversity from different polarisation antennas on, on receive? It's uh, not possible to stay. I mean, th th those things you can only try out. You know, when you listen, in particular on the low bands, it it it's always useful to be able to listen on different antennas because you are interested in a signal to noise ratio. It's not necessarily so that you transmit antenna on the low bands is better. Uh, another way, if you have a receiver like a K3 where you can listen to uh, diversity, that may also help, but not always. But the point, the point I make is that this is where experimenting, trying, trying different things may work out. On one signal, by the way, one antenna may be better. On another, another antenna. Okay, I think uh, Bill, uh, GM4UBJ, is extolling the virtues of QRP, actually. Uh, maybe that's something you haven't tried, uh, Olaf. <laughs> no, I, I, think, I, I think QRP is fun. You, you get more satisfaction. Out of doing, I mean, if you run one of these big contest stations, which I have done, it's good fun. But the satisfaction, you know, of being able to do things with simple wires, low power, and QRP, yeah, I can get, I get that. Okay. Now, <clears throat> you're probably expecting this, uh, this sort of question. What's your message to those who, every weekend, they're on the Facebook group saying, "Can we can't find a frequency because there's yet another." contest. What do you say to people when that gets thrown at you? Well, there's the, the, the a surprising amount of contests right now. I mean, there are probably more, I mean, on average, there are more contests than there are days in the year. And I can see that, uh, you know, well, okay, how should I put it? If you take the big contest, it's a couple of weekends per year. Fine. You have to live with it. Thousands and 10,000 people perhaps get on the air. And that's fantastic. Our bands should be used. Most of the time, during the days, during the weeks, the bands are pretty quiet. People go to work, retire people do other things. We are chatting on uh, WhatsApp or whatever instead of getting on the air. So uh, I think you have to live with the fact that few contests perhaps 
may sound overwhelming, but I think in the majority of cases, fairly, there, there, there are frequencies available. You have the walk bands. There may be a CW contest, and you can go on SSB. Live with it. Do you have anything to say to them that might convert them to the, to the contest fold? Well, you know, we all have sort of different mindset, different interests, you know, some of us want to uh, chat uh, generally and don't like all the noise and mess and the speed and haste of a contest. That's fine. I mean, uh, that's the beauty of this hobby, isn't it? You know, all these different things we can do. Hmm. Do, have you got a suggestion for a, for a contest that might be good for someone wanting to dip their toe into contesting? Well, start with the RSGB or the local contest. They are in the evening, an hour, hour and a half, and they are friendly. It's fast over. But otherwise, or, or now, well, or if you want to do a regional contest like the REF contest, the WAG, the Scandinavian Activity Contest, they are, they, they are sort of moderate pace and uh, they're also friendly and fun. Now, you mentioned in, in your talk one of the tools that uh, we could use for checking on activity is, is um, or are band maps. Could you explain what you mean by a band map and where you might find one? Well, well a band map is, let's say, uh, well, most contest loggers, they have a band map. And that's like the scale on your uh, receiver. It's sort of a frequency, is hmm, a ruler with the frequencies and against those frequencies, you, you sort of put in the, the, the call that is occupying a particular frequency. You get that if you are, are assisted in the contest, you get those calls from the cluster from RBN. But if you are non unassisted, you do it yourself. You scan the band, you, you tune uh, across the band, and as you fill in the call in the logger, you either work the guy, and then he ends up as worked in the band map, or you, you just uh, have worked him before, and you still enter in, in, in the band map, so you know who it is, and you can then roll over the band much quicker. Yeah, I use one on HRD. Uh, uh, Rod, VA3ON's been back on. He says, how much station automation do you uh, implement, such as switching and filters and things like that? You know, I even, I, I've done some traveling alone around the world and done contesting, and I uh, want to have it automated. I want to be able to switch very fast. So when I type in, if I go from one, let's say I'm 40 and I want to go to 14025, I type in 14025 on the logging uh, in, in my logger and uh, the antenna switch automatically, the amplifier switches automatically if I have one. And I don't have to worry about twisting knobs and doing the wrong thing. You know, if you are in a contest and you do it seriously, you do get tired in the end and you can make mistakes. You save time, but the best thing, the most important thing is, I think, the reliability, the simplicity. Yeah. Um, I, I saw a slide you put up of M6T. Are, are you associated with a, with a superstation like M6T? No, I know the guys. I admire them. That's uh, hard work, must be hard work, putting up all those uh, powers uh, for a contest. Do you think you have They're to be a superstation? Sorry, do you think you have to be a superstation to, to actually do well or, or win? No, not at all. Not at all. I, I've been doing okay from my rear garden, maybe by wet strings. I think it's, it's a matter of how you enjoy. I mean, okay, there are some guys that are super competitive and they must win. And they use their elbows and they behave badly, you name it. I think it should also be have to win. But the satisfaction when you sort of do better every time, when you learn new things, is uh, rewarding. Uh, on the odd occasion I go in a contest, the thing that lets me down is typing into the uh, into the um, into the into the logger. Um, I, I, well, you, you were saying that you use a it looked like a very flashy keyboard there with lots of macros, uh, lots of macros on it. Is that, is that pretty important for you to use something like that? Well, again, uh, well, first of all, you know, I'm, I'm a poor typist. So I like a good keyboard, and, and these are the gamers. You know, the gamers that use these kind of keyboards. They have the old cherry keys that we used back uh, 40, 50 years ago. Now, um, the macros are important because you don't want to sit, you know, if you do telegraphy, you don't want to sit with a paddle or 
sen all the repetitive stuff over and over again. So it does press the key and the computer does it for you. And if you do SSP, you can record CQs, uh, your messages and so forth in a voice key. So <clears throat> my voice wouldn't last very long in the contest, but I can use the voice key and it helps for me. And, and all that is on macros. And I, yeah, I can remember. I can remember why I was going to ask that question, actually, because you were talking about at the end of the contest, go through your log and check for any any mistakes. Do do you as an experienced contester still make uh, still make mistakes that have to be corrected? Oh, everyone does. Um, okay. you, 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 that, that some mistakes can almost not be avoided, but you also learn where they are. So you get a little bit more careful. Those who do a lot of contesting, you know, they begin to recognize the call signs. If you hear M6, you probably think, oh, it must be M6T or, uh, or yeah. 7M. Oh, that is the i 7 m So you know what you should log. Uh, you, after a contest, I have to admit that after a contest, I probably had enough of it. So the idea of sitting there and fiddling with a log and uh, listening to recording and checking, you know, no, that's not wrong. I want to send in the log and get on with life. Absolutely. Now, um, just before we go, just a couple of comments to you from Masahiro Kitagawa, who is JH3PRR, and I think he is actually in Japan because he's, he's also got other call signs. He says, Olaf, great presentation. I enjoyed it. See you in the contests. And uh, Anthony Turnbull, G4CUS, says, thank you, Olaf, for an interesting presentation from an occasional non-serious contester. So they are something for everybody in your talk, uh, Olaf. Thank you very much. Thanks for... Uh, for joining well, thank us. You. you were five and nine zero zero one in India, Oscar nine two golf mic, if that helps. Thank you. Cheers, Olaf. Thanks again. We we'll hope to see Cheers. you at the uh, convention next year, fingers crossed. Well, look, don't forget to keep your feedback coming. You don't have to do it during the um, during the presentations. Uh, we've got a five minute break coming up uh, in a second. Uh, uh, to, while we line up the uh, next uh, speaker. Um, but do keep your feedback coming on what you feel about the level of content in this unusual form of RSGB convention, let's face it. And while we are hoping that we'll be back in normal convention mode for 2021, the RSGB would like your feedback on, on that. And the, and the whole idea of online events, uh, there may have to be more. Uh, of course, we already have the Tonight at Eight events, of course, hosted by David G7 URP. So your comments will be very welcome at www.rsgb.org forward slash feedback. Uh, you'll see that address appear on screen from time to time through the day. Uh, basically, it's on the RSGB uh, website. There it is on screen, uh, where you can also make a donation to the RSGB HFD Expedition Fund. Uh, oh, uh, the GB3 RS activity is, uh, I can see on my screen, somebody on 3722. Obviously, I've got the speaker up, so I'm not, not sure if it is uh, it is them, but uh, they might be a bit close to me on 80 metres. They're on 3.722 at the moment. Um, if you want to go and have a listen for them. They're also on uh, 2 metre SSB, 144.270 and 14.168, at least they were a, a few minutes ago. So uh, don't blame me if they've, they've moved on. Uh, so we're gonna see how actually, how the QSOs are stacking up at the NRC and then in a change to earlier listing, listings, we'll be hearing about IONO scatter on 50 and 144 megahertz with PALE OZ1RH. Stay with us. Yes, fine, Peter. Nice copy for you. Five and nine. Nice strong We're saying three stations. We got from this radio center. Especially today for the RSGB conference. Radio center gives us some conference. So it is. My video is this year around because of the coronavirus, and um, you've got a very strong signal into us today, so the and the name is the uh, everything is, uh, is Tony, Tango, Oscar, a lot, and then uh, a lot weaker the now than it was earlier on. Uh, Thank you.
that is all from my side in this moment. And, and how do you copy? Go Bravo Free, Robio Sierra, SP9 LAW. Yes, a very strong signal from EP590 uh, plus, uh, you know, coming through very strong. Yeah, we're running a flex uh, 6500 at this end um, uh, into a step IR antenna and running about 400 watts in your direction, Peter. So um, we've got many other um, activities on different frequencies this morning but as a demonstration for this weekend. And um, uh, we, uh, we, we'll probably carry on for, uh, for, the, for the afternoon uh, today. So back to you, uh, Sugar Papa 9, uh, Lima Alpha Whiskey, GB3RS. GB3 uh, RS SP9 LAW, uh, thank you uh, for uh, all information. I enjoy your conference and uh, hope to meet you again in the future. Uh, Golf Bravo 3, Romeo Sierra, SP9 LAW, 73. Okay, 73 is Peter. GB3 RS, QZ. CQDX, CQDX, uh, Golf Bravo 3, Romeo Sierra, Golf Bravo, Bravo 3, Romeo Sierra, calling CQ, 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 Golf Bravo 3, Romeo Sierra, listening. Okay, CQ. all the best to you. See CQ, you. CQ, Catch CQ, up with you soon. GVWC, GB3, uh, CQ, 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 Golf Bravo 3, Romeo Sierra, calling CQ and listening. Just give me a break on the name, please. You and listening. Hello, this is the RSGB convention online, live. If you've missed any of today's speakers from this channel or the introduction to stream, they will be available later this evening as a complete stream. Individual talks will be available later in the week. Um, while you're uh, fiddling around online, uh, by the way, you might like to find out more information about the RSGB NHS campaign, Get On The Air To Care. Uh, it's on the RSGB website and uh, with lots of local lockdowns coming in, this may be uh, quite relevant again. Uh, you can find more details on the RSGB site. It's uh, rsgb.org forward slash, uh, it's G-O-T-A figure two C. 
not very snappy for reading out live on air, but uh, rsgb.org forward slash G-O-T-A figure 2C, okay? And uh, if you just go to the RSGB site and look for uh, Get On The Air To Care, then uh, you'll find all the details. Right, lovely. Oh, over on the introduction to <clears throat> stream at the moment, by the way, really is the case of a word from our sponsor. Martin Lynch, good old uh, Lynchy, is committing commercial suicide by passing on hints on how to get a good deal on your part exchanges. So how would you like to work DX stations on VHF, UHF and SHF that are hundreds of miles or hundreds of kilometres away, regardless of band conditions? Well, that's what we're going to find out now from Palais OZ1RH. And a reminder, if you have questions, put them on the YouTube chat and we'll do our best. So Palais, welcome, over to you. Yes, thank you very much and welcome everyone. I'd like to try to talk to you about an ionoscatter on six meter and two meter, a fairly unknown uh, uh, propagation form, I guess. Um, you may, just a moment. You may be an experienced uh, DXer on VHF and you know you can work uh, stations uh, five to 800 kilometers in any contest, no matter band conditions. But uh, we can also have scatter in the ionosphere high up, which gives us a range from 1,000 to 2,000 kilometers. So I tried to explain what ionosphere is about and uh, how we can take advantage of it. First of all, presentation of myself, extra class license in 65. Young schoolboy, you see there. I put up a four element Yagi for um, HF band and worked on DXCC. Um, I then participated in a VHF contest on an island, a mountain hill. I didn't know better than putting up in a in a box for uh, yeah, 10 element Yagis. And uh, since then, I have been active uh, at OZ9 EDR uh, contest site. The questions can be raised only via the chat function, which I don't monitor, but the organizers can interrupt me if uh, there's any problem or any questions. Nowadays, I even do some ATF uh, contesting, maybe I should have heard the last uh, presentation. Um, here's my new uh, contest site, and those uh, towers there are not, uh, uh, are not restricted. This one goes to 27 meters. This is only 19 meters, and uh, that is also 19 meters. But here we don't talk about um, HF, we go into VHF business. Many of you may know about tropo scatter, which is scattering in the ionosphere, where the beams have a common volume in the troposphere, about 10 kilometers of height. Now, if we go to the ionosphere, we go up to about um, 85 kilometers in height, and that gives us longer distance. If we see this, uh, Graph taking our German book, the distance here, the, the x axis is the distance in kilometers. Uh, 1,000 kilometers would uh, be some 620 of your miles. And um, here, the, uh, of the y axis is the, um, the attenuation, which is very low at shorter distance, but grows at longer distance, of course. The interesting point is here, over 1,000 kilometers, then um, um, Trouble scatter has something around 100 dB of attenuation, whereas Iona scatter has some 10 dB less uh, attenuation. So uh, that's what we are going to exp uh, talk about. How can we uh, take advantage of these 10 dB? Iona scatter is, uh, was fairly unknown, uh, but uh, Collins tried to sell to the military uh, a complete system for this. It worked on 49 megahertz, that's pretty close to our six meter, 40 kilowatts input, 20 dB over dipole and then again. Wow, this comes a little difficult for us, right? But it provided um, a one watch channel with a reliability of 99.9%, .9%, so it will work anytime. And that's pretty nice. How uh, did Collins uh, build a big antenna like that? Well, I would like to have one, but I guess the zoning restrictions won't allow it. My credit card also has some kind of limit on it. This is a corner reflector for six meters. And remember, see the car there, how big it is, or rather small. It's actually the antenna that is big. And you can see there are some uh, dipoles there um, for six meters. Um, so this is big stuff. 
Unfortunately, when the wind blows, then those um, those reflector wires uh, blow off. And here we have a picture where only the mass and the dipoles stand. Where you can see the dipoles there. I don't know where this picture is taken, but probably somewhere in Canada, I guess. Since we, uh, the American uh, military, had a, um, this tool air base to look at the Russian rockets coming to them, they believed in the 50s, um, there were some uh, plans for having uh, ionospheric uh, scatter stations uh, in Canada and um, in Sena Stromfjord, which is nowadays called Kangalusak. Unfortunately, I have not found any of those things. People that have been to Greenland and know about this. It seems to be a big military secret, uh, well guarded. Um, maybe it was never built. Uh, there was a trouble scatter link instead. But um, if someone has uh, can Google page comment, they find uh, some uh, um, talks about this. Now we amateurs don't have 40 kilowatts and we don't have 20 dB gain. What can we do? Well, this curve uh, says the reliability uh, here on the x-axis and the power saving if we go down in reliability. So what could we be up to? Let's say we settle for 50% reliability. I have to repeat my report and QTH locator a few times. What can we gain? 23 dB, that's, that helps, right? And if we go even lower in reliability, we gain another 10 dB. And here we come into the metal scatter business, which is quite well known for us. So military used 99.9 .9 reliability, and uh, we uh, want uh, can we can do with 23 dB less. Let's say 16 dB for the power, we get around one kilowatt. That's uh, probably equivalent to 400 British watts, and we deduct 7 dB from the antenna gain. We get uh, 13 dB. That's a fairly big game square antenna, but. Uh, 11 and it's uh, on 50 megahertz, that is possible. And actually some US stations vote in QST that when they have nice power and big beam, they can do QSOs anytime in this range, uh, 1200 kilometers, which uh, shoots very well for ion scatter. Now, if we start using CW instead of SSP, we get another 10 dB. So now we come to the 400 real watts and a smaller antenna. And we can also take advantage of uh, WSJT. Actually, Joe Taylor knows what he's doing, so he made a, a WSJT mode for ionoscatter, uh, which is called iScat. So there's some possibilities there. You now know uh, it may not be easy to use ionoscatter, but uh, there are some um, challenges. But uh, after all, if we can make QSOs on a dead band, we'll win the contest and challenges of course, also interested, interesting. So let's look about it. This uh, looks very similar to the turbo scatter thing. Um, your signal goes up and is scattered here in the ionosphere and go back to the receiver. To make it more clearly, this uh, common layer of ionosphere where the scattering takes place is about uh, 85 kilometers, somewhere uh, between 65 and 85 kilometers little lower than uh, metal scatter. And the distance, uh, uh, 1,000, 2,000 kilometers, up to 1,200 miles here. That is a nice uh, distance on a dead plane. If we go to shorter distances, then the, the um, pass loss increases because the scatter angle uh, is bigger. It's similar to ES, very short ES uh, is difficult. And if we go more than 2,000 kilometers, uh, there would not be much common volume uh, anymore. So um, we don't uh, get much ion scatter those uh, long distances. This can, what I just told you, can be shown in this curve. Here's the range in kilometers and the pass loss of signal level. And we see that it has a maximum here somewhere around uh, 1,200, 1,300 kilometers. This is taken on a frequency of 36 megahertz, but at least it's close to, to six meters, somewhere between six and 10 meters. 
One thing we have to take uh, in account is cosmic uh, noise level. And it varies uh, about 60 B and 6 meter. So if you can put your beam on a quiet part of the sky, then uh, you have a greater chance of um, making a QSO. And some EME programs actually calculate sky temperature and take account for that. So if you are an EME on 6 meter, you know what you're doing. If not, you, it's, it is possible to, to read and, and do what, what they are doing. Unfortunately, I honestly scatter goes uh, great circle bearing, so you have to beam on your QSO partner. So if you beam on a nice uh, place and, uh, on your ionosphere where, uh, where the cosmic noise is low and your QSO partner beams, of course, the opposite direction, he may hit a part of the sky where there's another noise. So you can actually experience a one-way one uh, propagation or you think it's one-way propagation because um, one of you can't hear the other. Only one of you can hear the other. To minimize that noise level for cosmic noise, you need an antenna with high gain, small side loop. But that's kind of difficult, and six meter is, get, uh, gets very big, surely. But if you can optimize your YAG in the plane, uh, in, in the vertical plane, because it's in the vertical plane, it picks up uh, noise. One thing to do is to stack YAGs at half, no, 1.6 wavelengths or 1.2 wavelengths. And if you do that, uh, that would suppress cosmic noise coming from high angles. This is actually what I've been doing. This stuff is a rotating pole, um, 20 meter high with two uh, seven element yagis for six meters. Each yagi about 11 dB uh, over a dipole. And this QT8 is only 62 meters up, but it's in a peninsula and overlooking the water in almost all directions. So it's not really that bad. Just to make fun of it, we can uh, turn each antenna uh, differently. We have a rotate on the bottom and one on the top. So um, we can, if we want uh, to make QSOs in different directions, that's possible even also. And we have a stack match, so we can use both antennas, the upper lower, or we can even face them out of face if we should do that. Most uh, HF people do that, but it's actually applied for six meter also. Now, radiation angle. We, I told you that um, the scattering takes place in the height of about 85 kilometers. In daytime, the um, ionosphere is denser, the delay is denser, so the scattering may take place even a little lower place, lower height. Let's just uh, rehearse what the radiation angle is about. You have an antenna here, it radiates up and it even hits the ground and the ground reflects your waves. And some, some uh, angle, um, the reflected wave and your wave is in phase, so they amplify each other. And that particular angle where they are in phase gives you a five to six dB gain. Uh, called ground gain, um, and that is what I call the radiation angle here, the same as this one. It's actually, you can look at it as your, um, the, the Earth here, uh, it gives an image of your antenna below the Earth, and those two antennas are in phase as you stack two antennas here. So back to the original um, uh, drawing, um, you have your radiation angle here, and your QSO partner and this angle, and the beams intersect in about 85 kilometers up, and you have a common volume that scatters um, the radio waves. That's nice when it works. And uh, let's see what, what radiation angle is actually needed here to make that uh, QSO. And the red one here is for ionoscatter scatter uh, all the day and night round, about 85 kilometers. And you see some uh, 1,200 kilometers you will need a radiation angle of five, six, seven degrees. And uh, to get that on um, on 50 megahertz and six meter, you will need uh, quite a high antenna. Um, if your beam is 20 meter up over flat ground, you get four degrees of radiation angle. If you're on two meters, not so bad, but um, if, if you need a real low angle of radiation on two meter, you go have to have a mass quite high, most mostly higher whatever of us have. 
So say on six meter, your mast is not uh, high enough. The two beams will intersect in the lower um, height where there's no scattering in the ionosphere, so no QSOs. This likely is that you, no, sorry, I mean, if we have very low angular radiation, we don't mean each other, no QSO. If you have high angular radiation, which is most obvious, um, your scatter point will be above the um, above the layer that uh, scatters our signal. So um, you need the right radiation angle. Is this too difficult? Well, there's hope. Let's say one of you have low angular radiation and another have high angle, and you still uh, can intersect um, the ionosphere at the proper height, so you may be able to get QSOs. Remember that on six meter beams are not pencil sharp. We are not talking about big dishes on microwave. Uh, so uh, this uh, radiation angle distance is not that important, but still you may take it in consideration. Troposphere uh, enhanced, uh, sorry, ionos, ionos scatter enhanced in preserves polarization. So um, you use uh, horizontal polarization, the other guy will get a horizontal polarized signal. This is very convenient because most of us use beams by some of the beams on, um, on six meters. The textbook says that pass loss is smaller for horizontal polarization. I wonder why really, but I know that uh, ground gain is more effective on horizontal polarization than for vertical polarization. So um, the ground gain in each end may favor horizontal polarization. That may be the reason that the textbook says the, the cold pass loss is smaller for horizontal polarization. Signal strength is fairly uh, the same, uh, but there are some tend to be uh, variation uh, over the day where most of the best signal strengths are at noon, at past midpoint, midpoint and less um, signal strengths at night. Unfortunately, most of our six meter activity concerts are at night. So uh, that makes it a little more difficult to experience this uh, ionoscatter on six meter. But on, in daytime, when the um, um, scatter volume is lower, then you have lower range, but higher radiation angle. But if your beam isn't high enough, then uh, it's advantage for you because you will, uh, with a higher radiation angle, hit the lower height of the ionosphere. So during daytime, you may be well off anyway. Textbook also says something about fading. Um, of course, if uh, refractive conditions in the atmosphere changes, it might change uh, signal strength also. This is the normal QSO, uh, QSB, we have on two meter. Uh, signals go up and down, but you repeat the signal record the locator, and then you get the QSO anyway. Those um, irregulars in the ionosphere uh, changes, and uh, they, if they change a lot, they may be causing a faster fading. One trick uh, the military used is diversity reception. You have two antennas or four antennas spaced uh, 50 to 100 wavelengths apart and uh, pick the best signals, that would be very nice. However, 100 wavelengths on six meters, that might be kind of difficult. Um, so uh, that's not for us amateur to do. I would say just wait a few seconds, repeat the record locator and uh, you'll make the QSO anyway. If you are into Data communication, however, that's uh, another question. And that's why Joe Taylor made a, a propagation mode in WSJT, especially for ionoscatter. Now, what's the best frequency to use this uh, fancy military stuff for? Pass loss increases about 5 dB per 10 megahertz from 30 to 60 megahertz. Cosmic noise decreases with frequency. So higher frequency is better. And the optimum is around 50 megahertz, 49 megahertz we saw the military used. The military never told, told us why uh, 50 megahertz has been a military band for decades, but uh, we may guess that, uh, that there's a reason for that. It might that may well be ionoscatter. So the optimum frequency and distance, we have the distance I showed a similar curve before. 
And you see that the pass loss, which is uh, up here, uh, is lower for about uh, 12, 1300 kilometers. This is a sweet spot for ionosphere and QSO's uh, distance on, on six meters. Now, sometimes something happens uh, in the ionosphere and a sudden uh, solar radiation creates uh, in increased delayer ionization. Increased ionization will scatter better. So, um, increased delayer absorption due to solar radiation will block HF but uh, help uh, actually ionoscatter. And even cosmic noise coming from outside the ionosphere, from outside the delayer, will be accelerated. So um, a good uh, HF blackout, uh, or perhaps uh, then uh, ionoscatter will work well. I guess the military figured that out, that the Russians are that clever that they'll send their rockets when there are increased solar radiation and HF blackout. So two air base couldn't get uh, any warning back to the state. But they had then the ionosphere the propagation to so give the warning, we push the red button now. I almost got on two meter. Well, now we come to the problem. Um, I almost got a weakens with the fifth power of the frequency, about 50 megahertz. So two meter, we should get 20 dB below uh, signals at 10, at six meter. Would that be possible? I would say no. Um, we are talking about the signal levels in the, in the vicinity of EME. 20 dB or less than EME, that uh, should be impossible. Uh, if you have a big dish of 300 meters and 2 megawatt, then you can experience uh, ionic scatter even on 50, uh, on 70 centimeter, Joe Taylor has told me. But he can only just uh, see that it's there. He can't uh, make not much use of it. So um, I would say from the textbook that ionoscatter is not possible on two meter. However, some QSOs are reported between big EME stations in Europe. Uh, they are reported as ionoscatter. How could that be? Does the theory doesn't fit the practice of what's happening? Those two meter ionoscatter uh, QSOs that have been uh, presented or been uh, reported, for instance, in the Dubus magazine, they happen often around noon. It happens in the summer months, and uh, people use uh, five to eight degrees uh, boom uh, elevation for for these are talk. We're talking about EME antennas for uh, 1,200 to 1,400 kilometers QSO, and uh, those QSOs are only possible when they are good conditions. They can't do it any any time, 24 hours a day, any time in winter time also. So that uh, ion scatter does not fit me what I told you before, uh, that the traditional ion scatter is a fairly weak uh, but constant signals, so you can make your contest cues those anytime. Um, my conclusion was there must be something else going on than the traditional ion scatter, but maybe something happens in the ionosphere because uh, at our noon, ion scatter is best. Um, Something happens in the summer months, but the elevation actually fits uh, what uh, range we what elevation needed for ionic scatter around uh, 85 kilometers of height. So let's see what have, could be uh, happening uh, other than the traditional ionic scatter. We know very well that ES um, will uh, give us a nice QSOs uh, with strong signals. Perhaps uh, um, ES uh, on lower frequencies on six meter uh, will, uh, it's caused of course by on a uh, certain um, enhanced ions, um, radio, uh, what's called, more ionospheric, um, the concentration uh, in the atmosphere of uh, ionization, as I said. Um, this may not be um, strong enough to reflect or scatter, to reflect um, 
the two meter signals, but uh, if there's enhanced um, uh, turbulence in the ionosphere, maybe that could uh, help um, make more um, ionoscatter. Maybe something uh, like sudden ionospheric disturbances, which I told before, uh, uh, stronger D layer, something called polar cap absorption, where your ionosphere absorbs uh, signals going through the world zone. There's even something in the textbook said that the stratosphere is warmer than usual. Maybe those things would uh, would work well. I don't know. I don't think the heating of the, uh, the atmosphere and centigrade actually would help. I would not much more like more uh, ionization. But I found something in a textbook called PMSE. It's something. It's not something like women gets. It's a extra ordinary um, uh, ionization in the in the ionosphere. It's called polar mesospheric summer echoes. So it's a kind of uh, ES in the polar regions. It happens at 80 to 85 kilometers. It only happens in summertime. Wow, couldn't that be that uh, this actually works for uh, two meter QSOs uh, during, uh, that has been reported by the European stations. Quite uh, many of them, uh, uh, one of the QSOs part is from the northern part of Sweden, SM2, SM5. And the people in mid Europe, uh, the UMA station had contacted them. So I said, uh, well, let me look at what the PMSE actually is. And um, the book says more of radar echoes and certain days in June and July from it's sporadic and uh, may happen in May and August also. This fits very well with uh, what we know from ES uh, in the southern part of Europe. Um, textbook says it's called by uh, fluctuation in the uh, plasma density, which is the ionization concentrate in thin layers, exactly where we see that the usual um, ionoscatter is happening. Here is a curve that shows um, how often there is um, this uh, kind of uh, radar detected um, extraordinary um, ionization uh, in this uh, height of um, 85 kilometers. And we see that it happens somewhere between May and August, and it's um, not happening every day. Uh, it's not the traditional scatter I talked uh, about in the beginning, but it happens on and off just like yes. So this seems to be a kind of ES uh, concentrated in the polar regions. There's another curve here, another picture they tell us. Um, here we have um, a, a whole uh, day from uh, one o'clock in the morning until uh, uh, midnight. And we see that it's concentrated here around noon. Uh, somewhere a little later, sometimes before noon, sometimes the afternoon, but this it is around noon, and it's seldom uh, present here in in night time. Unfortunately, our activity concert takes place uh, in, in the evening, Tuesday evenings, so um, we don't get much of that uh, when uh, when we have our activity concerts. But uh, there's something going on up there uh, that in the ionosphere that uh, can be used for QSOs on two meter. So what kind of propagations can we have on uh, on the two meter? We know the tropo scatter, the textbook says 400 kilometers. That's because they want a high reliability. Uh, we amateurs know that the weak signals, which we can use, we have good antennas, we have good uh, preamplifiers. So we can gauge some uh, 800, 700, 800 kilometers here. The ionoscatter and meteoroscatter get us uh, 1,500 kilometers or even a little more, up to about those 1,200 miles. Textbook also says uh, there's a form of F layer scatter um, up here, uh, higher up, and gives even longer range. That's something uh, that I have never experienced, but um, 
it would be very nice if actually there's even a scatter thing going up higher in the ionosphere. Now we are talking about wishful thinking, but let's see what's actually could be happening. And actually two meter uh, stations, uh, you, American two meter stations uh, with EME capability says that they can work uh, QSOs anytime in daytime uh, around 2,500 uh, to 800 kilometers of range. Fits very well with what the textbook said. It's too, uh, too far to be the traditional scattering from 85 kilometers of height. So they probably have experienced that F layer scatter. I just need more bigger antenna and uh, bigger, more power and uh, some station with the same capability around uh, around uh, 2,600 kilometers away and they maybe were able to experience it. Textbook also says something about spread F that the F layer spread in F1 and F2 and we know that from HF and uh, they may be able to scatter or dock our signals and um, the commercial uh, stations, they uh, measure the atmosphere and several of them uh, publish their, their measurements on the internet. So if you don't want to cure those, you can Google the internet and find the interesting stuff of what you could have worked. If you're in the equator, which we are not, then uh, we have mostly uh, spread F at night. Um, but at high altitudes, but if of course, cause made during daytime. So um, if there are lots of um, magnetic activity, we are seeing some of raw and spread if stuff. Maybe then we have a possibility of making um, QSOs um, using this uh, special kind of uh, scattering in the F layer. I actually wonder if some of those um, the QSO is reported as um, Aurora E uh, is actually this kind of, of stuff because it's also happening when there's uh, um, when there's Aurora and when there's magnetic activity. Now we have uh, several kinds of um, of uh, scattering. Um, a tropical scatter, uh, which is what we mostly use on two meter for contesting on a dead band, it needs zero radiation angle for all distances. So put your beam as high up as you can or go to a hilltop to get low angle of radiation. And we don't get much uh, tropical scatter more than 900 kilometers, at least not with uh, amateur means. If you are EME capable and take full advantage of WSJT, you may. Um, Experience longer uh, QSOs, I'm not sure, but uh, that's something I would uh, like people to, to try and test. And tropical scatter is great circle bearing. However, meteor scatter may give longer distances, but of course you can easily hear when you are using meteor scatter because it's a few milliseconds to a few seconds, but it gives nice increase in, in the signal strength. So, um, you can use special modes in WSJT for meter scatter and it would be very easy to, to do and work some DX. <clears throat> we also know some uh, that ES is, um, is suddenly strong ions, uh, very uh, reflections uh, and it, it only takes minutes, but it gives very strong signals sometimes, <clears throat> but it isn't there any time. Iona scatter is, however, a constant weak signal and it's great circle bearing. And um, it has actually an op optimum of 1200 kilometers or more, which is actually what uh, what uh, gives us more uh, more DX, nice, nice DX. Even on six meter or two meter on a dead band, that would be a nice uh, thing, nice distance to work QSOs. But it doesn't come easy as I said before. How is the signal quality <coughs> of um, ionoscatter? scatter? We are talking about forward scatter. <coughs> so the signal quality is Q5. If we have a back scatter like a raw, uh, signal sounds distorted like a raw back scatter we know on, on raw on two meter 
if you are into CW, you can't. And if you are in sideband, you have to talk very slowly and it's difficult on two meters. On six meters, a little easier. You may know, I have noticed, however, if you are working long distance uh, troposcatter signals on two meters, it has a special uh, hollow sound. Um, I call it tropo sound. It's caused by this uh, incoherent scattering, just like a kind of backscattering. It's still forward scatter, but the scatter angle increases, so it uh, will um, give you some uh, some changes in the in the sound. I have um, experienced a few shorter um, ionoscatter signals, and, uh, and they have had a similar DX sound. So um, because the scatter angle is, is uh, somewhat higher on the shorter distances of ionoscatter. <clears throat> If you're into data communication, you should uh, read the textbook of how that should be done. Or you can do the lazy one and let your tailor do the work for you. So uh, use the iSCAD mode, which I talked about before. Uh, I'm sure he knows what he's doing. <clears throat> but actually, since MetroSCAD is easier, then uh, most people will do uh, MetroSCAD instead of trying IonoSCAD. But uh, at least now we know that IonoSCAD is there and it is possible take advantage of it. There are many, uh, um, <clears throat> many sources of how the ionosphere uh, behaves. There's something called scintillation in the, uh, in the ionosphere. This is where the uh, ionospheric density, ionization density uh, changes a lot and that will uh, make um, QSBs on, side, on satellite signals, very fast QSB, which is called skin selection. <clears throat> uh, this, <clears throat> this link may not uh, be working anymore, but you can Google uh, that, and that may be an idea of what's happening in the ionosphere. <clears throat> there are even some radars. Uh, this one is one of you in Wales. 46 megahertz is pretty close to six meter. 160 kilowatt peak, well, mm. and a big antenna. Well, <clears throat> my new QG8 is actually have room for that. So if you want to put a station like that up, certainly come with it, with, with it to me. I'm happy to make you with those with it. I don't know if this station weight is still active, but uh, you can Google stations all around the world and find what's going on. Here yeah, is um, a map of what station there has been that uh, do um, um, research in um, in uh, in how the atmosphere behaves, how the ionosphere behaves, of course. <clears throat> There's one <clears throat> uh, radar here in Sweden. And it shows us uh, in 10 kilometers of height the uh, tropo scatter stuff where that's going on. Uh, it doesn't show that much on uh, on 85 meters, uh, 85 kilometers of height, but we see something sm small here, um, which may be uh, interesting to look at. And if we enhance the picture, there's some kind of ionization here. Whether it's metro scatter, whether it's ES, I don't know, but it's in the northern part of Sweden, this is measured. So it uh, could well be some uh, kind of polar metropheric uh, PSME uh, stuff going on. We see that this is not their constant, so it's not the constant signal we are looking at. But um, there's something going on there which may be very interesting for amateurs to take advantage of. Maybe part of it is uh, meteorites, I don't know, but um, no matter what it is, any kind of ionization that may reflect uh, or scatter or radio, amateur radio signals, that would be uh, interesting. I come to my conclusion to repeat that uh, ionoscatter is scattering in the lower part of the ionosphere. 65 to 85, perhaps 90 kilometers of height. The traditional ionoscatter is there all day around, 24 hours. So the military could take good use of it. They can uh, get uh, signals uh, 
across any time, which is of course important for them. And it's also important for us during the contest where we want, uh, no matter whether the band is dead or not, then uh, we want to make a QSO. And in, in fact, the, the conclusion is the band is never dead. You have to take advantage of what's happening. And they're uh, like a uh, trouble scatter on two meter with 800 kilometers of range. You can do Iona scatter on six meter with 12, 1500 kilometers anytime. But you have to, to do it, uh, the, read the textbooks and uh, prepare your stations for it. Use the right uh, modes, probably digital, reasonable linear and the big antenna. But it's not impossible. We know <clears throat> that the frequency, uh, the signal strength um, falls very fast off with a higher uh, frequency. Uh, so uh, we should concentrate our uh, ion scatter experiments on 40 to 60 megahertz, which fits very well with our six meter band. We know that um, there are some daily variations. There's a constant background signals coming from uh, a layer around 85 kilometers, but during daytime we have an enhanced um, ionospheric scatter uh, from uh, only 65 to 70 kilometers of height. But uh, anyway, just don't matter, don't um, think too much about the scatter height, just uh, make your QSOs. I will once again say, uh, if you can hear the other guy, don't wonder what prop propagation mode you're in, just uh, make the QSOs and start wondering afterwards. With the big antenna I showed you before, I uh, actually worked some, um, some Aurora QSOs around three o'clock at night, and I thought the band would be dead, but there was still a roar going on. And making a QSOs with a golf mic station on two meter, no, on six meter, sorry, I heard some uh, station with French accent calling me, and I think I heard Victor Eich or something, and that, uh, of course, uh, made me very interested. And uh, when the QSOs for the Scottish station was finished, I heard the Victor Echo station calling me, and I gave report and locator once, and he gave me report and locator, and the QSO was there. And uh, that made the world record on Aurora uh, E, if it actually was Aurora E, but it don't matter what it is, uh, make the QSO and that's what's count. We know from our own scatter that um, less than about 900 kilometers to scatter angle would be too steep. And around uh, up to 2000 kilometers, there would be not much more common volume due to the Earth's cur curvature. So the, and the optimum distance is around 1200 kilometers. But I'm pretty sure that from the UK, there are many states in Europe uh, around 1200 kilometers or 1500 kilometers away. So it's just a matter of being in the right direction, getting in the power and make a, perhaps make a skit and then, then you're in business. And I told you a tropo scatter at zero radiation angle and the max uh, 900 kilometers Meteor scatter short life, and you can hear, obviously very easily hear that. And if you experience ES, then uh, you don't want, uh, worry too much. You just make a lot of QSOs very fast. And the uh, ion scatter is fairly weak, but it's constant any time. And you may experience uh, ion scatter on two meter. Um, we are not quite, I'm not quite sure what kind of um, extra uh, ionospheric uh, clouds, uh, extra ionospheric um, ionization it's called, but the textbook says something about this PSME, which uh, seems very reasonable. It's, uh, it's also, uh, on two meter, it's uh, the scattering in the ionosphere, but not the traditional one we experience on six meter. Once again, work first and worry later, and then now I work for you, I would worry about your questions. Well, actually, I'm not worrying, but uh, I guess uh, there may be some chatting with the organizers are well, welcome to pose questions to me.
I'm, I'm waiting for questions. Yeah. Uh, hi, Pally. Uh, cool. It's uh, it's uh, it's Dom here in the tech gallery. Uh, good to see you. Unfortunately, we seem to have lost our feed from Jim at the moment. Uh, so we were also waiting there just then for uh, Jim to give you some uh, questions. But thank you very much for a very interesting talk. I'm sure we will have uh, a, a few questions from Jim in in just a moment. Uh, just to... Uh, have we got Jim yet? No, we don't have Jim yet. Well, cool. anyway, we, we rehearsed a lot about this uh, and taking care of any kind of... Um, of technical problems we had back up and back up slides and uh, uh, back up audio so well what we seems didn't have back up that was the internal stuff there but i'm sure you know that the ionos scatter isn't that easy but uh, it's there and uh, we're capable of taking advantage of it uh, if we uh, do our work well Yes, ap apologies, um, uh, Palais. I uh, had two internet dropouts within a few minutes, uh, so my apologies for that. I have missed uh, part of what you said, and thanks to Dom for uh, for setting uh, for sitting in. Um, so one or two uh, questions coming up on the uh, chat, uh, Palais. Uh, one was from John uh, G three S G. Where is it? Oh, it's, uh, I'll come back to that in a second. I'll find it in a second. But G, yeah, John G4SWX is uh, listening and he's uh, telling me he's still on EME every day. Um, and, and from that, I mean, you you did mention uh, EME in, in your talk. How does Iola Scatter compare to EME? And would you use the same digital modes? Um, that depends a little. Um, <clears throat> On um, on six meter, which is where we would, uh, would start the uh, ionoscatter stuff, um, the traditional, um, and on six meter, if you try to do EME, I would say uh, those uh, WSKT modes may be confused by sudden um, signal, increase in signal strength, that is, uh, for meter scatter. So they may not decode if there's one small ping in the, uh, on the meter scatter. Uh, stuff. Uh, so uh, Joe Taylor made this Ionos uh, scatter, I scatter mode that is not confused by those um, meter scatter pings. Unfortunately, the I scatter mode is not as sensitive as the other modes. So if you can get rid of um, meter scatter pings, uh, then uh, then uh, you can use the JT65 or what is the best modes for for EME. But um, Joe Taylor did use the other mode or made the other mode for that. But nice to hear uh, you, John, that you are there. You know probably more about the ionoscatter practical stuff than me. And you're capable of doing that uh, on two meter even with the right two of those parts. And I believe you may have worked with SM2 with CEN, I think. Yeah, and John uh, goes on to ask, he says on uh, 144 megs, there are rapid amplitude changes of a period of uh, half a second to three seconds. And he wonders, have you ruled out scatter from the burn up of micrometeorites? Uh, there are more than larger rocks uh, as, a, as a mechanism. Uh, well, that, no, <clears throat> um, that, that is definitely a mechanism also involved there. Um, I, w I would say that um, meter scatter pings, uh, uh, fractions of seconds or milliseconds, uh, they are about the same uh, in that sense that, uh, that they are meteorites and there are many more uh, of those uh, micro meteors. Uh, they are coming there all the time, actually. So uh, John is quite right that there is, uh, so to speak, um, a bottom layer of uh, meteor scattering taking place all the time. And then, um, and then there are some enhancements uh, with pings or, or bursts that uh, we amateurs really uh, mostly use. Um, what John actually asked is ionoscatter the same as uh, that um, ionization coming from those very small micro emitters. Um, that could be right, but. Um, that with um, the uh, ion scatter enhancing during um, during sudden ionospheric disturbances, uh, stronger delay, um, 
um, that uh, shows that uh, it's uh, related. So the, the, the normal ionosphere, not only the uh, micrometers, but the micrometers plays a role. That's uh, that's definitely true. And if you're in two meter, like John is, then he of course is, um, noticed uh, those micrometers much better than the traditional ion scatter, which is 20 dB lower than signal strength that on six meter. More questions? Okay, and uh, Elaine, Elaine Richards, G4 LFM uh, says, Pada, you say the ion scatter signal is a weak constant one, and Chris, G4 IFX asks this as well, but is there any sign of flutter on the signal? Um, yes, um, there is. Um, uh, I had a slide that uh, shows um, um, that, that there is some, yeah, what, what I put it, um, there's some fluttering on it, and there's um, this DX sound, turbo sound, I call it from two meter. It, uh, that makes the signal a little more different, but that's what we wouldn't call that fluttering actually. Um, there is during uh, Aurora something called sprutter, which is very fast, um, uh, fading 50 hertz or more, uh, 70 or 100 hertz, uh, fast fading, which makes um, um, RTTY difficult and even uh, voice channel may be difficult to understand. So uh, that sprutter is actually a very fast fading. And I think that's what the uh, question was about, wasn't it? Okay, well, we'll have to leave it there, uh, Pale. Thank you very much. Lots of food for thought. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for all that uh, knowledge and continued good eye on a scattered DX to you over there in, uh, in Denmark. Yes, yeah, thank you very much. And I'll see you in the Scandinavian activity on ATF in some time in today. Bye-bye. We'll look out for you. Thanks very much, uh, Pale. Right. Um, oh, the NRC, they did take a coffee break, but I can see some activity back on 3722 um, on, my, on my scope. So it may be, it may be then. Uh, if you want to give them a try, GB3RS, and uh, they're also on two meters, 144.270, if I remember the frequency correctly. Anyway, uh, have a look for them there. We'll um, take a short break now and have a look at the NRC. But while we line up our next speaker, who is Alwyn Seeds, G8DOH, on the best VHF and UHF radios for contesting and DXing. We'll uh, look in on the uh, NRC, as I say, stacking up the QSOs. But while that's going on, you might like to visit the RSGB website where there's a feedback form for your thoughts on today's content uh, and any future online events. There's the, uh, there's the address on the screen. Uh, there's also a page for making a donation to the RSGB HFD Expedition Fund which is normally topped up by the annual convention raffle. So whatever you can afford will be most welcome. We'll see you shortly. G3LDR. G3LDR. Okay, Roger. And uh, yeah, I can appreciate the uh, need to be careful in these times. So uh, yeah, I think everyone's... Uh, the more senior people all being pretty sensible about it, aren't they? And uh, we have um, several radio clubs come down and visit the NRC. Some come down during the daytime to uh, uh, spend a bit of time in the shack and also look around Bletchley Park. But we do also, uh, by arrangement, have um, groups come down, private uh, club uh, visits come in the evening as well. But I normally restrict that to about 12 people. And uh, it's a private evening visit, means that you get more time on the radio. Uh, but uh, those times are all temporarily on hold until the situation improves. All right, it's really good. I'm uh, very pleased you've uh, settled into your new accommodation. You managed to get the video up and running, which is always nice. Um, I um, look forward to catching up with you uh, in the near future, Roger. G3LDI, GB3RS, over. Yes, okay, Martin. GB3RS, G3LDI. Um, well, it was a long while ago when I lived at Wyndham, Martin, so um, I've been here now 33 years, I think. 
so it's been a fair while at this place as well. I had to do a lot of work to the, uh, to the present place to get it uh, to my liking. And of course it's very, very convenient having um, that amount of ground to put up antennas. And I do have um, six towers here now. But to the other place I used to have one tower uh, with a 20 metre model bander and then the land above it. If you remember that, that was a long while ago now, but that was a lovely place to have because that was very high ground at Wyndham, as you probably realise. Anyway, I trust you can keep your dad in uh, good condition and uh, uh, supplied for, with uh, groceries and all, all the rest of it, Martin. Uh, it's, a, it's a sad situation isn't it, we're in at the moment. So the sooner we're over it, the better, I think. Anyway, take care. Enjoy uh, what you can down there and uh, just going to have a cup of tea and do some work here and then get back to the um, convention again, shall we say. GP3RS. G3 LDI signing, I wish you a very good day. Bye bye for now, Mark. That's fine, Roger. Thank you very much indeed, and do well. I look forward to catching up again from there again soon with you. G3 LDI, GB3 RS signing clear, and GB3 RS is now listening frequency. Any calls, over? Golf 3 for Papa Sugar. G3 ZPS, Golf 3 Zulu Papa Sugar. This is GB3 RX. Uh, good afternoon to you. Thank you for calling in. The name is Martin. Martin. And uh, you're a good, strong signal. So uh, let's find out where you're located in the name, please. G3 ZPS. GB3 RX. Over. There we go, Martin. G3 Zero for Pa Sugar Returning. Yeah, very good. Uh, I'm watching the live stream as well. I wonder if I might hear him myself. Name is Steve. Sugar Tango Echo Victor Echo. I'm in North Canada, town of Dartford. Uh, running 400 watts here to a dipole from an uh, FT-101 ZD. Not a new one, but an old one. Uh, very good, yeah. Been watching my mate Jim Lee, G4AEH. Our call signs are very close. And also Jim Bacon, G3YLA. He's the year before me. Just celebrating 50 years of G3 ZPS. And uh, not many G3s younger than me. I'm one of the youngest. I was only at school when I got the call. Anyway, it looks good stuff. I've watched some of the presentations. No, I can't hear myself. It's probably a bit of a delay, uh, Martin. Good stuff anyway. We know where you are. Uh, my friend uh, is um, one of the people who works next door to you at the Computer Museum. Uh, G3 Zulu Papa Alpha. <laughs> anyway, good signal. We'll let you work a few more people at your five and nine. But from G3 Zulu Papa Sierra, go ahead. Okay, Steve, that's fine. G3 said PS, GB3 RS returning. Yeah, well, um, I say it's lovely signal coming in, cracking 59 plus direct and copying you well on the web SDR as well. And um, we're using an MT5000 nominal 200 watts output to a multi down dipole up at about 40 feet. And if you know the centre here and you obviously know Dave, G3 said PA. Dave was uh, a, good, uh, a good friend and uh, has helped out down here at the radio centre as well from, uh, on many occasions and has donated some of the equipment, uh, especially in the foyer area, which is the World War II uh, area with the, the receivers uh, talking about the Y stations and the voluntary interceptors. So uh, that's good, uh, Steve, and uh, delighted to have you call in, and I'm um, glad you're enjoying the convention as well. We haven't actually got to see any of it here yet, but uh, I'll have to uh, try and catch up on the lectures um, retrospectively. And, uh, there's several I want to, want to hear. Okay, Steve, back to you for any final comments, and then we'll take a listen. I think there was someone else uh, hovering on frequency. G3ZPS from GB3RS, over. Yeah, okay, Martin, very good. Yeah, excellent stuff. Yeah, Dave's a good mate of mine, g 3 Alpha. I've been up there. Hello again, and welcome back to the Learn More About stream, live for the RSGB convention online. We've just been listening in there to uh, GB3RS operating on 18 metres. Here in Nuneaton, I can't see them on my screen. I couldn't hear them when I uh, listened in a few minutes ago, but I did hear Steve G3ZPS. Hello, Steve, if you're, uh, if you're back with us on the stream. Right, well, Mike Richards is about to present his pictorial introduction to data modes over on the introduction to stream. 
Here, it's time to hear from Alwyn Seeds, G8DOH, about the best kind of radios for contesting and DXing on the VHF and UHF bands. And don't forget, if you want to ask Alwyn a question, you need to use that chat facility on the actual YouTube stream. And don't forget to include your call sign. We'll do our best to fit you in before the end of the session at five to three. So, Alwyn, hello. Uh, we're not talking hello Chinese, uh, cheap Chinese handhelds here, are we? <laughs> well, it's amazing how cheap some things are that are really, really good. Um, so very good afternoon. Greetings, uh, greetings from uh, somewhat overcast uh, central London today. And I'm going to talk about uh, VHF, UHF radios with an emphasis on good performance for contesting and, and DXing. So uh, this is the outline of the talk. I'll first scope it, uh, talk a little bit about the RF environment. And this really matters because um, we need to fit the radio to the RF environment it's going to work in. Uh, then in turn, receiver performance, transmitter performance, and finally conclusion. Um, there will be some uh, what I'll describe as league tables of, uh, of uh, transceivers, uh, which uh, you'll of course, if the when the talk is available later, you can browse in more detail at your leisure. So the scope. I want to talk about the key issues for transmitter and receiver performance at VHF, UHF. They're not the same as for work at HF. And the main reason that they're not the same is because at HF, the background noise levels are a lot higher Although I should say that, of course, many of us suffer from RF uh, noise of one sort or another, even at VHF, UHF. And um, I will say a little bit about taking that into account. Um, the talk is for terrestrial operations. Um, if you're doing EME, so hopefully you're not looking at anything on this planet, uh, the key thing is to have the noise figure that you require very low. I'm also not going to say anything about operating features. The reviews cover this very well, and we all have operating features that we like or don't like. So um, uh, I won't be covering that. And finally, a disclaimer. I don't have any financial interest or involvement in any manufacturer or dealer in amateur radio equipment. This is my personal view of the situation. So first, the radio frequency environment. If we look towards the horizon, uh, these are the minimum noise levels that uh, we will be able to receive. And what you'll note from this table, if I get the magic laser pointer to illustrate the point, the noise level at six meters is a good 10 dBs more than the noise level at 70 centimeters. Therefore, having a really, really low noise figure receiver for six meters is not as important as having a no low noise figure receiver for 70 centimeters or even more so 23 centimeters and above. If you make the noise figure very, very low on six meters, the main thing you will do is make it easier for the uh, receiver to be overloaded by strong signals. So we need to take into account these actual levels of noise. The qualification, of course, is that in urban areas, the noise floors are much higher. These are the minimums. And I can tell you in my bit of central London, uh, the noise level on two meters uh, is over 30 dB above this uh, level. So you can't really operate in any serious way on two meters. Uh, at, uh, uh, at two meters. The next thing is receiving other stations, and in particular, those stations that are quite close to you. So the strongest signals that we can receive are those which are simply line of sight, so free space path loss. And the free space path loss depends a little bit on frequency and as we'll see depends on antennas too but basically as we go up in frequency uh, the free space path loss 
gets larger. And in on practical paths, because there's some ground scattering, the loss typically is about 10 to 30 dBs larger than this minimum. Now, the reason that uh, this is important is to see how strong a signal will we get from another local station so that we can dimension what kind of receiver performance in terms of dynamic range we need. So the other factors in the equation for received power are how much power the other station's transmitting with, how much gain the transmitting antenna has, the path loss, of course, as we've discussed, and how much gain we have for our receive antenna. So what tends to happen is that at the higher frequency bands, for a given physical size, we can get more gain in the antennas, and that makes up for the increase in path loss. So taking those into account, you can estimate what will happen if there's a legal limit station 10 kilometers away, how much power will be received? I've allowed for not huge antennas, but the sort of thing that contest stations use. And this is quite interesting because what it shows is that the most difficult bands to struggle with are two meters and 70 centimeters. Um, Signal slightly less strong because the antenna gain is somewhat smaller at the lower frequencies and because of path loss relative to the antenna sizes that are practical, um, slightly weaker at 23 cents. So these tend to be the bands where we see the worst uh, challenges. And there's some data uh, taken from the two meter trophy, I think it was in 2015. and. Uh, Here's the spectrum we were receiving at uh, G3M. And here is the strongest uh, signal that we were receiving during that uh, contest. Um, a signal strength of minus 44 uh, decibels relative to a milliwatt uh, in 444 hertz bandwidth. So that fits the calculation pretty well because the calculated value for that station would be minus 35 dBm. It's about 9 dB less strong, and therefore that's the ground scatter effect between the stations. You could be very unlucky and, and be propagating across water that was very smooth and actually manage to enhance your free space signal, uh, but it doesn't happen that often. Uh, there's wind and waves to be considered. So the strong signals are really strong of order minus 30, minus 30 to minus 40 dBm. And if our receiver can't handle those, we will be in trouble. So now on to the receiver performance. There are two challenges. The first one that doesn't get enough attention is that there's lots of other RF in the world lots of out-of-band signals. And as I'll show, a lot of those signals are really strong. So the first thing we need to do is to filter out out-of-band signals. We're not interested in them, so we should get rid of them. Our second problem is strong in-band signals. We're interested in these signals, so we can't just filter them out. All we can do is make the very best receiving system that we can. And very best in this context means the receiving system with the biggest possible spurious free dynamic range. As I'll show in practice, um, if you're using um, equipment that you can buy as opposed to building your own specialist receiver, the easiest solution is a good transverter with a high performance HF transceiver at the moment. Um, I will also look at transceivers in a box, uh, but the performance tends to be less good. So out of band signals first. This is what I measure in rural Oxfordshire on two times 18 element for 70 centimeters. So 70 centimeter antennas 
but I'm looking across the frequency range uh, from a few tens of megahertz up to a gigahertz. What you see is that although it's way out of the band of the antennas, the local FM broadcast signals are really strong, minus 40 dBm. Tetra public safety uh, is very strong as well. Digital audio broadcasting, not quite so strong, but still significant. Uh, there happens to be a, a scanner, a telemetry scanner, um, just down the road uh, from uh, my site. And that's stronger still, that's about minus 36 dBm, and it's almost in band, so the antennas work quite nicely for it. Then all of digital television, and then cellular above there, and of course that extends even higher. So these signal levels are really high, and if you shove them straight into a um, high gain preamplifier, you may manage to overload the preamplifier before you do anything else and wreck your receiver performance. So you need a good filter. This is um, uh, one of the um, uh, uh, preamplifiers for 70 centimeter that you can buy. And the nice thing about this preamp is that the outer band signals have been thought about. So it has very nice filtering and just knocks the outer band signals down by 30 dB to 40 dB. And that really makes it easier to build the system. So when you're looking for preamps, look for ones that have thought about out of band signals. Don't just look for the one that has the lowest possible noise figure. So I said that the key metric for performance is the spurious free dynamic range for the receiver. And what spurious free dynamic range is, is the difference between the noise level, no signals present, to the signal level, the input signal level, at which distortion products just begin to come out of the noise, just come out of the noise. So we want to make this as big as we possibly can. The picture I'm showing here is a classical picture for what's called weak nonlinearity. And in weakly nonlinear systems, the in-band products that cause us the most problems are the third order intermodulation products. Uh, they're of the form, if you have two signals, F1 and F2, they are 2F1 minus F2, or 2F2 minus F1. So they are just the spacing between the two signals away from those signals. So they're close to the frequencies we're trying to work at. That's why they're a problem. As we'll see later, for systems that are not weakly nonlinear, the other intermodulation terms can actually be as significant or more significant than these. So Although this, this picture is valid, whatever the order of intermodulation, we still need the maximum spurious free dynamic range. But on systems that are not weakly nonlinear, it may be that the first intermodulation terms to cause us interference may come from a different mixing process. They may be fifth, seventh, or higher order. But whatever pops out of the noise first, sets the limit for the spurious free dynamic range. So basically we can define the receiver performance with just two parameters. One, the internally generated noise level, which should be such that we can hear the weakest signals that are on the band, and two, the spurious free dynamic range. So it's actually really a rather simple specification. Now, there are other receiver problems that we need to worry about. And one of them is what's called reciprocal mixing. This is where the local oscillator or clock in the receiver is noisy, has jitter and modulation on it. And then a strong received signal can convert, acts as the local oscillator 
to convert noise around the local oscillator down to IF and mask our wanted signal. That's called reciprocal mixing. We can also suffer trying to receive a particular signal from another station that has a noisy signal that has radiated noise. That radiated noise can mask our wanted signal as here. And I'll show an example of that a little bit later in the talk. So now let's talk a little bit about architectures. This is a hybrid radio architecture. So well-known example is the Elecraft K3. There are plenty of others. We take in a signal, bandpass filter it. Note this is quite a broad filter. Preamplify it mix it down to an intermediate frequency and place it through a sharp filter. So for sideband, a three kilohertz wide filter. We then feed it into an analog to digital converter, perform all the DSP filtering functions on it, recover the audio, and that's the audio output. So that is a hybrid radio architecture. Now notice that the number of signals that reach the analog to digital converter is determined by this filter. And the strong signal performance of this type of architecture is determined by the weak nonlinearity of the mixer and of the filter, and possibly if it's a really badly designed preamp, by the preamplifier also. But these are the critical components and they are the things that you have to spend money on to get a high performance system. Obviously the local oscillator must be spectrally pure as I discussed in the last slide. So for that architecture, as you gradually increase the strength of signals, you can see here the third order intermodulation products, which are limiting, will limit the dynamic range of the system, just beginning to pop out of the noise. If we put stronger signals into the receiver, we now see strong intermodulation products, which if we were trying to receive a signal on those frequencies, that would be a big problem. And you see also some much weaker higher order products, like the fifth order products here and here, seventh order product here, and just about possible to spot it there. And then if you wind the input power up even higher, that's uh, minus 25 dBm per tone in this experiment. You can see the third order product, the fifth order product, the seventh order product, the ninth order product. But notice that the third order is the strongest, the others are weaker, which is why people used to talk so much about the third order intercept point. As you'll see in this talk, I don't talk about that a metric. And the reason is because we need to address issues with software defined radios also. So here's a software defined radio architecture. This is the ICOM uh, IC9700. Again, we have a bandpass filter, preamp, but the preamp goes straight into an analog to digital converter, then DSP and audio and loudspeaker. So there is no front end mixer. There is simply an analog to digital converter. That means you don't need the high performance mixer and you don't need the narrow bandwidth filters, crystal filters. You do all your filtering in DSP. That saves you money, which is good. And also it allows you to implement easily um, nice display functions like pan adapters and other things that are very attractive. However, the analog to digital converter has to cope with a whole band full of signals without distortion. That puts a big challenge for the analog to digital converter. And so you need to spend your money on that component. The problem for analog to digital converters is that they may not be quite accurate. There's quantizing error for small signals. There's clipping, strong signal nonlinearity for large signals. 
And there may just be inaccuracy in the transfer function of the analog to digital converter. Any inaccuracy leads to distortion and spurious products. The dynamic range is six times the number of bits. You can use oversampling to um, increase the dynamic range, but achieving accuracy at higher sample rates is even more difficult. If you have multiple equal strength signals going into the analog to digital converter, they, their peaks sum as voltage. And so the overload power reduces as 20 log to the base 10 of the number of such strong signals. You can imagine the effect of that in a UK activity contest. And indeed, I'll play you an audio clip to illustrate it. So here's an illustration of the nonlinear behavior of an ADC. And you see, actually, you've got third order products, fifth order products, seventh order products visible there. They're all much the same signal strength. There's a whole host of them. And as these sig main signal levels vary, these things pop up and down in size. And I'll show a plot of that. So accuracy is key. So what I've measured here is the intermodulation characteristics. That's the ratio of intermodulation products, third order intermodulation products over noise for a, a transverter and a K3, as opposed to an IC9700. I have an IC9700, it's a very useful remote controlled radio, which is why I was able to make these measurements. So here are the intermodulation product levels for the transverter and K3, and you see strong signals, it starts to produce quite bad intermodulation products. As I reduce the strength of those signals, the intermodulation products get weaker and weaker until at about minus 47 dBm in this case, um, they drop below the noise level. So the IP to noise in 500 Hertz uh, becomes zero. And if you reduce the input power further, that's where it stays. It never comes above the noise. So the spurious free dynamic range is from the noise floor of the system up to this point. And in fact, it's a ratio of about 99 dB on my system. So in the IC9700, as I reduce the strength of the input signals, and this is, I'm just looking at the third order products. I don't look at what happens to the higher order ones, but they're present also. The intermodulation gets weaker and weaker, and there's not a huge amount of difference here. So it look, looks good, but as the signal gets weaker, the intermodulation products come up again. And then it, you make it weaker, they go down again. They're bubbling along close to the noise floor, then they come up again. And they don't finally disappear until you're at minus 80 dBm per tone. So on a real band, the question is, what's the dynamic range? Well, with my strict definition of spurious free dynamic range, the range is from the noise floor up to the first time one of these products gets above the noise floor. That's here. And it's 63 dB in 500 Hertz for an IC9700, for my IC9700. Other reviews measure things a little bit differently, and I've listed some of the different reviews. Um, in the ARRL uh, review, they take this as the point where the upper end of the dynamic range is. So that gives a much larger dynamic range. Another review sets it just below the start of this peak, gives a somewhat smaller dynamic range. Sherwood is more conservative and takes this raising above the noise floor, gives a smaller dynamic range still, and I'm miserable. I use the strict definition of SFDR, so I give you the lowest dynamic range. What difference does it make in practice? Well, I've, I've, um, what I've done is I recorded simultaneously 
the uh, um, last week's UCAC on two meters um, with the ME2 HT stroke K3 and with the IC9700. So the two clips I'm going to play you is first with this one, you'll hear adjacent channel interference and you'll hear um, G0BNC, um, a relatively weak signal for me where I was beaming. And that's what you'll, that's all you'll hear. I hope I've started the clip now. Not terribly strong. Um, I don't hear it well. Maybe you'll have to listen to it later. But very different uh, thing happens. Right. Thank you. Thank you for technical advice. <laughs> right. It's very. It's very good that uh, we have. So let's just, brilliant. Right, now we'll get things to work. Okay, so this is the one, this is the one with, um, uh, from the ME2 HT K3. I'll let it play to the end. Here's the one, exactly the same input signal strength, exactly the same frequency, but on the IC9700. You hear all that crackle. And that's the difference. It's considerably more difficult. And with a lot of strong signals, that's what you hear. That's a limited band in the Nasty noise. Okay, let's move on. So what I do here is the received performance of VHF, UHF transceivers. And the, the table has two, um, two columns. I mean, I give the noise figure, measured noise figure of this variety of radios. And I give the spurious free dynamic range in a half kilohertz bandwidth of 20 kilohertz offset from the strong signal. And what you can see is that it's a leak table um, with a strict measurement of SFDR. The IC9700 does not do too well, but neither do a lot of other radios. And the thing that's of more interest is the column on the right where I've actually included a preamplifier which doesn't overload but ensures that we get a 3 dB overall noise figure so that we can hear weak signals. The effect of course is to reduce the dynamic range still further and that gives this uh, this leak table on the right. An alternative is to use a transverter and an HF transceiver, as I've just described with the ME2HT K3. And here are some of the numbers that you get. Uh, you can get into the high 90s with the better transceivers. And note, uh, somebody said to me a while back that I'm simply prejudiced against SDRs. I assure you I'm not. Um, they just have to be really well implemented and that tends to cost money. So you can get a pretty good result with a good transverter and something like a, um, uh, one of the better flex um, SDRs. Uh, it's not a cheap system, but uh, you can get good numbers. So uh, that's the league table. And so the typical system is to incorporate an HF transceiver, a transverter, and then on the receive side, a bandpass filter to get rid of out of band signals, a preamp to define the noise figure, and this vital component, an attenuator. And the idea of this attenuator is to just give sensitivity so that when you connect to the aerial, the receiver just very slightly degrades the noise you get in from the aerial. 
because that gives you the biggest dynamic range you can possibly get. There is no point in having no attenuator, a huge gain preamp with a very low noise figure, which gives big signals into the transverter. Yes, you'll hear very weak signals if there are no strong signals, but the strong signals amplified by the preamplifier will overload the rest of the, si of the system and limit your dynamic range. On transmit, if you go out uh, on transmit, an attenuator to set the level to the PA so that you don't get excessive distortion, and again, a filter to make sure that you're not producing any nasty out of band signals uh, to trouble um, fellow spectrum users. So that's a simple system to construct. So let's say a little bit about transmitter performance to conclude. There is now an RSGB contest code of practice, which sets recommended limits for spurious signals from transmitters. It covers both intermodulation products and noise, and it divides stations into what I call small stations. So a single antenna, 100 watts uh, output power or less, which has a slightly more relaxed specification than a, a large station, which has multiple antennas and more than and or more than 100 watts uh, output. We have to make the limit for spurious emissions stricter because otherwise a badly designed one of these can cause havoc to many other band users. These numbers are given in a measurement bandwidth of three kilohertz. You can read the code of practice on the RSGB um, uh, contest website. Intermodulation distortion is probably the easiest thing to solve. You need a well-designed PA and you need not to drive it heavily. If you're lucky enough to have a spectrum analyzer, then examine the levels of the intermodulation products and make sure they are well within code of practice limits. If you don't have a spectrum analyzer, then I recommend that you drive most amplifiers to not more than a half of their rated output power on speech peaks. You need a PP watt meter, so a bird watt meter with a uh, bird through line with a PP attachment, which you can buy off eBay for 30 pounds or so. Um, having a large PA and no method of measuring the peak envelope power coming out of it, not only is a bit of a likely to make you in breach of your license conditions, but also is likely to lead to you having a nasty signal on the band. So the easiest way to a clean signal from the intermodulation point of view is a big PA uh, well under driven. Probably the single biggest problem on the bands though now is radiated noise. This is broadband amplitude and phase noise from transmitters, which just lifts the noise floor for local stations. So we are actually polluting our own bands. This is a problem that has become greater and greater in recent years um, as radios use lower voltage rails and uh, sometimes uh, software, software defined radios where there's inadequate filtering because there are a lot of digital signals in a software defined radio and we have to be very careful to keep them out of the signal bar. So the code of practice requires, the most difficult number to meet is at 50 kilohertz or greater offset from carrier, the noise needs to be less than minus 125 dBs relative to carrier in a one hertz bandwidth for a small station and less than uh, minus 135 dBc per hertz for a large station. There's a relaxation to these standards at the microwave frequencies to allow for frequency multiplication of phase noise. What does radiated noise do in numbers across the bands? Well, on six meters, the band noise is quite high. So actually the penalty from this specification for a receiving station 10 kilometers away um, 
if we meet the code of practice, there isn't actually a penalty on six meters. With even for a station meeting this standard, on four meters, the noise would rise by about one S point from a station that met the standard. On two meters, the nearby station 10 kilometers away would see an increase in noise floor of two S points. And this is for equipment that meets the standard. So people who've said this standard is too stringent, um, I would beg to disagree based upon these calculations. Of course, if you have no nearby stations, you don't have to worry so much. But in our crowded island, there are very few stations who have no other stations within 200 kilometers of them. So here's an illustration. This was the, um, I think, two meter trophy in 2016. Here's part of the band, um, plus minus 100 kilohertz. And there is a station with bad radiated noise. So the station is not transmitting at the moment. The noise floor in uh, 444 hertz bandwidth was about minus 140 dBm. On comes the station with high radiated noise. The noise floor has just shot up by 10 dB, blanking out any weak signals within not just local to him as with intermodulation products, but right across, right across the band. And it sounds like this. You'll hear the noise coming and going. That's the radiated noise. He stops calling CQ. Quieter again. And there he's back again with his auto CQ on. Um, playing havoc with everybody else who's, who's uh, trying to work weak stations. So radiated noise is a real menace and we need to pay attention to it. I'll just let the clip complete. So some measurements. Um, these are uh, measurements on a variety of VHF transceivers. I've plotted, these are the code of practice limits um, at 50 kilohertz offset here. And this is an ancient IC202, a very early SSB transceiver for two meters. This transceiver, um, the curve here, the green curve is phase noise, the black curve is amplitude noise, and the blue curve is composite noise, that's the total noise power. This ancient transceiver can meet both the small signal at the small station and the large station limits uh, for radiated noise, no problem at all. Now let's move on to a modern radio, the IC9700. This radio uh, set to 85% of full power just meets the small station limit on two meters. But if we turn the power down, the amplitude noise comes up and it now breaches the small signal limit, small station limit for radiated noise. Um, I'm just talking here of the small station limit. This radio cannot meet the large large station limit at all so it, it should not be used with the power amplifier ever on 70 centimeters um, the noise is above the small station limit so it breaks the code of practice limit by 10 dbs on 70 centimeters on 23 centimeters uh, it breaks the code of practice limit by 17 dBs. If we use an HF uh, transceiver with a um, an HF transceiver uh, with a transverter, 
uh, we can make use of low phase noise transceivers. So this is measurements on a K3S and it meets both small and large signal limits comfortably. So here finally are some leak tables. Um, of the transceivers in a box, only the IC202 has a green traffic light because it could be used for small or large stations. The IC9100 and 9700 on, on two meters can meet small signal. The rest can't meet the code of practice, either for small or large signals. For HF transceivers, by, uh, by contrast, quite a number can meet the large, the large station limit. And you have to go back to quite old radios like the FTDX 5000 will still meet the small station limit and only a few. But incidentally, note that the KX3, which is a good receiver, is not a good clean transmitter for VHF transverter use and um, uh, therefore um, can't meet the code of practice. So finally, what to look for? You need a receiver with a noise figure that's low enough that it will enable the weakest terrestrial signals to be heard. Generally around 2 dB or so will, will work in the VHF bands. Don't make the lower noise figure, uh, don't make the noise figure ultra low because you will compromise strong signal handling. You need to get the maximum spurious free dynamic range that you can with this low noise figure. 100 dB and 3 kilohertz bandwidth would be very nice to do and is quite tough to do. On transmitters, you need low intermodulation products, should be looking for minus 70 dBc at 20 kilohertz offset from carrier. And above all, at the moment, we need low radiated noise, better than 130, minus 135 dBc per hertz at 50 kilohertz offset, especially if you're a large station. This is, is doable, but it's not really doable with um, transceivers in a box. It generally requires a good HF transceiver and a transverter. So in conclusion, we need high dynamic range receivers and low radiated noise transmitters. That way we can all hear the DX and hopefully work it. There isn't a current commercial VHF UHF transceiver which can be used with a legal limit PA uh, to make a large station uh, if there are near neighbor stations, a uh, transverter approach is needed. Some of the commercial VHF UHF transceivers have such bad, such high radiated noise that they shouldn't be used with a PA and some are even higher and shouldn't be used at all uh, where there are other stations in the neighborhood. So, there is another advantage. If you have a low radiated noise transceiver, it may well have low phase noise, which will benefit your reciprocal mixing performance on receive. So you will get benefit for yourself on receive as well as being a good neighbor. And in summary, it remains the fact that a good HF transceiver with a transverter and an underrun PA with its level carefully set is the easiest way of having a high performing VHF UHF uh, station. So here are some, uh, uh, some uh, things to read. Uh, the QST and RADCOM equipment reviews are worth reading the technical sections of, as well as all the operational features. Sherwood Engineering, Rob Sherwood, uh, publishes a great uh, table of uh, transceiver performance, which I highly recommend. Um, I wrote up quite a number of these factors in a, a RADCOM article back in 2015, so that might be worth a reread. Um, but generally, look carefully at the specifications, not just the operational features. And finally, I'd like to thank uh, ARRL and Bob Allison in particular. Um, for permission to use some of their measured data and calculations uh, for the purposes of the uh, information I've presented. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, the convention team who've been enormously technically helpful in getting this talk out. Thank you very much.
Well, thank you very much, Owen. Some uh, few things to think about there. In fact, somebody on the chat is saying, uh, have you presented these findings to the radio manufacturers and did you get any feedback? Uh, I don't have any, um, as I said, I'm entirely independent of radio manufacturers. Um, I have certainly had correspondence with um, uh, some of the better um, transceiver manufacturers and uh, quite quite interesting dialogues. And I, I've certainly found that um, people who think about um, making these products commercially, uh, one of the things is there's a lot of work done on HF transceivers and the requirements for HF are really a bit different from those for VHF, UHF. So, so you know, the understanding is... Um, is developing, uh, but um, no, I'm not. Um, I'm not planning to, you know, to lobby um, uh, to lobby the manufacturers of transceivers. Um, I think I've got a lot of sympathy for them because, when all said and done, they've got to make a product that people are prepared to buy. And you know, it's no use them providing a really high-performing product that nobody can afford to buy. So what I, uh, I think the best thing is for us all to be intelligent customers. Um, we can actually uh, still find some very high performing transceivers on the second hand market. And perhaps if we focus on that rather than buying the latest, um, you know, the latest uh, commercial offering, it may send a message that we need slightly better RF performance in the new transceivers that are coming onto the market. But let's not forget, it's gonna be a big challenge for any manufacturer to build this very high performance at a low price. It's no easy, it's no easy technical problem. So um, uh, I do think manufacturers respond to general customer feedback. Uh, and if we're intelligent customers, uh, we'll probably get better products. Well, Eric Swartz said this morning he uh, definitely responds to uh, customers' feedback. Um, Tim Haig, a M0AFJ, said your findings on the 9700 mirror what he's found on a Cornish hilltop. and says it must be a lot worse in IO92. And he also suggests that perhaps reviewers of this equipment should stop pulling their punches. What, what do you think? Um, well, again, I don't want to criticise... Um, I don't want to criticise the reviewers. I mean, reviewing is a is very hard work, you know, making, you know, making these sort of measurements. And one thing I think I should say about the measurements I made on the IC9700, trying to measure intermodulation products that are just above the noise floor, um, it's tricky. I mean, you've got to be very patient. You've got to sit there and you've got to make the measurements very you know, very carefully. And, you know, if I had to, um, you know, go through all the routine measurements that, that reviewers make on radios, I mean, it would take a very long time to extract all this data. So, you know, I think the reviewers, I think the reviewers do a very good job and they don't want to write a review that is so technical that nobody's going to appreciate the finer points of it. But I do think that we should be honest about the spurious free dynamic range of transceivers. And I think as we, as in particular for the SDRs, it was quickly realized that just quoting the third order intermodulation product didn't give a true picture of the performance of the transceiver. But what's for sure is that the spurious free dynamic range does. And I would I think it would be great if the um, if the reviews could measure that could at least measure that parameter as carefully as possible, um, assuming that the resources are available to make the measurement. It's not easy to make that measurement. Uh, as for radiated noise, that's um, well. There are various ways of making the measurement, but I think this is if if there was one thing I would improve in the current crop of VHF UHF transceivers it would be radiated noise because in the UCACs, sitting in the middle of IO92, I really, 
um, you know, my noise level goes up by um, 15 to 20 dB. So I'm never going to work any weak stations. Um, and I think that's a real shame. One or two people, uh, Chris Bird and Colin Leonard, G4 ERO, saying they, uh, they're glad, they're glad they hung on to their IC202s. Nice. <laughs> oh, um, I don't know if you're able to do this, but Dave Goodwin, VE9CB, wonders if you can play, you know, the first set of audio that you did the comparison on. It didn't yeah. come across too well. I wonder if you could, if there's any chance uh, that you could. Uh, yeah, I, I'm going to again. try. I, I was very grateful to Dom for helping me out. I didn't realise that the laser pointer didn't work as a laser, as a, as a cue control. So I'm just going to go back and I'll try and play that comparison again. I'm sorry that the first clip, is slightly lower in um, audio level than the second one. Um, so I'm hoping that we can get it a little bit better this time for you with the wonderful assistance of our team. So this one really, if it could just be eased up a little in level, um, it would help. It's, uh, it's not regulated to best BBC standards, I do apologise. So here's the uh, here's the ME get my point back. Here's the ME2 HTK3. Did did you hear that? Yes, I, I heard that, okay. Okay. Right, now here is the IC9700. Now what I want to emphasize is that in this test, I used a, a hybrid splitter. So the signal strength going into the two systems is absolutely identical. So there's that nasty, there's that nasty crackle. Okay, thank, thanks for doing that. So it was, yes. um, it broke up for me, but that could be just my, uh, just my, my link. Uh, how are we doing for time? I can't tell my clock's gone off. Um, Ian, uh, GW7APP, uh, says he bought the FT991 with the idea of taking part in a small way with the VHF UHF contest. So does it mean he has to sell it or not use it for what he wanted to? Well, I, I think the answer for the FT991, which has very, very large level of radiated noise, is obviously it's got, you know, a whole huge range of bands in a single box and it's compact. It's a lovely thing to take out on the hills. Now, I think the answer is, um, I noticed he has a GW7 call sign. So if he's lucky, he may live in one of these parts of the country where he doesn't have any near neighbours. So if he can be far enough away from his neighbours, he won't cause them any problem. But uh, far enough away for, for an FT991 um, is probably 100 kilometres plus. OK, we're going to have to leave it there, Alwyn. Thank you very much. I think there's plenty to think about uh, there. Thank you very much uh, for Indeed. the questions too. Indeed. Thank you. OK, uh, well, we thought we were going to get Kim uh, handing us over to the National Radio Centre just then. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, we've lost our link to Kim again. But never mind. Uh, what I can tell you is uh, that uh, coming up in just a moment, William Eustace will be here uh, talking about uh, digital signal posting. And it's, uh, I should warn you, it's, it's quite a technical talk. So, uh, But uh, if you are mathematically inclined, I'm sure you will find that one interesting. So do stay with us uh, and we'll just cross over to the National Radio Centre. Very, very good set of round clock on screen. We've got some old Bravo 4s. 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 we uh, uh, I'm afraid I'm not too strong at the moment. I need to try and peek the beam uh, on you. I think it was. Uh, I've got a chance.
Charlie Romeo in there on the call sign. Then. So uh, I'm going to QSY off the calling frequency down to 270270 and see if I can copy their uh, QSL. Yeah, Zulu Sierra 6, Charlie, Charlie Yankee, is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Good afternoon. Uh, GB3RS, Dog Bravo 3, Romeo Sierra, listening frequency. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, we're just, uh, just tuning up, uh, turning the antenna down in your direction, so hopefully that's picked up your signal a bit stronger. Um, the name this end is Tony, um, and I'm calling you from the Radio Society of Britain's main radio station at the uh, Bletchley Park um, uh, Computer Museum. Okay, yes. Mike 1, Charlie Mike Radio, M1CMR, GP3RS, good afternoon to you. Thank you for coming back to the call. Sorry, uh, it was a little bit of a struggle. Yes, yes you're also 5-7, so it's a nice clear signal call. It's, uh, it's uh, been Martin, suppressed a bit by some QSP. It's certainly a nice strong signal. Um, I also um, have a regular contact with uh, uh, our colleague down in the Rock Valley, Cape Town, which is Zulu Sierra 1, Oscar Bravo. So how are you copying? Mike on the show, Mike Radio, GG3 RF server. National Radio Center um, output today. We are, we're running a sort of virtual conference, if you like, via radio and video, um, in place of the conference which will probably take place at this time of year. Over. Uh, yes, well, your virtual as it were. And uh, that's the thing. Again, it's still the IWL. Right in the very north part of the Republic of South Africa. It's a long way from Jason. Yeah, the mic's serving Gulf Juliet Hotel. Yes, sir. I lost the other station. I don't know if you can hear the other station. Yes, that's fine. I'm going to be able to see Mike's second Gulf Hotel. I'm going to be able to see the other station. I'm going to be able to see the other Okay, uh, thank you, Graham. Um, um, yeah, 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 y
Welcome to the penultimate lecture for today. The final one at four o'clock is designed to take your CW to the next level. Now though, William Eustace, M0WJE, tells us about the underlying concepts of DSP. Notes and slides will be available to download as there'll be no time for questions here. Contact details will be available on screen. William Eustace. Good afternoon. My name is William Eustace and today I am going to discuss the concepts underlying digital signal processing. Uh, I'd like to begin with something of a, a disclaimer and an apology. Uh, the explanation, with the description which was circulated at this talk is not entirely accurate. Uh, it is not a basic talk, it is a reasonably advanced talk, and I never claimed it was easy to understand. Um, it requires roughly A-level mathematics. Certainly you will need a reasonably solid mathematical footing, uh, because this is fundamentally not a mathematics-free zone. Um, I'll try and explain everything as we go through there. Secondly, this talk is about the concepts involved. It covers some of the maths. It is not a practical tutorial. If you want to learn how to do something without worrying, without caring about why, uh, this talk is not for you. Uh, so to recap, there is going to be maths. There is going to be quite a lot of maths. I will explain it, but you need to be ready for that. And uh, I make no claim that this will equip you fully to launch into practical DSP design. So. Uh, having said that, why do we want to learn about DSP? Uh, well, it, it, it pervades every aspect of modern amateur radio. Uh, Software-defined radios in particular have been playing a larger and larger role in the sort of rigs you buy on the high street, whether it's uh, for VHF or HF. Um, and, of course, uh, from an amateur perspective, there's a lot of tinkering that can be done with tools like GNU Radio. Um, so. It, it is an area, hopefully, of some interest, and understanding the underlying concepts is quite useful when you work with these systems. Today, we're going to talk about the distinction between things we will for now vaguely term the time domain and the frequency domain in the context of signals, and how we go between them. We will briefly cover Nyquist's theorem uh, which uh, is also known as the sampling theorem, and then talk about uh, impulse responses, way of measuring a system effectively, convolution, a tool to apply them, and how these two things are used together to build digital filters. So, without further ado, what is a signal? Um, it's, it's a good question to ask at this point. Uh, we're going to define it as a time-varying function. Uh, we write a mathematical function in this way. Um, that is to say, f is the function, t is what we might call the argument. It's a variable we put into the function, and for each value of that variable, we get something out. So we might say t zero seconds, the value of the function is one. At t equals three seconds, the value of the function is five, and so on. A lot of signals in the classical electronics world are analog, it's, it's a voltage, uh, but in DSP evidently mostly we digitize things first, and when you digitize something you effectively round it uh, to some number of decimal places as it were, you uh, quantize it, and this loses a certain amount of information, but usually you pick the number of decimal places as it were, so that you don't lose too much. Uh, so we won't worry too much, any, we won't worry any further about this. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the final and important distinction is between a discrete signal and a continuous signal. Uh, I have two possible signals here. In green is what I would term a continuous signal. That is to say, it is uh, it, it has values at all times, t. By contrast, in orange, we've sampled the signal, we've discretized it. That is to say, we've measured it at a certain interval, but we haven't measured it in between those intervals. The signal, as far as we're concerned, is the array, for those of you who are programmers, uh, a collection of readings as you go along the signal. It is not a continuous function. 
uh, but we can treat it uh, in much that light, and we're going to, uh, to the extent we worry about the distinction in this lecture at all. <clears throat> I promised there would be some maths, and I wasn't lying, uh, so hold on tight. First of all, uh, a sum. This is a fairly straightforward concept, hopefully. It is exactly what it sounds like, adding up. Uh, it's slightly more nuanced because we introduce this very, very common and fairly simple notation. This is a Greek sigma, and at the bottom of the sigma we define something, a variable, n in this case. We say n equals zero, this is the lower limit, zero, and at the top m here is the upper limit. And what this means, once again for programmers, it's a for loop. We set n equals zero, we evaluate the function, whatever it is that we've, we're summing at n equals zero, and then n equals one, and n equals two, all the way up to n equals m, and then we add all of those together. Um, <clears throat> so that's, that's a sum. The second essential concept is that of an integral, and this is what we draw here. Uh, this sign is a sort of elongated S, this is the integral sign, and what this means is take the function, f of t in this case, and with respect to the variable t, integrate between minus pi and pi. And I can show you what I mean by this. Here's a function, um, it's a sine wave actually, and I have shaded the area under it in orange. That area is given by the integral between 0 and 10 of the function with respect to time, which is just the variable uh, on the x-axis, effectively. It, so the integral is very simply the area under the function between these two points. It may be interesting to you to note, we can also approximate the area by a sum. And you can think of this just like counting squares. If you drew the function on squared paper, you could just count out the squares. Um, if we draw some rectangles uh, such that the top corner touches the curve at each point, and we sum up their areas, we get an approximation to the area, which we might write like this. That is to say, we sum over n of the function at n times delta t, so 0 times delta t, 1 times delta t, 2 times delta t, and so on, and each time multiply that value by the width delta t, which is the width between uh, the width of these rectangles, and then we sum it all up. And in fact, this is the definition of an integral. As you let the rectangles get smaller and smaller and smaller, the sum becomes closer and closer to the area, and indeed when the width of the rectangles becomes infinitesimally small, you end up with the integral. But that's um, a little more advanced than we need to go for this presentation. <clears throat> um, I thought I'd better cover this very briefly, but hopefully you're already familiar with it. It is important that we talk about sines and cosines. First, uh, a sine wave. Here I've plotted two of them, actually. In blue on this figure, is sine of t. This is what you might see on your oscilloscope if you hook it up to a single pitch, say a CW oscillator. It is just a, a pure tone. And the first thing to note is that it's periodic, it repeats. The second thing is, in this case, this is at one frequency. If we change the argument of the sine function to be 2t, then we double the frequency. So sine of 2t is plotted in orange, and you can see that in the time it takes sine of t to do one cycle, a cycle being the part between repeats, then sine of 2t has done two cycles. There is also uh, another function, cos t, which is much like sine t, except uh, shifted a bit. Uh, we're not going to talk much about that, but uh, it, it plays a very important role. Now, I will say that uh, another point which hopefully some of, many of you anyway will have 
thought of or will have seen before, but it's not crucial if not, that's why I'm saying it now. Uh, a sine wave has, a sine wave at frequency, a unit frequency, sine t, has a period of 2 pi. So if I take sine t, t is in seconds, the period is 2 pi seconds. That is to say it repeats every 2 pi seconds, which is about 6.28. If, on the other hand, uh, I put some multiplier in, I can generate a higher or lower frequency. So if I want a 100 hertz sine wave, I can write uh, sine of 100 times 2 pi times t. The 2 pi is important to convert it into a frequency in cycles per second or in hertz, uh, but it doesn't really matter. If you don't have that, you can write it however you like. Um, it just doesn't quite correspond to the frequency measurements we usually use. So, to recap, integral is the area under a curve, sum is adding things up as we increase some variable, and a sine wave and a cosine wave are both periodic functions uh, with frequencies adjustable by changing the argument of the function. No, we're not at the end yet, sorry, that was the wrong, <laughs> the wrong key. Um, <clears throat> So, uh, now we can get down to business. You've probably all seen a waterfall display, a bit like this, or like this. This is what you tend to see on the front of something like a, a Flex SDR or anything of that, of that kind. Um, other, you know, many brands are available. This one happens to be captured by a friend from his, uh, his, his Flex rig. This is um, of the 20 meter band on a fairly quiet afternoon. And at the bottom end here, we can see there are some CW signals. There's FT8 here, some other data modes, and SSB up here. This is uh, an alternative. This is actually just in isolation a data mode, MFSK22. And uh, once again, you can see it has uh, a frequency spectrum, <clears throat> in this case, over about two and a half kilohertz. These are generated using an operation called the Fourier transform, and it is the Fourier transform we're going to spend now a good 15 or so minutes discussing. You might wonder how you generate these, and we're going to, we're going to find out. But it helps to note what we actually want to do is find the component of the signal at a given frequency. So we want to say what's happening at 14.06 megahertz, for example. If we can filter out just that little bit of the spectrum, we can say, hmm, there's a CW signal here. And finding how much signal is at a given frequency is behind everything we're going to do in this next couple of slides. So, uh, as I say, A-level maths uh, will make things uh, more pleasant uh, from here on in, but you can probably hang on if not. Uh, you might have seen a Maclaurin series or a Taylor series before. It's a way of approximating a function by summing a polynomial, effectively. Uh, we multiply each term by some coefficient, and we adjust the coefficients so that it roughly represents our function. It's very useful, it turns out, but it's not so good for periodic functions. It doesn't repeat. We want to represent a periodic function to start with, and in order to do that, we might think what periodic functions, you could call them basis functions if you want to get more sophisticated, are there? Well, we met two only a few minutes ago, sine and cosine, so let's use those. Um, rather conveniently, I introduced them totally randomly. They turn out to be the right ones to use, uh, or at least the ones we're going to use. <coughs> um, we're going to represent our function as a sum of sines and cosines. You might say, surely that only represents squiggles exactly like sine and cos, but we're going to add in higher frequencies. So we start off by adding sine t and cos t, and then we add some amount of sine 2t and some amount of cos 2t, and so on. In other words, we're combining a series of harmonics each of them with a different mixing coefficient to form the entire function. And 
this is called a Fourier series. Uh, the next question, of course, is how do we find these coefficients a and b? Um, of course, if you're really on the ball, you will have realized if we can represent our function as a sum of sines and cosines at different frequencies, then by looking at the size of the coefficients, we find out how much of a given frequency is in the signal. And that is really all I'm going to tell you for the next few minutes. So, uh, the, the orthogonality of sides, without further ado. <clears throat> Consider a sine wave, sine t, and then add a second sine wave to the same plot, sine t again. Now multiply them both together, and the product, sine of t times sine of t in this case, is what's marked in orange here, and I've shaded it in. Um, like earlier, what we're going to do is integrate over this function, sine of t times sine of t, and we're going to do it over a period, in this case between minus pi and pi for convenience. Turns out, if you integrate sine t times sine t between minus pi and pi, in other words, you find out the area shaded in green here, the answer is pi. You might say that's rather a useless piece of information. Why are you wasting our time? And indeed, I don't know either, really. But uh, what gets more interesting is if we try sine of t times sine of 2t. So now sine of t is in blue, sine of 2t is in orange and in green is the product. And we see, interestingly, that the positive part and the negative part, this is zero here, by the way, the positive area here and the negative area here are going to cancel out. For 3t and t, the same is true again. And in fact, it turns out, if we write in mathematical notation, that the integral over a period of the product of two sine waves is zero unless they are at the same frequency. And if they are at the same frequency, and this is a delightful bit of mathematical notation here, then for all n equals m, in other words, for all cases where the first frequency is equal to the second frequency, and they are whole numbers in the set of integers, the result is pi. That's a bit more interesting, isn't it? We have this very weird bifurcation. When we integrate something with a sine wave at the same frequency, when we integrate a sine wave with another sine wave at its frequency, we get pi. Otherwise, we get zero. The same, it turns out, is true for cosine. And if you integrate a sine with a cosine, you get zero whatever the frequency, it turns out. Actually, what we have here is a filter. We can take whatever function we like, and by integrating with sine of t, or sine of 2t, or cos of 3t, we can measure how much of each of those functions is in the function we want to measure, the, the, the function we want to decompose. And um, <clears throat> this, is, this is our Fourier series. This gives us the coefficients, because now, if our function looks like this, we're going to integrate over the function, which we could write as all of this, while multiplying by a sine. And remember, multiplying by the sine and integrating gets rid of everything except the term with that sign in it. So if sine, if n is 2 here, so we're calculating the second coefficient, then it's going to get rid of all of this and all of this, and we're going to be left just with the coefficient of a2, multiplied by pi. So we divide by pi. Uh, because the period of sine waves is 2 pi, there are going to be pi's absolutely everywhere uh, in the algebra. Don't worry about the algebra, I'm not expecting you to learn algebra, it's, it's, it's very boring, I find, so um, there's no need to worry about that. Uh, just try and cling on to the basic idea. Um, we can derive a, a very similar expression for the cosine terms, and the c here is just a dc offset. So, for example, if, if I take sine of t plus 2, the plus 2 is not periodic it's constant, and so we need to have this constant offset term as well, in some cases. If you're hopelessly lost, this might help. We're going to do an example, and the example is going to be a square wave. Uh, here it is. 
it's actually quite a carefully chosen example. Um, hopefully you've all seen a square wave. It's down, then up. Fairly simple idea. You can see where it got its name. The reason this is carefully chosen is that it only requires the sine terms in our Fourier series. So we only have to compute one set of coefficients, which, given we're lazy and strapped for time, is, is rather useful. <clears throat> uh, now, let's, let's try and calculate those coefficients. Uh, first, uh, we'll set n equals 1, and we'll integrate over the function multiplied by sine of t. And we're going to measure how much of sine t there is in our signal. And it turns out there is 4 over pi. Horrible number, isn't it? I mean, is that, what even is that? 1.1 1 .1 or something? Nasty. I, I'm going to draw a picture rather than do lots of maths, because it's often more fun. Um, here in orange is the sine wave, and in blue is the function. It's our square wave, remember. This is m equals 1, and we're t I'm telling you that the area under the green shaded bits, which is, remember, what we're measuring, so we integrate over a period and measure the area under the orange signal times the blue signal. So here, the, the blue signal is negative 1, so we flip the sign of this, which is why you have two positive humps instead of the reversing shape of the sine wave. The result is 4 over pi. If we set m equals 2, it turns out that the positive area and the negative area cancels completely. M equals 3? Hmm, it doesn't. 4? Cancels again. Well, <clears throat> I'm not going to keep waving my hands about and doing that. Uh, we could work through the maths, if you like. But I don't really like doing that either. It takes an awfully long time. Um, of course, we have to do this for an infinite number of terms, so this is going to take quite a while. I uh, hope you've brought refreshments. Or we could take a shortcut and try and find out a general way of doing it. Uh, you could do this with some algebra. It turns out that for all even values, all the even harmonics, sine of 2t, sine of 4t, sine of 6t, the coefficient is zero. A square wave has no even harmonic content, which is quite an interesting result, but not all that surprising, because if you've ever been involved with uh, spectrum policing, um, many amateurs seem to be in an informal capacity. Uh, you might have noticed that badly modulated signals or overdriven amplifiers, which tend to chop things up into a sort of square wave, often tend to emit third harmonics and fifth harmonics and seventh harmonics. This explains to, to an extent why that is. So what we're saying is that our square wave can be represented by a sum of odd harmonics, sine waves only, with a coefficient of 4 over n pi. That's not very instructive, really, so let's draw another picture. <clears throat> um, this is, in orange, that sum. All the odd coefficients up to some number times their respective harmonics. With just the first harmonic, just the fundamental, sine of t, it doesn't look very interesting. It's not really anything like a square wave. If we add some amount of sine 2t, well, remember, there's no even harmonics, so we don't change it. Sine of 3t, we get a, a sort of squiggle here and here. It's looking slightly more promising. 4t, of course, no even harmonics. 5t, 7t. We keep going. It gets closer and closer to being a square wave. And indeed, of course, if we keep adding an infinite number of terms, it gets infinitely close. Uh, but I don't have time to do that in this lecture, so we'll stop at 31. A note uh, for the wise. The ringing here, by which I mean the way in which we develop some oscillation around the sharp transitions, is called the Gibbs phenomenon. And uh, if you care to look this up um, or find out more about the field in general, you'll probably come across it. Right. Uh, so to recap, by integrating over a limited range, we can determine for a periodic signal how much energy or how much signal is in that, is in that uh, function at a wide range of frequencies. Um, and we just have to integrate with some sines and some cosines. 
In practice, uh, people don't use sines and cosines, they use complex exponentials, which look like this. Uh, it's actually just a mixture of sines and cosines in a more convenient package, and it makes the maths easier, unless you don't understand complex numbers, in which case it makes the maths impossible, and that's why I've elected to avoid using them here. Um, but uh, this is what you'll probably see if you look it up elsewhere. Uh, secondly, for signals that are not repetitive, so for example my voice speaking to you now, I know it sounds repetitive, I promise it's not periodic, or at least not perfectly periodic. Um, the thing is, it's a sample sequence, a sampled signal, so we could compute some sort of frequency transform, uh, but it's not periodic. What we do in order to compute the Fourier transform to find the spectrum of that signal is we basically pretend it's periodic and hope for the best. It's not perfect, but it's, it's surprisingly good, and that's called the discrete Fourier transform, give or take. Of course, for a sampled signal, you can't integrate because it's not continuous, but it's okay because you can sum instead. Um, and remember, I said that you can sum up the rectangles under the curve and you get towards an integral. So it is with the discrete Fourier transform. Um, next, uh, what about continuous signals? We're not going to talk about them in detail, but what I will say is that the sum, you remember we were summing up sine t and sine 2t and sine 3t and so on, that now becomes an integral. In other words, instead of having discrete coefficients for the amount of the signal at 1 hertz and 2 hertz and 3 hertz or whatever, you have a function which is continuous in frequency, which defines how much energy is at a given frequency. That's a bit of a second order thing to worry about. I don't want you to think about it too much now, but I will just introduce two more bits of notation for you to think on and recognize if you see them elsewhere. The first one is this script f. This means take the Fourier transform of this thing and the result will be a spectrum, which we usually write as something like f tilde of k, say, where k is the frequency. You can go the other way. This is the result of doing this. If you take the inverse Fourier transform, f script inverse, then you go back to the time domain. And actually, while I'm talking about the frequency domain and the time domain, would be a good time to explain what those actually are. I keep talking about them, right? So, uh, in the radio context, you've probably encountered both of these quite a lot, maybe without realising it or thinking about it too much. If you plug your oscilloscope into, say, a tone generator, you'll see a sine wave. If, on the other hand, you look at that sine wave on a spectrum analyzer, you'll see a single spike corresponding to the frequency coming out of the tone generator. More commonly, perhaps, if you listen to a signal, you're listening to it effectively in the time domain. The waterfall display you see on your radio sort of combines the time domain and the frequency domain, doesn't it? And I'm going to try and explain where this all comes from. At the top here, we have a Morse code letter A, dot dash. This is just basically a sine wave. We've turned it on here, and we've turned it off, and we've turned it on, and we've turned it off. And then I've taken the Fourier transform of it. That is to say, the Fourier transform of the whole signal. And that is usually what we mean when we say the Fourier transform. We take the whole signal from start to finish. In continuous signals, we take it from minus infinite time to plus infinite time. But of course, that requires you to do an infinite amount of integration, which is very tiring. Uh, so instead, we'll do it over the, the whole length of the signal, which is as close as we can be bothered to get. And we, of course, because it's a discrete transform, we assume it's periodic, but don't let's get into the detail. The result uh, looks perhaps a little like this. And um, you may note with interest, there is a big spike at 15 hertz. That's the frequency of the sine wave. But there are also all of these spurs, as we might call them. And those are, in fact, resulting from the harmonics of turning that sine wave on and off. Because remember, I said the square wave generates lots of odd and even, uh, sorry, lots of odd harmonics. Well, 
you can see those there. And this is why if you're sitting some distance away in the band from somebody with badly keyed morse, you end up with key clicks. This is where he's transmitting. This might be where you're listening. You're going to get some of his signal even though you're somewhere away. At the bottom here is what we might call a waterfall display. And this requires a bit more explanation. This is basically a series of Fourier transforms. Each row in this, and you can actually see in this graphic, it's made up rather coarsely, in fact, of rows. Um, it's a fairly low resolution waterfall, is made up of a little window. So for example, we might take the Fourier transform of this bit of our signal, and of course here there's nothing, and we're going to keep sliding the window along, and then we'll take the Fourier transform of this bit. And of course now we have some component, and so you start getting a bit at 15 hertz, and some spread elsewhere. We keep sliding the window along and take the Fourier transform again, and move it along and take the Fourier transform again, and each time we generate one row of this image. Of course, your radio does this in real time as the signal comes in, and so the waterfall scrolls continuously. But that's all it's doing. It's taking a series of so-called short-time Fourier transforms and putting them together. And in fact, the technique behind waterfall displays is called the STFT, or short-time Fourier transform. Um, so generally, for the rest of this presentation, when I say the Fourier transform, I mean the thing which gives us this picture. It analyzes the whole spectrum, uh, sorry, the whole signal at once, rather than little chunks of it. Final point, uh, some of you may have noticed, and I haven't mentioned yet, this spectrum here that I've obtained by taking the Fourier transform of the whole signal is signed. That is to say, it has positive frequency and negative frequency. What the hell is negative frequency, I hear you cry. Well, from our perspective in radio, it doesn't really matter. Uh, because um, in the limited cases we're considering in this lecture, anyway, we can imagine that the positive frequency component and the negative frequency component are exactly the same. So we can look at the positive part of the graph only. But it's important to remember that in Fourier space generally, we need to consider the negative side as well. Uh, or at least you need to think about it a little at some, at some point along your journey. So, a quick recap before we go any further. An integral is the area under a function between two limits. In this case, it's the area under the function f between a and b. Secondly, once we can find an integral, which we can do somehow, if you find the integral between a sinusoid multiply or over a sinusoid multiplied by some function over one period you can measure how much that sinusoid is in the signal so you can measure the frequency spectrum of your function from that you can derive a Fourier series you can represent whatever signal that you like that's periodic as a sum of content at all the harmonics with some coefficients for each harmonic we played around with it and we made it into a transform that works for any signal. Uh, I didn't explain how that worked really, but you don't need to worry about it too much. And we've hopefully now got a grip on the idea of the frequency domain, the spectrum, and the time domain, what you see on the oscilloscope. Now, uh, I realise my face is covering up, uh, covering up the bottom of this uh, text. Um, given that the Fourier series and the Fourier transform are available, you can prove the theorem we're going to discuss on the next slide. Unfortunately, we don't have time to do so, but you should look it up. Which brings us neatly on to the shannon whittaker kotelnikov nyquist sampling theorem, uh, or Nyquist's theorem, or the sampling theorem. It's got quite a lot of names. It's all the same thing, and it states that if you sample a signal, which is band limited, that is to say, it has no content at all outside a certain bandwidth in frequency. You can recreate it perfectly as long as you sample it at a sampling frequency, so you measure it more often than twice the highest, uh, twice the bandwidth. 
that's a bit of a deep result. So effectively, if I want, taking the simple case, if I want to measure a signal which has frequencies up to 10 megahertz, and I sample it at more than 20 megahertz, even though I'm not measuring it continuously, so there are bits, there are changes in the value between each time I measure it that I don't know about, I can completely recreate what happened between those points, given the fact I know it's bad limited. Now that's somewhat counterintuitive, I think. Uh, I have a plot here which might help. We start out sampling what is here a one hertz sine wave at a lowish frequency. And the orange lines are fairly meaningless, they're just to help see roughly what all the dots are in. Uh, they don't represent the optimal way of reconstructing the signal, so bear that in mind in a moment. Um, we're sampling at 0.7 hertz here, and it's one hertz sine wave. In fact, it looks, if you drew a line through the samples or something, you would imagine that it was a much lower frequency sine wave rather than one hertz. What does that tell us? Hmm. This is actually aliasing uh, or beating, and you will see it in all sorts of places, uh, but uh, we don't have much time to discuss it now. If we increase the sampling frequency, when it's half the output frequency, we get nothing at all. And we see more aliases, different frequencies that seem to appear, as we continue to change the sampling frequency. Until we get to the signal frequency, this is the limit. As soon as we sample at more than that, we now have more than two samples per cycle. And when I say per cycle, here of course I've plotted a sine wave. I thought I said, I hear you cry, that this was for any signal, not just for sine waves. Remember, we've already found out we can represent any signal we like as a sum of sine waves. So if we can prove this, or if you can be satisfied with this for a sine wave graphically, it works for whatever you like. And indeed, you can now see that if you reconstructed through these points to some extent, yes, you know, you, you're going to get a sine wave that looks plausible. But I, I would, of course, if I were, um, if I were wimpish, I would increase the number of points massively, way beyond what's actually required. And now, look, even by drawing a straight line, I can reconstruct it. This is a really unsatisfying proof. And if you're satisfied with this, well, you shouldn't be. Um, look it up. There is a proof using the mathematics of Fourier series, which we've already covered, and a little bit of the Fourier transform, which we've skimmed over. It's quite nice and simple. And uh, hopefully I may make some notes available. Now, uh, the, we don't have time to cover the proof, but just to recap, the gist is we can sample our signal at a frequency of more than twice the bandwidth, and we can recover it perfectly. OK, now we're satisfied this DSP thing isn't a total waste of time, because we aren't throwing away vast amounts of information when we sample the signal, which, admittedly, you'd think I wouldn't be giving a lecture about it if it were totally unimportant. Um, you might not be right. Uh, we might say, why do we want to do it anyway? Well, uh, say you're listening to a Morse signal and there's somebody very loud edging in next door to you. Here's the spectrum. This is the Morse signal you want. This is some interference. We want to get rid of the interference, but we want to keep the signal. And in a perfect ma manner, we would want to have no impact on the signal we want to keep and get rid of everything else completely. Note, this is in the frequency domain. I've said we want to cut off everything outside here and keep everything in here. And this is actually called a brick wall filter uh, because it's, well, I've, I've drawn it in a sort of brick-like colour. It's got vertical sides and a flat top. Damn sight better built than the brick wall we had built by the builders we last had. <clears throat> anyway, um, it turns out you can't, you can't make one of these. Uh, but we're going to come back to it, so don't lose hope. In, in the interim, though, we're going to have a break and talk about fireworks. 
Uh, now, this explanation is thanks to a lecturer at the University of Cambridge. Uh, it was possibly the best explanation of a difficult concept I heard in four years there. And uh, so that prize goes to Professor Tom Hines. Thanks very much uh, for, well, I didn't ask, but uh, I have uh, stolen his explanation entirely, and I hope he doesn't mind too much. Uh, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, as they say. Let's say we're planning a fireworks display and want to calculate how much smoke is in the air. We could set off the whole fireworks display and just measure, but that would be, you know, rather expensive. So let's try setting off one firework and measuring how much smoke it produces. One firework goes off and the smoke blows away. Okay. It does seem reasonable that we should be able to calculate how much smoke a full fireworks display generates by measuring one firework, if they're all about the same, right? This is the joyous world of convolution, and uh, what we do is deliver an impulse to the system, the system being the sky, by setting off a firework in it. This produces some smoke. The smoke dies away over time, and we measure that for one firework a singular impulse. Then we sum up all the smoke from all the fireworks we're going to set off over the whole display. And we work out how much smoke we're going to get, assuming they all behave the same way. Um, in order to do this, we have to introduce a second variable. And because I want you to be able to understand at least the basics of other people's writing, I've used the same variables everyone else uses. That is T and tau. Tau is a Greek T. Ha ha ha, you, you have permission to laugh. Um, it's quite confusing to have such similar looking letters, but uh, that's the way the world works, sadly. Anyway, to calculate the smoke, we do a sum. You remember sums? Good fun, weren't they? So we start off, in order to calculate how much smoke there is at a given time, we sum up the number of fireworks that have gone off at each time in the past, times the amount of smoke left from each of them. In other words, every time we set off a firework, we play back the way that the smoke behaved from one firework. If we set off a hundred fireworks, we assume we have a hundred times the smoke, and the smoke from each one decays away in the same way. And so we might generate a plot a bit like this. Uh, we start off by setting off a load of fireworks, and the smoke decays away. And then we set off some more. This new smoke adds to the smoke still in the air from the last round, and it all decays away, and so on. And uh, if I sort of work out an example for you, to, in case this notation, this sum, is a bit is possibly a little confusing because of all the different letters. Let's say we want to calculate how much smoke is in the air 13 seconds in. We start off by adding up all the number of fireworks that we set off at time zero, which was 13 seconds ago, and multiply it by the amount of smoke left from a single firework after 13 seconds. Then we add to that the number of fireworks set off at time 10, plus the amount of smoke left from a single, sorry, multiplied by the amount of smoke left from a single firework after three seconds. And we're done. Uh, but, of course, then we add up the number of fireworks we're going to set off at time 20 times the amount of smoke that will be in the air seven seconds before the firework goes off. Have I gone off my rocker? Well, yes and no. Uh, so hopefully this illustrates the idea. We play back the impulse response, as we call it. The impulse response is the amount of smoke of one firework each time we set up a firework. The problem is, in this case, there's no smoke before you set up a firework, so it's fine. But in some cases in, in life, you will encounter impulse responses which are so-called non-causal. In other words, they have non-zero values before the firework goes off. If you imagine a bell, for example, you can easily measure the impulse response of a bell. You just hit it with something and it rings. Imagine a bell that started ringing just before you hit it. It'd be very confusing. Some filters end up having impulse responses like this, and of course that's very problematic because the filter doesn't know what's coming in the future. Very few of us do. 
So this yields some problems and it's worth being aware of. Um, two more points. First, uh, the stimulus. We've said it's going to be one firework and then three fireworks and then two fireworks and so on. But actually, in general, your input, the number of fireworks, if you will, can be a continuous function. It can be anything, within reason. And the second problem is with the whole idea. Oh, the, the problem is with the whole idea to an extent. Because we've measured one firework. Why might this not work? First, imagine the wind changes between when we measure the one firework and when we have the display. Obviously, the behaviour is going to change, right? Secondly, uh, what if behaviour is not linear? And there are some examples of this in electronics. So let's say we're measuring a real-world filter for a high-power amplifier. If it has ferrites in it, for example, they might saturate so they stop behaving the way you measured them when you put many times what you measured through them. Diodes. If you apply a negative voltage where you measured it with a positive voltage, obviously the behaviour is going to be different. Transistors, equally, same problem. And uh, of course, at some extreme, if you have a wire and you measure it with one milliamp of impulse, you hit it with a milliamp pulse and see what happens, and then you say, OK, I'm now going to have 100 million of those. Well, the wire might just catch fire and burn out. And then obviously it's not going to respond linearly. In short, the system has to respond linearly within the area of interest. So you can add up. You can play back and add up the smoke. And secondly, the impulse response, the amount of smoke from one firework, as it were, has to be constant. And these are what we refer to as linear time invariant systems. Um, in the world of digital signal processing, you don't need to worry about this so much because you choose what the impulse response is and it's hopefully going to be linear unless you've made some overflow errors <laughs> and that kind of thing, which are implementation issues, really. Um, finally, uh, the convolution theorem, as it's known. I'm not going to go into this in depth because it's a bit complex, but it's incredibly useful. What it states is that multiplying the Fourier transform of two functions, in other words, multiplying functions in the frequency domain, is the same as taking the Fourier transform of the convolution of those two functions. In other words, convolution in the time domain is multiplication in the frequency domain. It turns out it works the other way around too. And we're about to see exactly why that's so helpful. Because I know I've been talking to you about fireworks and you think I'm a pyromaniac and you think I'm, I'm babbling incoherently. Perhaps I am. Uh, but there is method in the madness because we're coming back to digital filtering. You'll be excited to hear, I hope. Um, so we wanted to filter a signal digitally, what feels like a few hours ago. And uh, what we said by that is we want to remove all frequencies outside a certain band. Uh, we said we wanted to build this brick wall, brick wall filter. And we said, unfortunately, it wasn't possible. You might say, why can't we just take the Fourier transform of the signal and chop off everything and then take the inverse Fourier transform? Fair question. First of all, taking the Fourier transform can be rather expensive. Secondly, you tend to have to do that for the whole signal, like I said. So that's going to be even worse because you're going to have to wait till it all comes in and then take the Fourier transform, do the processing, transform back, and rather a lot of work. There is a better way, because what we want to do effectively is multiply in the frequency domain the spectrum of our signal, which is in green, by the spectrum of our filter, which is in orange. But what if instead we convolved in the time domain the impulse response of the filter with the signal coming in from the antenna. You can take the inverse Fourier transform of box like that, the brick wall, and it looks like this, actually. Um, this is uh, a function called a sync function uh, for its sins. It's um, sine x over x, basically. And uh, 
you might say, well, that's all we need to know then. Great. So we just convolve our function with this and we're on our way. Ah, uh, but uh, you see, there's a problem. The first issue is, is non-causal. So you have to know what's coming infinitely far in advance in order to filter anything. Second is it runs on for infinity, so you have to do an infinite amount of computation and have an infinite amount of signal, both of which limit the application to everyday circumstances, to say the least. But it's okay because you can you can botch it, like everything in radio. You can you know you can give the box a thump. Um, that is to say, we shift the impulse response a bit, so the peak is. If you if you look at this uh, at the moment. Uh, if we cut off everything before time zero, so we make it causal, as it were, then we lose the biggest bit, which is going to be problematic. So we shift it off to one side, and we chop off everything we don't have room for. The result is slightly problematic, because when we chop it off, you remember how when we chopped off our sine wave earlier, we got third harmonics and fifth harmonics and seventh harmonics, just like this, mm, the same thing's going to happen again. We get some problems, but, you know, you can overcome them to an extent and live with them to an extent. This isn't a practical talk, and I'm not going to lecture how filters work. I don't work in signal processing. There are those who are far more qualified to do so. Uh, but I will explain briefly the simplest kind of digital filter, probably, a finite impulse response filter. You've heard impulse response before. This is what one tends to look like. Uh, effectively, you have your signal coming through in a sampled sense. Remember, we're now in a digital signal processing system. So we have a large sequence of samples, and they're coming in one by one. We buffer the last few, and in this case, this is what we would call a Actually, I think this is a slight error here. We might call this a, a six-tap uh, FIR filter. Uh, slight error in my graphic there, now I look at it. Um, from, we take the current sample and the five previous samples, and we multiply them all by some weight. In other words, this is how many fireworks went off five samples go, how many went off four samples go, three samples go, two samples go and how much smoke is left after five seconds, after four seconds, after three seconds, and so on. And we multiply them through, we add up the results, and we're left with the current output. And I, do, I can do this for you right now, live. Isn't that exciting? Here, in blue, is a square wave. It's at 25 hertz, and let's say I want to filter out everything except the fundamental. The result of the filtering is shown in orange, what the fundamental should look like is shown here in green. This is a 25 hertz sine wave. Doesn't look anything like that, does it? This is a one-tap filter. In other words, it's doing nothing. As we make the impulse response longer, we make the filter quite a lot better. So now you can see it's, it's sort of more like a sine wave. It's obviously no longer square, but equally it's got a lot of higher frequency components. If we keep bringing the number of taps up, lengthening the impulse response. Now look, you can see the peaks and the troughs are in the same place and at the same frequency as the fundamental. So this is based on the fundamental, but it's still got quite a lot of other stuff. If we make our filter really long, spend a lot of computational time working out the sum of 500 previous samples, you can see here it's really quite good, but the problem is now we have to wait quite a long time before our filter starts responding at all, because the impulse response is so long. Uh, these are some of the trade-offs you have to face. And um, as a final demonstration, uh, this is the same filter, except now I've taken the Fourier transform of it again. So this is the frequency response of our filter. And we see with, with only, you know, a couple of taps, it's just a, a gentle roll-off. But as we start increasing the number of taps further and further, you see a shoulder developing, and in time, you get a nice, almost ideal behavior. But note, like the last builders we had, it's not quite flat at the top, it's not quite flat at the bottom, and the edge still isn't vertical. So really, nothing in the real world is ever perfect. Why I stick to theory. That's all we've got time for.
uh, to recap very, very quickly. We found out that if you sample a signal at more than twice the bandwidth of the signal, you can reproduce it. That means the whole DSP thing is kind of worth working on. Secondly, if we take a signal, we find that you can measure how much of each frequency is in it by doing some operations with sines and cosines. And using the same mathematics, we can filter a signal digitally in a way that is much more adjustable than if we had built an electronic filter. I'm not taking questions today uh, for various reasons, but please feel free, if you can't find an answer on Google uh, or elsewhere, to email me at the address here, and when I have time I'll try and sort out a response. Thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of the programme. Good afternoon. Amazing. William used this M0WJE. I love him. Probably my favourite speaker of the day, even though I didn't understand the word. Oh, no, I do know what fireworks are. Well, uh, William's PDF notes are available at the address on screen. And if you still have questions, use the email address that he gave out there. Well, it's almost time for our last speaker of the day, Bruce N9WKE from Chicago, with hints and tips on taking your more skills to the next level. And by the way, there is a change to the last session on the Introduction 2 stream. Unfortunately, Peter 2M0 SQL is unable to join us. So Jim Bacon, G3YLA, will explain why radio and weather go together. Have we got time for a quick visit to the NIC? Yeah. The, the grass is still rather brown looking, but uh, shortly we should be get some rain and uh, things will be dandy. So there we go, with Golf uh, Bravo 3 radio station, Zulu Sierra 6, Yankee India. Zulu Sierra 6, Yankee India, uh, Golf Bravo 3, Romeo Sierra returning. Okay, Barry, uh, Gary. Um, yeah, then this side is Dave, Delta, Alpha, Victor, okay, Echo. We have worked before. I think we might have worked before on uh, GB3RS. Uh, but I know certainly we've worked before under my home place. So I know Golf 4, Uniform, Fox, Fox, CM, G4, Uniform. One of the first stations I think I worked on in the MQA 100 when it first came online, or when I first came online. Uh, and certainly, this by far the strongest and the most powerful signal on the, the satellites uh, at the time, if not all, if not now, Gary. Um, but, um, yeah, I've got to say, um, you, you started to go down in my estimation, Gary. Um, we are, are, are going into autumn here. Um, it's a, um, a not a very nice, um, fairly wintry day, I would say. Uh, I'm actually sat at the moment um, at the side of the door. Um, because of obvious COVID restrictions, we, we have the door open to circulate the air through. Um, and the temperature at the moment, let's have a look. Temperature around about 13 degrees, which actually it feels, that, that's actually quite warm by comparison to what I feel at this moment in time. Um, it's going to be raining later on. Uh, in the next few weeks, it's we've got nothing but uh, a thoroughly miserable weather outlook to look forward to over the next six months. Uh, and by the sound of things, you're just coming into summer, Gary. Okay, so you're making us very, very envious at the moment. And I can't even come back to you saying that we won the, uh, the rugby. <laughs> All right, Gary, I'll pass it round to you. The Zulu Sierra 6, Yankee India, Golf Bravo 3, Romeo Sierra. Yeah. <laughs> OK, Dave, uh, Golf Bravo 3, Romeo Sierra, Zulu Sierra 6, Yankee India. Returning. <laughs> yeah, now I don't envy the cold weather, that's for sure. Mind you, when it gets too hot, it's not pleasant either. And I've got a problem with my air conditioner, the electronic circuit. Uh, nothing wrong with the pumps and, and the compressor. And I've got a very big one. It's about a, I think it's 40,000 uh, BTU. It's a very, very large thing to, to keep the shack nice and cool or temperature controlled. And uh, that's for whatever reason, a week ago, just didn't want to switch on. So I've checked the power supply, that's all okay. So I think it's the main IC, it's got a very big uh, peak. And I think that's uh, decided to uh, to go walkie. So I'll have to replace the whole unit. I believe you can get a sort of a universal remote controlled uh, unit. And then you just have to throw this out and put the new one in. <coughs> So I'm waiting for this to arrive and then um, we can get that going again because by guns it's, it's quite hot in the shack, uh, 30 degrees Celsius. 
I'm just, I, I bought two little digital thermometers. Oh man, they, they were about two and a half pounds or something. Signal. Really very cheap thing. It's a very loud signal from the uh, from ZS uh, working GB3 RS. There, I've never heard of ZS that loud in in ages. Um, we're having a few problems contacting our uh, next guest, Bruce and 9 wke to talk about uh, CW operating. Um, but while we're waiting for that to uh, um, that link to be established, uh, let me tell you about the the D Expedition Fund because one thing that we haven't been able to replicate at this online convention is the traditional convention raffle, which every year raises funds for the RSGB HFD Expedition Fund. Obviously that's not going to happen this year, of course, but there is still a way to help a very worthwhile cause. And it would be very much appreciated if you would think about making a donation by clicking the button on the convention webpage. Or go to www.rsgb.org forward slash donate. Details are on the screen there. And while we're at it, uh, while we're still waiting for Bruce, um, we are hoping, of course, next year we'll be back in normal convention mode. So the RSGB would like your feedback on the whole idea of online events. There may be more of this kind of thing. Of course, uh, we already have the Tonight at Eight events. How do you feel about the level of content in today's streams? Any comments about that, about the whole idea of online events are very welcome at www.rsgb.org forward slash feedback and you'll see that address appear on screen from time to time throughout the day and it's basically on the rsgb website so i'm told we still haven't managed to contact uh, bruce and nine wke so let's go back and see what they're doing at the national radio center secure, 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 and, uh, you've got a nice um, uh, icon uh, receiver uh, transceiver there uh, the very good uh, this uh, radio station has got a, a flex system uh, the 6500 uh, sorry 6500 model and um, we're uh, uh, linear amplifier we're running 400 watts at the moment through a step IR antenna, the Wellington antenna, um, so we get good contacts all around the world. Uh, so uh, that's uh, that's where we, we stand here today. Um, we've got we're running on many frequencies uh, as well as this um, this frequency at the moment. Secure, secure, secure. We'll be running for another couple of hours at this location. So back to you, uh, Italy Zulu 8 uh, Kilo Tango Tango from Golf Bravo 3 Romeo Sierra. Okay, Tony, good job. Thank you, Tony. Thank you very much for the, this opportunity. I wish to you good weekend, a good Sunday. 73, Tony, ciao. Okay, arrivederci and ciao. Bye bye. Golf Bravo 3 Romeo Sierra, chi was it? Golf Bravo 3 Romeo Sierra, calling CQ, 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 CQ. Golf Bravo 3 Romeo Sierra, calling CQ, let me see. Team QO100. Um, with the um, CQ, down CQ, converter, CQ, the cooling down converter that you, uh, you had, CQ, did you get that sorted down? Did it uh, stabilise the frequency? Did you eventually, because I think at the time you weren't locking it with uh, the GPS, but uh, I wonder if you actually started locking it with the GPS and, and if you did, did it get sorted out? Because I, uh, I think I'm going to be looking at one of those in the, in the near future. Uh, round to you, Gary. Um, I won't hold it with you. Well, we'll leave the NLC there and welcome back to what is the final live session of the RSGB convention online. And yes, we are still live thanks to the efforts of Rob Chipperfield, M0BFC, and Dom Smith, M0BLF, who you may have seen earlier um, stepping in when my internet went down. They're be beavering away in their Cambridgeshire video den. So thank you very much, lads. Uh, so our final guest speaker joins us from, I'm told, Chicago. He may tell me differently. Bruce N9WKE is the founder and host host of Dit Dit FM, the podcast that celebrates Morse code, the CW operating mode and amateur radio. His task today is to help us take our Morse skills to the next level, something I planned to do during lockdown, but let's say bread making got in the way. As usual, send your questions for Bruce on the chat facility on YouTube. So welcome, Bruce. Tempt me away from the sourdough. <laughs> Good afternoon. And uh, thank you so much for inviting me to um, present to the RSGB. It's, it's quite an honor. 
So I was invited to talk about taking your CW to the next level. And what I talked to a lot of people um, over the years, and there are a lot of people, myself included, who get started in amateur radio, um, take the time to learn the code, um, get on get on the air, make maybe make a few contacts or something, and then for whatever reason, life gets in the way, and um, they sort of put amateur radio aside for a while to you know, work in their job, raise a family, put their kids through school and stuff. And then after things calm down uh, in a few years, they decide to come back and get back and get involved again in um, amateur radio. And so that's what I want to talk about is people who, those operators who may have prior experience, um, who, who, got licensed um, previously but took a big took a break and now they're ready to come back in and get involved again that and that 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 has been my experience as well I I did the same thing but so when I, I jumped back in amateur radio um, and was ready to get back into CW there were a couple of things that that occurred to me or, or that I noticed right away and that is when I got back in the code after 15 or 20 years of not using it, I was amazed at how well I still remembered it. It came right back, which is a good thing. And I think a lot of people um, experience that as well, which is good. But even better than remembering the code, of course, I couldn't copy worth a darn. Um, I had to work on that. But the basics of, of knowing the the letters, the alphabets and stuff came back almost instantly, which was a, a great delight. But the other thing that was even more delightful was now, after all these years, there were all of these resources, these tools that were available now on this thing called the internet um, that we didn't have, you know, 20 years ago when I, when I started and learning the code. So, um, so we're going to explore a few of those things that uh, I've, people have told me have been very helpful uh, and in classes that I've helped teach uh, people uh, used and, and very successfully. But learning CW um, is like, it is, it's learning a, another language. And so to become proficient in in to speak the language well, the best way to, to learn is to immerse yourself into the new language. So, but it takes a little bit of commitment, uh, definitely some determination sometimes, but the payoff will be years of enjoyment and pleasure. So, how do you get to the next level? The first thing you wanna do, the first thing I, I encourage everybody who who's learning the code um, learning CW is to have fun that's the the number one important thing you know it's a hobby <laughs> we're doing this to have fun so keep that foremost in your mind um, you know it's not like your job depends on it or your your income or anything else um, you're doing this to have fun and the reason I I bring this up like this is because I've seen so many people in classes just overheat um, they they take it so serious which is it's good to take it serious to a point but you don't want your head exploding about this I mean it's a hobby you're it's supposed to be fun so if you if you start learning the code with the attitude that you're going to have fun it'll be fun and you'll have a much better experience and and you'll learn it faster and it'll it'll be a lot more fun i remember um helping teach some classes and there were some students who were struggling and they the problem was so i would take them aside and 
try to help them and work with them. And the problem was, is they were just taking it so, so serious. And, I, and you know, once I got them to relax, which is another important thing, relax, um, and, you know, show them how to have more fun, more, more, more enjoyment in, in learning the code, um, then, you know, it seemed to work a lot better for them. <clears throat> so, have fun is number one. So, after you've got that, the right attitude, then the next thing is, that you'll discover is, you don't have to do it all by yourself. Now, back in the, back in the day, um, before the internet and stuff, I mean, a lot of us got mentored. Um, there was an older operator um, or an operator with, with more experience who would sort of take us under their wing and, you know, help us learn the code and help us to copy and increase our speed and stuff. Well, that's great if you had a mentor, but if you, if you live somewhere where you were the only ham operator for a, a great distance, then, you know, it, it was all up to you by yourself. So nowadays, fortunately, um, you don't have to do it by yourself. And probably the, the oldest and best known CW training program that's been around now for several years is the CW Academy. Um, it's run by CW Ops. It's a worldwide organization. Uh, I think they have classes in practically, well, every continent except probably Antarctica, but they, they are, they hold classes all over the, all over the world. And they, they have four different levels of classes right now. Beginner for people who are limited with no prior experience with Morse code, basic, um, those people, um, like uh, maybe a lot of, um, you that uh, a lot of the people that I'm talking about who who got started took a break and came back a basic class might be the great place to jump in with CW Academy uh, because you know the code comes back to you um, so it's not so much about learning the code from scratch uh, it's just gaining skill um, so that that's a good place the intermediate um, class is where they take you from 10 to 12 words per minute, and then they start to teach you, you get into head copy and, and, and increasing your speed and stuff. And the advanced level is where you're operating at 15 words per minute and go for a much higher speed and, and get much better at, at head copying. Now, I'll tell you, I am a proud graduate of the CW Academy. Um, I cannot say enough good things about it. Um, it's a, it was a great experience. Each course meets twice a week for eight weeks. Um, and the classes can be intense. Um, they're very focused. Um, you'll, you'll be held accountable and you'll be expected, um, to show up for class prepared. Um, but I got to tell you, um, with as focused and sometimes it, it as intense as it gets, it was the most exhilarating and challenging um, CW experience I've had, except for my first QSO course. Um, but you will have more fun, and you will than you imagine, and and you'll develop your skills vastly more quickly than than you would ever imagine possible. Um, now there are many, many excellent CW Academy advisors, um, but I want to um, give a, a shout out to a couple of mine. Uh, two of my favorites are Mark Tyler, K5GQ, and John Merkel, AJ1DM. Mark Tyler was my intermediate um, class instructor, and the, the improvement I made in the eight weeks under Mark's advice um, 
was nothing short of astonishing. Um, he he absolutely took me from week one to, but by the time we got to week eight, I was a totally different and much, much better CW operator. John Merkel, um, I, w I helped John teach his intermediate uh, class several different times. John is another one I witnessed who took, who works with his students in such a wonderful way and takes them to uh, a whole new level in eight weeks. It's just absolutely ama uh, amazing, and I highly, highly recommend uh, CW Cavity. And if you do enroll in an intermediate level class, it has to be put in Mark or John's class. You won't regret it. Now, another club um, that I that I'm familiar with is the Long Island CW Club. Um, it was started by Howard Bernstein, WB2, WB2 UZE, and Rich Collins, K2 UPS in 2018. And it is probably the total opposite of CW Academy. It's very laid back, very, very fun. It's, super friendly um it's it's a really stress-free way of, of learning the code um they've got well the last time i counted um which was a couple of weeks ago they were up to 890 members um and they were they had members in 19 countries around the world um what really sets off the the long island cw club is their, their classes. When I made this slide, they had 48 different CW classes from beginners to advance, and it included some really unique classes that you won't find anyplace else. Classes just for women, classes for, for children. Um, they've, they have um, a class for Morse Reno, um, which we'll talk about in a little bit, um, where they set up a, a private network of, of people using Morse Renos to have uh, QSOs on their own private network. Um, right now, they're they're working on a big project to do CW over two meters. Um, they just started teaching electronics courses. Uh, they have weekly presentations, uh, just all kinds of activities. Um, and it's a really fun group. You'll you'll make. I made a lot of friends there. Um, it's it's really driven by the members about what they what they want to do. There's another um, big program they're working on right now to um, come up with a program for blind CW operators. Um, they're just doing all kinds of amazing and unique things that you won't find any place else. Their classes are, are offered all year long. You can join anytime. Um, LongIslandCWClub.org. Um, really uh, check it out if, if that's something that's, that sounds interesting to you. It's a great group of, of folks. You'll have a lot of fun. Okay. So now what if what if you're not interested in joining a club or, or going to classes and you want to learn on your own? Um, there's... Oh, yeah. Um, so there's, there's good news for that. Now, there are lots of ways to learn on your own. Um, and I've probably been through every wrong or bad way to learn on your own that that ever existed out there but um there's there's a program that uh was started uh, a couple of years ago um by uh, a guy and kurt zogelman ad zero we um created morse code ninja now i've 
I used to could say that I I have looked at and I've tried every self-learning program out there in the world, but I can't say that anymore because they're they're coming people are creating these things, you know, faster and faster all the time and and I can't keep up with it. But one of of, of all of them that I've been through, this is the best one um that I I have ever experienced. Um, Kurt created this program. It's not so typically somebody will record some code. You'll listen to it, and you know they'll tell you what it is and and move on and stuff. That has proven not to be a very effective way to learn. Kurt has used some science um, in in educational um, methods in his instruction in these videos that he's set up and it has proven to be much more effective learning on your own than virtually all of the other ways that you can do that. Um, he's got more than nine, well this is the last count, I'm sure there's more now, but more than 979 YouTube videos, over 2,000 hours of instruction and advice. Now I know that sounds like a whole lot and it is, but and, and if you just jump into it and stuff, it'll be really easy to get overwhelmed. But he's got it broken down very logically from beginning to advanced. Um, and there's a lot of, of unique things. He's got books that he has converted to Morris for you. Um, he's got a lot of good advice on that website. Um, I highly, highly recommend Kurt's um, Morse Code Ninja course. Um, check it out if... And, and you know, it, it also makes a really great supplement to if you're in, you know, like a CW Academy class or, or doing something else. Um, these are great um, audio files that you can listen to while you're driving or mowing the grass or, or whatever. But highly, highly recommended and great way to learn if you've got to do it on your own. So, what's next? Sending. <laughs> all right. Well, now we all know how to send, right? You just pull your key up or your paddle, you start pounding your key or slapping your paddles, and that's all there is to it. At least that's what I thought <laughs> for the longest time. Um, but, you know, the whole point of using the radio and CW is to communicate an idea and to be understood. And if the person you're trying to communicate with is unable to copy your code, then you're failing to communicate. You know, I can't tell you how many times um, I would be dialing across the band, looking for somebody to have a QSO with, um, and I'd hear something and I'd stop and... I'd listen for a few minutes and it would, I was wondering what in the world am I hearing? Because, you know, the code being sent is just an unending, un, un, in, incipherable stream of dots and dishes. It, it was gibberish. And I thought, wow, you know, I sure am glad that uh, my sending isn't that awful. <laughs> but the problem is, you know, I know what I'm trying to say, and it, when I'm sending, it sounds perfectly, it, well, it sounds like perfect code when I'm sending it, you know, because I, I know what I'm trying to send, and it sounds like it's going out great and everything. But maybe it isn't so clear to the operator on the other end. So, the best piece of advice I ever got was to record myself. Now, and I got to tell you, the first time somebody told me that, I thought it was the craziest idea I've ever heard. It, recording myself just didn't make a lot of sense. Um, you know, because like I said, when I'm sending, you know, sounds perfectly fine to me. In fact, it sounds like perfect code to me. Um, but it, it, it was a big surprise. So when I finally got around to, to actually recording myself one day, I was absolutely shocked at how atrocious my sending was. Uh, I 
couldn't even believe somebody was answering my CQs um, or, or I was able to complete a CUSA with somebody or somebody stuck around uh, to finish a CUSA with me because my sending was just absolutely horrible. I was one of those people um, that was sending the, the gibberish. Um, so record yourself um, and, and you'll be surprised at, at you know either how really good you are or or you aren't um, so fortunately there are some really good tools now to available to help you improve your sending skills and you know the other thing is that learning to send clear code that that's easy to copy is a separate skill from learning to copy um, and a lot of people just think, okay, you know, I, I can copy, so, you know, I can send. But um, really, you, you need to, it needs its own uh, attention as well, which I'm sure a lot of people already know. So, what are some really good um, computer and online apps to help you send? My very favorite app is g 4 Um Ray has recently done um, some upgrading on the application and stuff, and now there's a whole separate sending module uh, in G4FON, G4FON, um, that allows you to send and, and see what you're sending and how well you're sending it and stuff. It works beautifully. Um, you know that's my first recommendation is get Ray's program and uh, use it. Now the second app, actually it's not an app; it's a it's a device. Um, and unfortunately, it's not free. This will cost you some some money. But this is really a unique and really neat little device, Morserino. Um, uh, it's a kit you can put together, um, and you can you can do sending training with it. Uh, it'll help you, you know, train, uh, learn the code as well. Um, really, really slick. And this is the device that um, the Long Island CW Club, a lot of their users, um, a lot of their members uh, are using this device, and it, they're having so much fun with it, and it's been such a, a huge help in getting in helping people learn the code and, and improve their sending. That, as I mentioned earlier, they've now set up a their own little private network uh, for people to have QSOs with using their Morserino. Really nice device. Um, it's 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 worth looking at. One of the classics, one something from the very first uh, CW applications to come out is Learn CW Online. Um, you can it it does it all. Uh, it's totally free. Um, it's very popular. It's very well known. Um, you know, as long as you've got an internet application or or an internet connection, um, you can. You can get to it and use it. It keeps your stats, tells you how well you're doing, what your progress is and stuff. You know, highly recommended. Now, the next one is Morse Code Me. Uh, I've had a lot of people ask me about um, IPCW or IP over the internet, or, or I mean CW over the internet. And there's, there's another um, application that's available. I, I don't read. I didn't write it down. Um, but this one is probably the easiest um, to get on and, and just start using. Um, so if if you're interested in if if or you know if you don't have an antenna or don't have a radio, uh, this is another way to um, have a QSO with somebody. Um, anywhere in the world uh, over the internet um, and a lot of people enjoy it a lot of people use it they have you can see there where it says room one at the end of the URL they they have several different rooms where 
each room is a different level of of skill um, so it's pretty cool so I would check that out now then of course everybody has a smartphone um, and there are tons and tons of different applications for for smartphones iOS and Android um, I started to list them, but I, you know, it was going to take me two weeks to go through the whole list and everything. So what I decided to do is just list my most favorite one, uh, and that's Morse Toad. It's available on both iOS and Android. Um, it's a lot of fun. Um, it keeps you interested. It, it's kind of challenging. There, there's uh, kind of a contest thing about it so anyway it's it's nice to have if you're uh, out commuting or you've got a few minutes somewhere you can pull your phone out and uh, have a go with Morse Toad and have a little bit of fun and, and stuff so highly highly recommended all right now then <clears throat> this is my my number one um, recommendation to people who have learned the code um, and that's to get on the air um, getting on the air is the fastest way to increase your speed and skill um, nothing else will focus <laughs> your mind your attention um, and develop your skills faster or increase your confidence like participating in a live QSO and the only way you're going to do that is to get on the air so <clears throat> you know I I talked to a lot of people over the years who, who have learned the code and and they they seem to get into this this cycle um, this ring where they are perpetual um, students or perpetual class goers um, you know the whole point of learning the code and, and learning how to send CW is to get on the air so you know I always encourage people you know get on the air as soon as you can and one of the there are two big um, objections I always get when I encourage people to get on the air. And the first one is, you know, I hear people on the air doing 20, 30, 40 words per minute. I can't get on the air because I'm not that fast. Well, <clears throat> it doesn't matter how fast you are or slow you are. Um, if you know the alphabet, if you know the numbers, um, if you know, know uh, the basic cue signs, then you're ready. Um, and taking another class um, is not going to make you any more ready. And it doesn't matter, again, you know, whether you're, you're doing eight words per minute or you can do 20 words per minute. Just get on the air. Um, <sighs> One of their, the other thing is, I always point out to people, there are other organizations out there that monitor certain frequencies for, for slower ops. So, for example, the SKCC um, um, organization, uh, you can go on their website and they have a, a list of frequencies that they monitor. And there are some frequencies on the upper end of the band that monitored all the time um, for slow people who are, are slower operators to get on there and and have a QSO the same way with this um, is another great organization they've got um, volunteers people on who monitor certain frequencies all the time and again you can go on the FIS website and find those what those frequencies are um, and they are more than happy to have a QSO with a slower operator. Um, when I get on, half the time when I get on, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't want to break any speed records or anything. You know, I just want to have a nice, 
uh, CUSA with somebody and I'll go up on the upper end of the band and, and I'll be looking for slower operators uh, because, you know, we all remember um, what it was like when we first got started and we weren't fast and you know you didn't have a very high confidence level and you, we never forget those people who were there to answer our slow CQs or or when we answered theirs who slowed down or whatever you know there are I probably um, I probably gets get some notes for this but I gotta tell you I think the nicest um, people in amateur radio um, a lot of them are in the CW portions of the bands um, they're just really really nice and I say that from my own personal experience because there have been times when I've just been a horrible operator and people have stuck with me um, to get through the 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 QSO um, you know the other thing is don't ever be afraid to ask somebody to slow down I've asked it I've asked operators to slow down a thousand times and 99.9% .9 of the times they will and if they don't slow down enough the first time ask them again and they'll slow down more I do and all of the other operators I know do the same um, there's there aren't enough CW operators on on the bands so you know it doesn't matter how fast or slow you are we want you there so come in and, and join us now then the second objection I always get and this is the big one um, I get it from the students I've helped teach I, I've I, I hear it I even hear it from people who have some experience and who have made some QSOs uh, I've got some QSOs under their belt and stuff the biggest the biggest concern I hear is oh my gosh you know I'm afraid to make a mistake well or or you know what if I mess up well what if you do um, you know nobody has the intention of going on the air and making mistakes nobody wants to do that but it happens it's happened to me thousands of times you know um, and especially when you're new um, when you're or just getting back into it um, until you you reach that level of comfort and confidence you know the the odds of making a mistake or messing up are high and you know you, you pretty much probably will um, I've been a CW operator for a long time now and I still make mistakes so the you know and, and the way you handle that um, you don't have it, it you don't have to get all upset or anything um, you know there are a couple of ways to do it if you make a mistake you know you you send a series of dots and then you start over again or you know half the time people don't even send dots they just start over again um, so you know it's not the point is it's not that big a deal um, you'll make mistakes um, that's that's part of the game uh, just get on the air make your mistakes and have fun so now I I produce a, a podcast, ditdit.fm. Uh, it's a podcast for CW operators. And one, I think my very, my most popular episode was one I did. It was episode number 22. It was about jitters, anxiety, and your first QSO. It was great. Um, there were um, four different operators I think I talked to from a couple from Europe one from South Africa a couple from the US um, I had a uh, psychologist who was a, a guest on the that episode as well um, and it I think the the thing it did is it affirmed everybody's notion that you know 
Yeah, the first time uh, you get back into CW, the first time you, you get on the air, everybody's a little nervous. Um, everybody's a little concerned about making mistakes. But, you know, you just have to get on there and make your mistakes if you're going to make a mistake, but get through it. I guarantee you the the operator on the other end knows you're, you know, you're a new operator. Uh, we all recognize new operators. Uh, it's not a secret. And we all want to help you, you know, get through that barrier, bust, bust through and, and, and get better and, and feel more comfortable. Um, this is a, this is a great episode. Even if I do say so myself, um, a lot of good stuff, a lot of epiphanies about, you know, doing your first um, QSO or, or not even your first one, but, you know, after you've done your first one, the next two or three, um, people are still jittery and, and have a lot of anxiety and stuff. And, you know, it is worth it. It is worth it. So, you know, learning is good. Um, keep learning, but don't make learning um, your your primary goal or objective. The whole point in learning the code and learning how to, to send CW is to get on the air. Um, so do that because getting on the air, seriously, nothing focuses your attention like getting on the air. So, um, and I've said it before, you know, you can... You can become a, a permanent student, but, you know, we don't want you to be a permanent student. We want you to get on the air, um, and you'll become a better CW operator by getting on the air before you even realize it, before you even know it. I absolutely guarantee it. So, so take your CW to the next level. Get on the air and have some fun. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of us out here listening for your signal. Turn your gear on, grab your key, come out and join us. So, um, I want to thank you again for having this opportunity. I hope I, I gave you a couple of ideas or, or some suggestions that you didn't know about. Um, but it's been my pleasure, and thank you very much for letting me give a presentation today. Well, Bruce, thank you very much. Uh, Johnny uh, Housley, 2E0HSY, has just come up on the chat saying, just subscribe to your podcast. So ah, thank uh, you. Another, another there. And David, M0JCO, says, I've enjoyed your podcast since uh, he, found it, uh, he found it a few weeks ago. Great guests and uh, content, and uh, he says he's, he's working his way backwards through them. Uh, does that matter, he says? So should he start working his way forwards? It <laughs> doesn't matter. You can start in the middle and work out towards each end, yeah. Okay, and he also says he's now using, you mentioned Kurt's Morse code ninja files. Uh, yeah. He says he wishes he'd found it earlier in lockdown. Yeah, uh, that that's really a really excellent program. I'm glad he found it. Okay. And you mentioned Ray, G4FON, who, of course, uh, two years ago, was it? Uh, anyway, he, he gave uh, a talk, um, a presentation about his uh, his app uh, at this uh, convention um, when we all used to meet together in rooms and not have to wear masks. So right. interesting. And, and on the strength of that, I did download it and I've got it uh, on my on my laptop here. Um, I must start listening to it one day. Yeah, he I that is that is such a classic um application and I was really absolutely thrilled um to see that he um up, updated it recently and included this sending module in it. He really it, I mean it was already a top-notch application um since he since he wrote the thing years ago but now he's just really raised the bar on it and it is a wonderful wonderful tool for anyone wanting to learn the code 
uh, Tristan G zero K A Y has been on. He wonders what speed you are comfortable with. Well, um, I am a member of CW Ops, which meant um, I had to be able to send and copy um, at twenty five words per minute or above. Uh, and occasionally I do operate at that speed, but I got, but you know my my favorite speed um, that I I really enjoy operating at is probably somewhere 18 to, to 22 words per minute. Um, it's not so fast that I have to really, really focus down and, and pay attention to what I'm doing. Um, I can I can rag chew at that speed and and be relaxed and just really enjoy the QSO. So 18, 20, 21, 22, somewhere in there uh, is usually where I'm at. Uh, CW or, or Morse boot camps were becoming popular here before the uh, uh, coronavirus hit. I think Norfolk uh, Club and Essex Ham possibly and uh, and others were uh, were doing that. What do you think of the idea of boot camps? Oh, I, I think they're great. Um, we've had them um, here. Different organizations have put them on here um, before we were all wearing masks. Um, but yeah, they're great. Um, they're, I, I think the, the ones I've been to, especially for people who are brand new and, and just wanting to learn the code, uh, they're really great for, for getting people in and getting them started um, and, and showing them that, you know, they can learn the code and it's not that difficult to learn um, and, and increasing their in, um uh, uh, interest in in enjoyment um, and giving them the tools and the contacts to you know take it forward after the boot camp is is over um, and to keep going. So yeah, they they're great. And and you were saying that uh, Morse is you know it's it's for fun basically, um, but these days of course um, for most of the world it's not a requirement anymore most of us a lot of people of my age i've had my license 50 years next year somehow um <laughs> we we were we were forced into morse code because if we didn't take the morse test then we didn't get the license we what we wanted it, so it, indeed yeah and and when um i was the same way when i first got my license um years ago uh, there was a Morse requirement and you know that's basically how I got started in it um, and once I, I got started in it then you know I really got interested in it and then when I got back into radio uh, years later um, I just went straight to it and uh, never looked back um, but you know and that's an interesting point that you made because um, I remember when they did away with the requirement here in the States, you know, everybody thought, oh, psh, you know, that's it. Morse code is dead. You know, if you're not compelled to learn it, then, you know, who's going to learn it? And, you know, it's just going to go away and we're going to deal with other modes and stuff. Um, I think it's, I think right now is the golden age of Morse code. Uh, there, there's more interest in it now and there are more people learning it now than I think there have been in a long, long time. And that is really exciting. That is that is really great stuff. Um, and so one, one important distinction is before, you know, we had to learn it to get a license. Now people are learning it because they want to. Um, and I think that makes all the difference in the world. And I'm really happy that, you know, I can, I can help uh, people by encouraging them through the podcast and stuff to um, get involved and, and find it. I, I think I think now is a great time for Morse code. Yeah, you're, you're, you're right. I mean, people are finding it fun. That's why they're going to it now, because they don't have to. So uh, that's that's quite interesting. What do you think about machine generated code? Um, I, I hear it sometimes and I think that's the devil's work. I can't. That's just, <laughs> just yeah, that that is can be controversial. Um, you know, I just had a, an interesting email exchange with a gentleman who sent me an email and he said, you know, I've been 
I've listened to all your podcasts and and stuff, and he says I but I'll I'll never be a CW operator because I, you know I've tried I've taken courses I've taken classes I've had people work with me but he had a a physical um, ailment that really prevented him from sending the code the way he wanted to and he was he was feeling really bad about that and I was sorry that he felt bad about that and he was saying in very apologetically that you know somebody loaned me a Morse code keyboard and you know I can actually do that and and you know enjoy Morse code I can I can have a successful QSO doing that and number one I don't judge um, I'm just myself personally I'm just happy to to get on and find somebody who wants to have a QSO with me and I don't care if it's if they're sending it by hand or if it's computer generated uh, I'm just happy that they're there and I think anything we can do that encourages more CW activity on the bands is a good thing and this gentleman who sent me this email and was just feeling bad about this I told him no I said you know there's nothing to feel bad about I said if that's the best way you can do it if that's the way you enjoy it do it I said you know get on the air and, and you know join the fun um, I that doesn't bother me at all um, and like I said I'm 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 happy to find somebody sending code whichever means they're using um, and if it, that means more people will be able to get on the bands and use them, I'm all for it. Good. Uh, one final question then, uh, Bruce, and it comes from Peter G0GPH. So how important do you think it is to be able to copy at 25 words per minute or faster? Because I hear a lot of fast morse on the bands and I think I'm missing out. <laughs> Well, you know, a lot of that fast Morris is is contesting, um, and but then there there are there are actually more more guys than than I would expect who really enjoy um, sending code, you know, at thirty thirty five words per minute, and more power to them. Um, um, I. You know, I, I can't go that fast. I can't copy that fast. Uh, I mean, I think I can send that fast, but I'm pretty sure it's pretty bad when I do. Um, you know, it's, to me personally, it's not important because, I, you know, I just don't, going that fast is just isn't a goal of mine. And I think it's, it's you know, do what makes you happy with, with Morse code and CW. Um, there are so many activities for CW out there um, um, networks um, being you know being part of a network uh, traffic um, handling is a lot of fun I've, I've been involved in that in the past year um, all kinds of, of different things and tons and tons of different contests and stuff so and, you know and there are slow speed nets and and all kinds of nets out there uh, that's just one example um, same way with contests um, there there are contests for slow operators there there are other contests um, where you know these guys are, are blowing by it at 40 and 50 words per minute um, you know that's great now I'm, I'm if they're having fun I'm all for it uh, but that's just not not what I'm interested in doing and for me it's just, that's not important at all so you know it, it's sort of a personal thing um, do what makes you happy uh, okay Bruce um, it looks like we have lost our link to Jim uh, once again I'm afraid so uh, uh, anyway thank you very much for a very interesting talk um, sure, uh, very much appreciated by everybody looking at the uh, at the comments on the stream. Uh, so, uh, thanks for for being with us today. Oh, thank you. It's I was delighted. I was thrilled to be asked, um, and it's been a pleasure. And everybody, get on the air. Come out and join us.
Wonderful. Uh, great advice for everyone there. Get on the air. Well, I'm afraid that, uh, with, uh, with having lost Jim, that uh, pretty much uh, brings us to the uh, close for today. Uh, so thank you very much to all of the presenters who have been uh, who've been with us, uh, both on this stream and, of course, in the Introduction to stream. We've uh, mentioned it already, but I'm going to mention it again, that uh, because we can't have the usual d uh, raffle this year, uh, we've not been able to collect money for the RSQB's HFD Expedition Fund, which of course uh, does fund a lot of uh, the expeditions to some of the rarer places. So uh, if you're able to, then uh, please do uh, jump onto the website rsqb.org slash donate uh, to, uh, to give a uh, whatever you can afford, uh, whatever you might have spent on raffle tickets perhaps. Also, of course, so don't forget that uh, we'd really appreciate any feedback that you've got on the sessions that you've heard today, how you think the whole day has gone, and uh, uh, whether or not we're uh, we're together in person next year, or was it, or whether we're um, or wh whether we're back online. Hopefully, uh, hopefully we will we'll be in person. But it'd be great to hear how you think today has gone. You can get to that at rsqb.org/feedback. We'd uh, really appreciate uh, hearing from you. Uh, so I think it looks like we might be about to get Jim back. So uh, I will uh, hopefully be able to uh, to let him uh, have the final words uh, before we uh, before we uh, go to the RSGB president, uh, who will actually be uh, be giving out some awards. So some of the awards and trophies that would normally have been given out at the convention uh, will hopefully be uh, be taking uh, or hearing what those awards were in uh, in just a moment. So, uh, Jim, hopefully, uh, we can't see you yet, but I think we might be able to hear you. No, apparently we can't. Okay, so uh, in that case, uh, plan B, uh, in that case, plan B, we will uh, we'll go to the RSG president. So thank you very much again for watching, and um, it, uh, it's been uh, great to have your company today, and I'll leave you with the RSG president and, uh, the, and the announcement of the uh, construction competition results and also the G5 RP trophy results. Hello again. Well, I don't know about you, but I thought that was really great. As we come to the end of our first and hopefully our last online convention, I hope you've enjoyed the presentations as much as I have. I'd like once more to thank all the people who've contributed to make this such a great day. There's the excellent presenters who've joined us from around, from around the UK and across the world to give us the benefit of their exp expertise. There's the technical teams who've guided us through the day and managed the live streams. Then there's the volunteers and crew at the NRC who've given us the chance to see GB3RS in operation. And then there's everyone else in front of the cameras and behind the scenes who've worked so hard to provide this event for every one of us to enjoy. That just leaves three important things to do now before the end of the day. So get yourselves ready uh, to raise a virtual cheer for the winners of two of society's prestigious trophies and this year's 2020 RSGB construction competition. Firstly, I'm delighted to announce that this year's winner of the Rotax Shield, which is awarded for outstanding and consistent DX work, is Peter Baker. Golf 3 Zulu Sierra Sierra. Congratulations to Peter. Secondly, it's the G5RP trophy, which is awarded for the greatest progress in the DX field made by an RSGB member who's resident in the UK. And this year it goes to 16 year old David K, Mike Mike 7 Delta Whiskey Kilo. Again, congratulations to David. Now we come to the results of the RSGB 2020 construction competition, which has been sponsored by Martin Lynch and Sons. Many thanks to them. The entrants were of a very high standard, which made choosing the winners very difficult so with that in mind, all the entrants will receive a £10 RSGB voucher, in addition to any other prizes they're awarded. There were five categories with one overall winner. So firstly, there's the beginner section. The winning entry here was a set of satellite antennas built by Eric Stammers, M7 Echo Juliet Sierra, who, by the way, only got his license in June this year. The next category is Construction Excellence, and here the winner is Nick Brooks, Golf 4 Bravo Mike Hotel, 
for his CW transmitter, which he built during lockdown. Innovation is the next category, and the winning entry here was Ankenis. What's Ankenis, I hear you saying? It's an adaptive noise cancellation and information system, and this was entered by Gwyn Griffiths, Golf 3 Zulu India Lima. In the software category, the winner here is Heather Lohman, M0 HMO for her mapping system. And finally, there's a category called Lockdown. The winning entry here was the beautifully engineered Virus Perplex Bug Key, built by Roy Bailey, Golf Zero Victor Foxtrot Sierra. Congratulations to each of those winners, who will each receive a voucher from Martin Lynch and Sons, and a copy of the new RSGB handbook. The judges were also impressed by the Slim Jim antenna built by Sarah Raza, MW7 SRA, and the Mark II capacitance meter, which was built by Alistair Watt, G3ZBU. Sarah and Alistair will each receive a copy of the RSGB book Raspberry Pi Explain. So now we come to the overall winner of the RSGB 2020 construction competition. He, the, the winner receives the Pat Hawker G3VA trophy. And I'm pleased to say that the winner is Gwyn Griffiths Golf 3 Zulu India Lima for his Ankenis project, which, is, which clearly addresses a topic of major importance to the amateur radio community. Gwyn, as well as receiving the Pat Hawker trophy, also receives a £100 award from the RSGB. Thank you to everyone who submitted entries and gave the judges such a difficult job. More details about the projects can be seen on our website www.rsgb.org forward slash construction competition and they'll also be featured in the next issue of RADCOM. As we draw to a close, whether you've just passed your foundation licence or someone who's enjoyed amateur radio for many years, I hope you found something in today's presentations to enjoy and challenge you. As I said at the start of the day, we'd like to hear your thoughts about the events, so do please take a couple of minutes to complete our online form, which you'll find at www.rsgb.org forward slash feedback. So, it just remains for me to say thanks to you for joining us today, and I hope that we're all able to meet in person again sometime soon. Bye. And indeed, we all echo Dave's thoughts there. Let's hope we are all back together and things are back to normal-ish by this time next year. Sorry for the dropout at the end of Bruce's presentation. I've been plagued with this all day. It is early evening here in the UK. Sunsets here in the evening is about 25 minutes away. And as daylight has provided my studio lighting, it's a good time to uh, wrap things up. So thank you for being there. Thanks for your questions, your feedback and your donations to the De-Expedition Fund through the day. There's still time if you haven't fed back or donated yet. Uh, just head to the uh, website, RSGB website. If you're not a member, just have a look, see what's what's there. It might convince you to, uh, to join us. And many, many thanks to Dom and Rob down the line in Cambridge for keeping uh, us on the air, so to speak. Many, many laurel leaves to them bags of leaf mould to my internet provider. Till the next time, from Jim, G4AEH in Eaton, bye in 7-3.